Hi, this is Dale Leader, designer of TRS-80 Color Baseball, and you're listening to Coco Talk. This is Coco Talk. The world's leading live talk show featuring the Tandy Calor computer. It's time to drop your socks, grab your real time clocks, and let's rock. Coco Talk is rocking the 8 bit world, keeping the Tandy flame alive. We may be mocked, but we'll never stop, because Coco Talk is rocking the 8 bit world. Welcome to Coca Talk, episode 244. Special guest is Stephen Goodwin. Coco Talk is rocking the 8 bit world, keeping the tandy flame alive. We may be mocked, but we'll never stop. Because Coco Talk is rocking the 8 bit world. hello everybody hello and just for those of you watching live here you'll see some things on the uh, description still saying it's a game one challenge from earlier this week so we'll have to fix that in post well most important part of the show isn't it oh it is i'm sensing bias here but I don't know if we're going to be spending the whole show playing Junior's Revenge. That's my worry. <laughs> eh, maybe not. <laughs> oh, let's see. All right. I guess let's start with panel introductions. Uh, top corner, we have Mark Overhoster. Hello there. Glad to be here, as always. All right. Next over, we have Ron Delvo. Hello. And. Uh, Next is uh, L. Curtis Boyle. Welcome to the, the show, the everyone. News. The man with the news. And our special guest we'll come back to. Uh, next up, uh, Patrick Euland. Howdy, folks. Glad to be here. Okay. Your host, me, uh, Frederick Provencia. Hi, everybody. Wow, I got that one off good. Um, <laughs> Ken Waters. Hello, eh? <laughs> And we got Terry Stege. Morning, everybody. And the music man, Brian Schubring. Hey. Hello, everybody. And I'm back to normal. Someone get that man a lozenge. <laughs> wow, he kind of fell off there. Um, let's see, Jason Reichard. Where? I'm always the last one to know about these things. Yeah, just, just switch the switch over. I'll just switch it over. Okay, I'm. I'll, I'll look into it. I've got my Mark Overhoser visor ready to go. Okay. And uh, Grant Leedy, who disappeared on us. He is sounding. He may be live he, streaming at the moment. He is yeah, looking and be. sounding better than ever. All right. Well, good thing he wasn't the streamer today. Uh, let's see. Next up, uh, we have Alan. Howdy, howdy, everyone. Coco time. And last up, uh, the man from down under, Nick Mariantes. Hey, everyone. Okay. And last but not least, our special guest, Stephen Goodwin. Hello and good evening from Cambridge, England. Wow, that's a ways over. Everyone, one of my questions ready. Where are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, certainly not Ohio, that's for certain. So how's, how's the queen today? Oh, she's fine. I popped in earlier okay. uh, for a cup of tea. And I really hope since saying that, nothing has happened in the last few hours since <laughs> I read the news tonight. Because I'm going to look like a right idiot. All right. Well, tell you what, Curtis, take over from here. Okay. So welcome, Stephen. Um, I think Stevie is the one who contacted you about having you on the show to help promote the book. And plus you promoted it on Facebook in the, in the Coco and the uh, Dragon groups. Because uh, yeah. you're doing a book called uh 20 go to 10 i believe i am and indeed, it's a rather yeah. it's a rather interesting take 
on uh, retrocomputing by the numbers, as you put it. But before we get into the book, I just said I want to get a little bit of your background here. So first of all, what was the first computer you ever used and what was the first computer you ever owned? So the first I used would have been a BBC Model B um, micro from Acorn. Um, the UK, the UK government said, we think computers are going to be important in the future. So we're going to give a little bit of money to all the schools in the country to buy a computer. And the one they bought was the BBC Micro. Uh, there was a big history behind that. I'm pretty sure everyone will have seen Micro Men, which covers that history to a, a reasonably faithful extent. So as a consequence, I got to use this BBC Micro and it's like, OK, this seems useful. I can program it. Everyone else was playing Granny's Garden or something. But I, I like the idea that I could program it to do things. I could actually control the pixels on the screen, which I couldn't do with a TV set. And it looked like a TV set. So I thought, oh, this is kind of interesting. Um, and obviously around the sort of same time, I would have been playing various um, cabinets down the arcade. Uh, things like Asteroids and Frogger, that was that sort of era. And I thought, oh, yeah, this is all fun. I like this computer thing. And in, I think, early 83, uh, the Spectrum had been released in 82. And it was selling well, but Sinclair still had a whole load of ZX81s that they hadn't sold. So they said, if we sell it really cheap, we can get rid of all these ZX81s from the warehouse and then start upgrading people to the Spectrum. Coming from a family that didn't have quite as much money as the people who could afford a BBC, we got a ZX81 because it was cheap. And it came with the RAM pack, it had the machine, all the leads, and it came with one piece of software. In fact, no, it came with two pieces of software, a VU file, which was a file management database thing, which as a 12-year-old kid I didn't understand, and a game called Space Raiders, which being a thing where you shot aliens and having a thing for amusement arcades, I did understand. So I got to play Space Raiders for a bit on the ZX81 as my first computer. But obviously, one game doesn't go very far, and we spent the whole year of our family money on a £45 computer. So there was no money left to buy games. So I learned to write them. And I got into sort of programming and actually really using a computer to do other things from that point. Okay, that actually sounds like a lot of the early history for Cocoa people here too. The people who especially got in at the Cocoa One, like in the early 80s, 80, 80 81, 82, because it wasn't a ton of software. And what you found at Radio Shack were really expensive cartridges so that a lot of us did the same thing. We you went through the basic manual and learned how to program it ourselves and wrote our own games. Yeah. And then from there, I got the Dragon, um, which was obviously quite a, a step up. Um, it was one that I found at a car boot sale, bought for the primary reason of this is an interesting machine. And I know some people at school that have one that I could help back up their games for them. Um, yeah, back up, I like that. Oh, yeah, well, you know, <laughs> I'm being recorded, so I've got to be careful what I say. Distributed so, backups, it was great. Yeah, you know, remote off-site backups is the best yeah. secure way of doing things. Um, and that machine sort of, because obviously on the Sinclair, the way that all the Sinclair machines work is you have your CPU chip that just does everything in the entire universe. You want to generate a screen display, that with the CPU. You want to create audio, well, that will be the CPU. But with the Dragon, all those case of there are other chips in here. How do these chips communicate? What is the process? How do I get, you know, as you know, on, on, the, on the Sinclair machines and a lot of others, there were areas in memory that hold the font. Well, on the Dragon, it was all in this other chip. And it's like, how can, why is it I can't get access to the font? Why can't I just peek a memory location to get the font? And all of a sudden my mind went, boom, computers are more than just, a chip. They're a series of interconnecting chips that can do lots of different things. And from there, I just devoured everything. I was like, right, well, it's not this small thing that I first experienced with the X81. And then just started reading every book that was available on every single machine. So you, you definitely, even in your younger years, you weren't beholden to one machine or another. You didn't enter in the, the war, CPU wars or the, or the, you know, the AFIT wars where everybody was, you know, mine's better than yours and that kind of thing. You were devouring the whole spectrum pardon the pun uh, pardon the pun uh, yes I, I i well there's t there's two there's two parts to the answer there i guess um i did spread myself around on all of them because we could only afford one machine but i was interested in what were the, what were the competitors why were people having these arguments you know why is this processor better than that processor 
how is it how do I get one thing to work on this machine and how do I get the same thing to work on a different machine it was that was always very interesting there's more than one solution to a problem the second part of the problem is I had a dragon there was only two other people in the whole school with the dragon these were the ones which I was borrowing the games I mean backing up the games from so as a consequence there was no one to fight against the Sinclair people would fight against the Commodore people and they'd just leave the dragon people alone in the back room so I never really got into that that side of things argument on which is the better processor combined with the fact that because i knew something about you know the processors and it's like well it's not just about the processor or the clock speed it's about everything else people would very quickly learn if they did say oh my computer is better than yours i would actually give them full explanation of why it wasn't including the whole bus speed minutia which meant they just went away very quickly it's a good way for dispelling the sort of the geek bullies Okay. Now, evidenced by the, the, the background you have here, you've actually got a pretty good collection of some of the old 8-bit systems from back in the day. I don't know if you wanted to kind of go through some of them. Are these ones that you had fiddled with back in the day, or are these ones that you got into later on as part of you know retro in general? Uh, there's a mixture. So um, two of the Spectrums are from back in the day. The Dragon is, the X81 is. Uh, it's not my very first LX81. Uh, we put the very first LX81 into a big box. And mount it and basically screwed the circuit board onto a piece of hardboard, screwed the RAM pack onto a piece of hardboard, just so nothing wobbled essentially. But that one has now gone to the mist of time. Uh, the x 80 ones I've got now are later ones. Spectrum's the original, Dragon's the original, Amiga's the original. Um, there's a few other little bits like that which are sat around, but things like the Aquarius, that's, uh, that's a new purchase. The Lix80 is a new purchase because I, I never got one first time around. The Tatum Einstein is an original. The BBC is original from that time, although that was obviously a much later purchase when they were on car boot sales going cheap. Uh, the Archimedes is an, a new purchase. So is the Atom. And, I, and, and the Sinclair ZX Vega, which is technically not old, um, but it's still a Sinclair thing, which is... Uh, it's one of those nice bits because I've got the, the Plus, which never officially came out. So it's the closest I have to be having a collector's item. Everything I've got is pretty common. Everyone's, you know, every proper collector seems to have at least one of everything I've got and then something unique. So I just have to wave the Vega Plus and saying, this is the closest I've got to something which is novel. Yeah. And I've got no, a whole I, load I... of man packs and uh, sound boards and other peripherals as well for the various machines, which are all, all from back in the day. Yeah. Now, I know there's basically two groups of people that, that have the retro computers, like the actual hardware, because there's quite a few people that just do the emulator thing, the relive the youth type thing. Uh, there's some that collect them just to have them as show pieces to show that I've got this, I've got this, I've got this rare one over here. And they got others that actually use them actively. Would you consider yourself to be one of part of those camps or are you kind of a mixture of both? I'm definitely a mixture of both um, because half the collection is stuff that I had growing up. They are my show pieces of well, you know, and my, my present day job is developing software. So every time I get, you know, down about work or, oh, this is terrible, I think, well, I've got to this point because of that machine and I've learned this trick because of that machine. And it, it gives that little uh, reaffirmation that, you know, yes, it might seem hard now, but look how far I came from programming assembly on the ZX81 all those years ago. Um, they're not in fully active use. Uh, I don't have enough space in my home office to have more than one machine set up at a time. So periodically they will come out, they will get set up, they will get used because there is something very particular about the form factor of the machine, which actually changes the way that you use it. I think most people that have used an emulator, uh, especially on things like the Coco and the Dragon, the brackets are on the wrong number key. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and if you're using the emulator and you, you think, oh, I can see where the bracket is, it's on the number nine, and you go and hit it, you know, they go, huh? Oh, right, yeah. And, it's, uh, and, and it, it affects you. You know, you suddenly think, oh, no, okay. And it, it's that um, cognitive process you have to keep going through. So I do Especially like when it's the, muscle memory and it's like 30 years oh, of yeah. muscle memory and all of a sudden it's all gone, yeah. Nick, Nick uh, Randy's going to test this because he was just discussing this on Facebook where on BCC he's been trying to figure out how to hit shift at to pause a basic listing and you know, none of the emulators map it to shift at because yeah. that's already a shifted key as it is. So what do you do? Yeah, I mean, I wrote some emulators um, in 2020, uh, which I started back in 2000 or so. I, 
you know, lockdown finally gave me a chance to go back and actually finish off all the little bits which I'd left undone. And on that, I was doing them for the web. I thought this is a nice platform, let people see them without installing software. And the delete key, the backspace key on, you know, so many machines, that's slightly problematic because you hit that on your web browser and it takes you to the previous page. <laughs> so, you, so all of a sudden your browser, you know, gone to, you know, Google or wherever, and you're sat there with no emulator anymore. So yeah. it, is a, it is a task to say, how can I best represent an old machine on a new platform? And there's some interesting problems around that. Yeah. Thankfully, at least the you know, modern PCs have way more keys to play with as far as your selection goes than some of the original machines. So oh, yeah, for sure. So are, do, you, do you still do some act, like you, you mentioned you're a software developer now, do you still mm -hmm. occasionally do some development on the retro machines when you pull one out every once in a while, or do you just more relive the glory days and like play games or whatever else? Oh, um, I rarely play that many games. Okay. Um, so it is a case of, it is the development part, part of it, and it's the how did that machine um, uncover that particular problem? How did it solve that problem? Uh, how does it do this differ to something else? Um, and this is not a plug because, you know, what do I care? But I did write a ZX81 game uh, last year in oh, cool. full of Z80 Assembler, um, you know, which is like, well, why not? You know, <laughs> I've been doing bits of Z80 Assembler since, 83, 84, whenever, I thought, I wonder if I could actually just write a whole game, you know, and it's not a particularly amazing game, I'll be honest, it's a, you know, a clone of adventure, um, the um, Robin, how, whatever, Babonet or something, I, I can never remember, it's, it's the game that features in Ready Player One, it's that version of adventure, and I thought, oh, I, I should make a sort of a little ZX81 clone of that, um, so I did. In fact, technically speaking, I wrote it first on the Spectrum uh, a few years ago when the when the very first Vega came out. The person who was created, Paul Andrews, who created the Vega, said, "Could you write me a game for the Vega, like a unique, built for this machine thing?" And it's like, "Yeah, I suppose." Uh, so you know, a weekend later, I've got this Spectrum game. I go, "There you go, unique thing for the machine. Off you go." Wasn't that fun? I thought. I wonder if I could, you know, redo that as a ZX81 game. Because when I wrote it as a Spectrum game, I thought, how would Adventure have been written for the Spectrum back in 1982? I thought, well, they would have just taken a game they wrote the year before for the ZX81, slapped some color in it, slapped some silly beep sounds in it, and then shipped it. It would essentially be shovelware. And yeah. if you've seen some of the early Scion titles, you'll probably agree. So I thought, okay, let's try and make a shovelware type game, but make it decent. Don't just, you know, throw crap at it, but make a fairly decent thing that would simulate the shovelware experience. Uh, so I created that type of thing for the Spectrum. Well, I only had a weekend to build it. That's my excuse. And then last year, it was the case of I, I found the Chronosoft people, uh, Simon and that lot. And it's the case of, oh, yeah, you should do that for the ZX81. It's like, well, same CPU. How hard can it be? Slightly harder than I thought is the answer. Because <laughs> uh, uh, I was using some things on the, on the spectrum that the ZX81 doesn't like. I was using registers that the uh, operating system was needing, not realizing the operating system needed them, IX and IY in particular. So I had to rewrite big chunks of the code. Uh, so I wrote a version, so now I can build it for ZX81 or for spectrum. And then Simon goes, that's great, we'll release it. So he stuck it onto a cassette and uh, sent it out to people. And we've got the Spectrum version due any day now, as they say. Cool. Did you get into any uh, other assembly language program besides the uh, Z80 or? Uh, 6809, because for the Dragon, that was unnecessary. And I still have my manual, which I... Ah, the Leventhal, that's a good one. I mean, yeah. I've got a couple of the others as well, which are very sort of Dragon-y specific on how to use it. And I wrote Flappy, uh, sorry, I wrote a Flappy Bird clone called ASCII Bird a few years ago just to see if I could remember how to do it and the answer is yes it was the muscle memory thing that you mentioned earlier yeah. even though I'd not done any 609 for probably 10 years or so since I did previous emulator it's just like oh right I obviously need to do an LDA here I did the uh, comma x plus to bring, bring it in from the x and I was just wheeling off code like it was yesterday and the fingers were going to the right bits on the keyboard. They were typing the right mnemonics, and it was 
you know, quite quite a fun experience. Six yeah, Nick Morandi's actually just went through that himself because I mean he's been doing Coco stuff for you know three decades now, but he did the Tier City Model One and Three before that, which was a Z80, and uh, he just did his first Z80 game. And how long was it, Nick? Eighty since eighty four? Uh, yeah, eighty four. So I mean, it was like he he was kind of surprised that you know the muscle memory kicked in on that too. It did take a little bit. He kind of forgot about some nice pieces. Six and nine has a Z80 doesn't, but you know he he got Gem Hunter done in, in about a month, month and a half, I think it was. Oh, uh, yeah. So yeah, it's it's good to hear that you're actually programming the machines because that's something you know a lot of the people that get into the retro stuff they just kind of stick with the the games or you know just playing around with the machine, the operating system or something like that, not not really getting back into it. So that, that's good to hear. Yeah, I, I want to do more six five zero two. I, I did a little of that back at school, but the only machine, you know, um, you know, they were all naughty programs. So I should probably go back, learn some six five zero two, and no, see what I can do with that. <laughs> All sixty-eight thousand. I quite like that. As, as, as a process, that's a nice one. Six nine and sixty-eight thousand are still the look. I have actual registers I can use. Yes, <laughs> I'm, to, I'm looking at you. A, A X and Y. Seriously, <laughs> not, I've got no idea how I'm going to handle just three registers. But I, you know, I'll yeah. give it a go. And they're all eight-bit yeah. registers too. That's the fun part. Yeah, it's not even another one you can combine to make a sixteen-bit register. You yeah, know, like self-modifying you know, code. Here we come. Oh yeah. Oh, I've done that before. That's that's that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> my, my first emulator was self-modifying code because it's on the 68,000. I, I wrote um, a 6009 emulator on the 68,000. It wouldn't work on the 68,020 above because any kind of MMU would sort of say, oh, you're, you're trying to write back into the code. We don't allow that. And I did it the way that I programmed breakpoints was essentially I would rewrite the emulator with the code necessary for the breakpoint. <laughs> so I'm, I'm writing one assembler in another assembler almost trying to map the registers directly and map the code between the two. Wow. So it was fun. I, you know, as, as you say, I, I like to do programmy things with these old machines. I don't think and, uh, my next question is basically on that uh, note is, have you been keeping up with the retro machines like all the way through since the eighties or did you take a bit of a break as you were doing you know, like your real job, et cetera, and then come back to it? How did, how did you, did you always stay with retro or did you come back to retro? Um, Retro was always there in some form, uh, but the form would change um, across time. So university, retro was um, mostly subdued until I realized that emulators could be written. Because uh, at that point, um, I was on an Amiga. I was transferring stuff between PC. It was all very work, work, work. I was writing compilers and all this kind of malarkey. Then someone said, look, it's a Spectrum emulator on my PC. It runs slowly. I'm going, how do you build hardware that runs on a different piece of hardware without including the hardware in it? Because uh, the Amiga had um, a card that you could put in that would turn it into a Mac. Yeah. And there was a similar card for the PC. There's, you know, the whole load of things. And I'd seen these. But I hadn't seen a Spectrum version. And all of a sudden, a Spectrum is running up on the Amiga screen and the, sorry, on the PC screen. It's like, how does that work? And I start reading into it a bit. And it's like, that's interesting. I should do one of them. So I got back into it through emulation for a while <laughs> and built up the emulator. Then it's like, oh, that was an interesting project. Start a job. It's all go, go, go. Not really have a chance to think. Then I, 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 I moved to another job and someone else mentioned, oh, yeah, you can do emulators. They're like, yeah, I know. I built one. And this, this, it does that. And it goes, oh, right. Could you do this? It's like. I don't know. I haven't looked at it. Um, so I got the emulator out and I got my original hardware back out and it's like comparing how things work. Oh yeah, okay, we could do that. So then I become very interested in the emulator front for several years. Um, you know, just dabbling around, seeing how di different people had interpreted the problem of building an emulator. Um, and then more latterly, when I moved to Cambridge, because uh, we have a computer museum here in Cambridge. I, I went along and it's like, do you need any help on sort of weekends to tell people about these old machines? And it was like, yes, please. Um, so I started having to learn a little bit more than I did. You know, because there's a lot I knew from my past of just reading in the magazines. And it was a case of I should probably do some revision on these old machines. So then it became um, much more about the history of the machine, the social history and 
that part of the retro scene rather than just the programming, which I'd always dabbled back into every now and again because um, my one of my old day jobs was a games programmer. It's one of the few industries still where you get to do assembler programming on a on a, a not irregular basis. Nowadays, I guess not so much, but when I was doing it, this was PC and on uh, PS2, GameCube, there were still opportunities for you to write assembler. And you're writing assembler during the day and it's really tricky and painful. And you think, it used to be this painful when I was doing Z80. And then you just fire up your Z80 assembler and you'd write some. It's like, oh no, it was pretty painful then as well. <laughs> Speaking of the uh, Cambridge Computer Museum, they had the Dragon Meet up here in November. I'm trying to remember, did you make it out to that? Yes, I did. I won the quiz. Oh, that's right. I've got, yeah. I've got to say that because you, you guys were so far in the distance on the camera, we couldn't really recognize faces, so I didn't recognize you there. Yeah. I, Plus, I you had masks put, on. I should have put this laptop at the bottom of the garden so then you'd recognize me. <laughs> but yeah, it's the only thing I've won in about 20 years. So I, I'm really quite proud of uh, well, Robin and I were on the team together that I've not met before the day. And it turns out we're a pretty good pairing uh, for that because. We both filled in the gaps of knowledge. I'm going, he's going, which racing game is that? So there was two two questions with two different racing games. I go, that one's Speed Racer, that one's the other one. <laughs> it, it just worked really quite well. So I was there uh, playing quizzes, uh, finding out what new things people have been building and sticking in cartridge ports and that. So that was a, a good fun day. Yeah, well, we, we did some live coverage from there, thanks to Richard Harding and a few other people there too. So that was really cool. Mm -hmm. Now, just before we get into the book, I, I have one little request here from Sixie in, in Discord. He sent me a thing saying to tell you that the rain says hello. Ah, oh. hey, Kevin. <laughs> Love back to rain and congratulations on a new job. There you go. That means nothing to anybody else, but assuming it is the person, I'm pretty sure that it is. Yeah. Someone I've not seen. He said, he said you would know who it is. He said it's not that much of an indoke. It's just pretty much the first thing I say to him whenever I see him as they know each other. Yeah. So now to segue into the book. So is is, is writing a book, uh, a retro computing or otherwise, is that something you've been thinking of doing for quite a while or is that something fairly recent that you decided to do? Yeah, um, I've written books on and off for a number of years. Um, the first book I wrote was cross-platform game programming, which, as the title sounds, is as dull as you think it's going to be. It is because uh, I was in the games industry, and there's always the problem of like, well, we're, we're writing this game for the GameCube, but we also want to have a version for the PlayStation and the Xbox. How do we not write three versions of the same game? And I've been doing this for a while, and I thought there's not a lot of information about this out there. Um, I would like a new job and I'd like a new job that actually pays me a decent salary as opposed to the one I was in. So I figured, well, if I left the company, I could write a book, the company would have no say over it. And that would give me a really good piece of value add for my next employer. I could say, look at me, I've written a book. And I, managed, I did it in one interview. It's, I'm not proud of it, although I kind of humble brag am proud of it. I won't go into an interview for some games company or other, and they say, what do you know about programming cross-platform? And I just push my You go, I wrote the, the book on it. I literally wrote the book. <laughs> which is, is, is pretty much the equivalent of saying, don't you know who I am? Um, which, you know, it, it, it kind of was. Um, so I did that, you know, partly because I thought it'd be great to write a book. I'd written magazine articles for Linux Magazine and Free Software Magazine and all that sort of open source bit. So I was heavily involved in that as well. I thought a book would be a nice thing, you know, have your name up there, good thing for interviews, good job, career things, shows you can communicate occasionally. And every couple of years, the publisher would come back to me and say, have you got another book? It's like, maybe. And, you know, so I wrote a few books, always targeted towards the professional software developer. These are more like reference manual type books, not general. Yeah. Yeah. Style. Yeah. yeah, pretty much. Unless you're in the industry and have that specific problem, you're not going to know or care about any of the books that I've written. Um, they are decent enough books. They, you know, they, you know, they, they cover the topic, they explain everything, you know, and they, and they sold, you know, some, some copies. But they were always a niche market of a niche market. Yeah. And I thought, wouldn't it be nice to do something that was a niche market of a niche market of a niche market? 
And I figured, well, I've been doing this retro thing for long enough. There's probably enough stuff in my head that I should get out of my head and onto the proverbial page. Um, let's find a way of doing it. Now, th this one is more aimed at a general public, though. It's it's more for people that are interested in retro computers. It, I'm, I'm gathering more than a technical reference of explaining like the different, you know, hardware of the different machines. You're kind of getting into well, you're doing some of that too, I guess. But you're you're trying to make it a bit more generalized, I think. When I read your description. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to. I don't want to consider it a gateway drug because I don't want to consider it that. But I want to be able to target a lot of people who like the retro scene but don't necessarily hang around on all the Discord channels or listen to the podcasts or do the things which most people on this call would be doing. So the, the premise is that it is set high enough that if you just happen to see it and you go, oh, I remember typing 20 go to 10 on those machines in the news agents or in the computer store with my mate smells, ha, ha, ha. Then those people go, oh, I remember that. And the content in part is light enough for them to go, oh yeah, I can understand this. Yeah. Now, there is going to be a lot of hardcore technical geekery in the book. There are specific pokes in there. You know, I've got the poke that speeds up the clock chip and the cocoa as an example of, well, if you do this, you can make your machine run twice as fast. Now, the ordinary public go, oh, that's an interesting thing to know. The geek part of the public will look at it and uh, they'll see, you know, you can speed up the processor and everyone will go, I know that number. So you get them hooked. And then that as a, as a topic lets me then go on to other bits, which parts of the geek community might not know, which is other things like the killer poke from the Commodore. The Commodore pet, there was a poke you could type in it would actually trashy machine, trashy monitor or something. Now, the, you know, the Commodore people know that bit and the Coco people know that bit. But by putting them together, I'm hoping it will draw parallels and connections that people might not have realized exist before. So it will include you know, some of those technical things. It will talk about how key matrices work, matrices work uh, on various machines. It will talk about um, the uh, 6847 and the way that it would generate characters because that's slightly different to how other things generated characters. But it'll also have some frivolous things in there like coincidences and amusing things like that. You know, what, what I found out while I was actually doing research for the book is that there were 151 Pokemon in Generation 1. That in itself is fine. Whatever, 151. What's the big deal? Well, there's a on the Apple II, there's a monitor program uh, which lets you poke things into memory and pick things from memory. So the monitor program that you can poke lives at memory address 151. Yeah, call negative 151. Technically, it's negative <laughs> 151, which puts it up in the high range. But the very fact that Pokemon, poking monitor, is so similar to the address, it's like, I've tried to get in contact with the person that created Pokemon to find out if that was intended. It was on purpose. Yeah. I, I would like to think it's on purpose. And these coincidences just keep popping up every now and again. And you think, that's an amusing bit. It's not a whole section in the book. It's, you know, it's a paragraph. But it's one of those little bits. So when you're talking about bugs in computer games or in computer software, you can link from the section on bugs to the selection to the section on the Pokemon bug, uh, the you know the uh, not not a number or whatever it is. There's a, a particular Pokemon that it trashes memory, so it it's, you know it, it puts up a, 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 um, a weird name of Pokemon. And from that, I can link from that Pokemon to the stuff on 151 and that connection, which brings it back to Apple II, which then takes you off in another direction again. Uh, one thing I wanted to <clears throat> ask you about, because it's a pretty unique uh, approach to the book. Like we've, we've seen some other retro computer books. Sometimes they're you know, machine specific. Sometimes they're error specific or a certain type, like 8-bit mm -hmm. versus 16-bit. But you're doing it by the numbers. It's actually the subtitle of the book itself. So what yeah. made you decide to do that? And if you want to explain to the audience who doesn't know anything about your book yet, what exactly that means? Right, so the book is basically a dictionary of numbers. It is a collection of numbers that are used in computers or games or in some way. So there'll be obvious numbers like 256, uh, and the, the section will be 256, and it will talk about the number 256 and the ways that that manifests itself. And there'll be the number 15, which is related to C15, the length of a cassette tape. 
that we'd use for saving, which then lets me talk about cassettes and how they work and how to preserve them and other things about tapes. And the book is essentially a, a collection of these essays and descriptions and information, and they're connected to one another through the numbers. And the way that that ultimately works is through a choose your own adventure book or a fighting fantasy book where you say, here is a particular number, you know, say one, for example, and after reading section one, or which is like Boolean true or things, you can say, oh, actually, from here, I want to go to the section on the next 81 because there's a connection there. Or I want to go to the section on bowed weights on modems. And so by t going through each of the sections, you, learn, you uncover a piece of history, which is your doing. If you want to learn about the next 81, you take that route. If you don't, you take another route. And as you unfold the parts of computer history, you get into other areas that you suddenly realize are, you know, different or interesting that you might not have come across before. And the whole thing then builds into this little adventure game where you you work your way through each of the numbered sections in the hope to find the poke for Jet Set Willy that gives you infinite lives. <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty pretty unique approach to it. That's one thing that struck me about the book when I first read Because at first glance, it just looked like here's another retro book. and. Mm. And then you kind of see it's it's themed on numbers, and and then the whole choose your own adventure style thing really makes it quite unique. Um, if you want to share your screen here and maybe just kind of show people kind of what the book's about here, and then we'll take some questions from the panel and from the chat. I'm, I'm unfortunately I'm not able to monitor the chat, so Mark, hopefully you've been able to see if there's any questions coming in to ask. Right. Let's hopefully if that's sharing. No, hopefully. just mainly uh, side side comments. Right. So let's go. To, that's not that one. Let's go to the other tab. There we go, that one. So this is the main, um, if I move that away, you can actually see the URL. So this is the main site. Let's go to the About the Book section. Because it's a crowdfunding thing, you get to say, yeah, I want the book, I want the book signed. There's uh, cross-stitch things, ebook versions, a copy of that ZX81 game, which probably won't be of interest, some posters, 1K chess, character sets, Big, big tandy color um, character set there. The resolution is a bit too small to see, but you can see that the numbers down the side give you the hex. And there's also guided tours of the museum, all that sort of malarkey, you know, usual crowdfunding stuff. The book itself, if you go on to the about section, it gives all the sections. So here I talk about the NOP instruction and how it's used to get rid of chunks of code in games to stop lives decreasing it, um, the full version of this section also talks about how programmers would pad out their software with knobs so they could add code in at a later date. Or in cases where, where you're doing a backward jump in assembler, it was often tricky to calculate what number you needed to put in. A lot of people couldn't afford assemblers, so they were hand assembling it. Yeah. And when you have to go backwards, that's a minus number, which means it's always going to be F something. And because it's tricky to calculate, people just put a whole load of knobs. So wherever it so if you missed, back, it would just continue on. Just yeah, slow it would down get a, a bit. Knob yeah. and just continue on. So the full version talks a lot more about that. Uh, the speed of cassette tape uh, of you know the, the, the compact cassette. Again, that's the number one seven eight, which then gives the opportunity to talk about the processes of saving to tape. The you know the, a zero bit was not the same amount of tape as a one bit which meant depending on how your game was structured or, or what the content was would mean it took longer or shorter to load. Uh, Kansas City bowed rate things. There's a few little address things um, in there just as a, as a fun thing, obviously being Cambridge, which spawned both the BBC and the Spectrum um, from Sinclair. There's, there's a few Cambridge -y bits in there. And, you know, the, the Six Kings Parade, which Sinclair was based out of, is still there. It's currently a new age shop. As, as we say here. So there's a few connections there about the dresses, places that companies would live and what became of them. I do talk about basic code a bit. This was sort of an attempt at uh, creating like a, a Java-like thing where because every v version of basic was slightly different, they said, well, we could unify this. And we, we go into some detail on how this Esperanto for computers worked. And there was a reason for it being called 1200. You'll probably work out why when you 
read all of this, but uh, you know you can read it at your leisure, pictures of cassette tapes and so on. So there's a lot of things, and every now and again, I create an update. Some are for those who have already um, supported the book. Some are for everybody. So I wrote an update last year, um, which is this one. You can read all about that. And it says, it's also the threshold in a slightly obscure piece of Spanish legislation from September 1985. And this sort of section is one of the most interesting parts of the book for me, because these are the things which, if you know about the Amstrad machines and you really dig into them, you'll know this story. But it's also a story that a lot of people who don't come from that Amstrad community probably won't have heard before. And because it's tied with the number 64, you might go to the, to the page for Commodore 64, but find yourself actually reading about the Amstrad machine. So there is the hope that a lot of people will come at it and discover a lot of different things just by the sheer um, synchronicity of the numbers. And yeah, the, the famous Commodore 64 maze thing, I'm going to include a section on that and so on. So there's a lot of scope here. Um, and uh, not all of these come from me. There's a lot of people out there who have supported the book and they go, oh, this, and even some that haven't supported the book, they go, oh, it's a great idea. Are you including this number? Are you going to include this story? And I just go, yes, I am. I've already written it or I am going to include it. I haven't written it. And in some cases, which are the cases I really like, I've not heard that story. Tell me all. And then I learned something. I've learned an awful lot just in the process of writing this from a lot of other people that says, make sure you include that bit. And even just one-off little phrases or things just, just get included. There, I, I wrote a piece today about the Nintendo Game Boy. Um, back in the day, you couldn't program the Nintendo Game Boy because it was all NDAs and stuff. But now you can. It kind of qualifies as a, a programmable retro machine. And one of the ways that the Game Boy checked for the cartridge is it looked for, I think, 32, no, 48 bytes of memory in the cartridge. If it had those 48 bytes of memory in the right place and there were the right bytes, the cartridge was allowed to boot. Well, that's a very simple thing, but what were those 48 bytes? Well, it turns out it was the Nintendo logo, <laughs> which means the only way of having a cartridge legitimately boot was to include the Nintendo logo in your game, which means you could be done for copyright law and for trademark infringement. So <laughs> Nintendo were doing this purposely to give themselves two ways of getting anybody who tried to release unauthorized cartridges. And this was just one line in a conversation that I had with someone. And it's like, that's very interesting. I've got to put that. That's a good little anecdote. That's going to go in the book. So, so are, are most of your anecdotes and stuff like this, are they from like users and other programmers, et cetera? Or are you getting some stuff right from the horse's mouth, like from some of the people that created these machines, created these software? I'm getting it from both. So I had an email early on in the week. Um, he says, I'm trying not to name drop, but it is sometimes. Oh, go ahead. Up. Go ahead. So um, there's a, there was a football management game back in the 80s, which was what really started the football management thing going off, um, written by Kevin Toms. And I met Kevin at, I think, the Spectrum 30 event, um, which is now 10 years ago. Uh, we were both presenting at that. He was talking about Football Manager. I was talking about computers in general. And, you know, we got to talking and it's like, OK, keep in touch. And we actually did. It was one of those cases where they say, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll call you in a week. And they actually did. And we, you know, we're, we're still in semi-regular contact, which is great. Lovely chat. And I, I, I emailed him this week and said have you got any numbers for me for this you know he's got a kickstarter thing going at the moment it's like okay we could do a little cross pollination thing have you got any numbers he goes yes 99 like what ice creams flakes what 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 is important about 99 and he said that in the game you had a choice of selling and buying football players and it'd come up with a list of all the football players and you'd type in the number and if you didn't want to buy any of them or if you didn't want to swap any of them, you'd type in the number 99. Because this was a number that he used when he was programming mainframe systems. And it's like, OK, I get it. Because on his first machines on the, on the ZX81, you could do input A, which would accept only integers, only numbers, sorry. 
So he would use that instead of input a strings to bring in a string. Oh, so yeah. That way he didn't have to use the memory to parse out the string, work out what the number was. So, you, you know, if, if the input A only accepts numbers, you can't type no or skip or I don't want to buy. It yeah, just prompt for re-enter the... Yeah. yeah, so he decided the 99 was a suitable number. So that's one of those instances that's very fresh in my memory um, because it was this week on cases where the actual person has got back and said, yep, this is, this is a number and this is why it's there. And then other times it's people who have spoken to the original person and said, oh, yeah, I remember so-and-so telling me this story and story checks out, so I include it. So I'm still all, I'm always on the lookout for numbers and anecdotes and things because they were always there's always somewhere that will join up. Yeah. Whether it's a coincidence thing or it's there for a reason. You know, maybe the programmer from that, that, that company went to work for the other company and they took their ideas with them. You know, if you've ever seen the ROM for the Jupiter Ace, you'll know it does look quite similar to the ZX81 for a reason. You know, the key mapping, the matrix is near identical because it's the same chaps that went away and built it. So yep. uh, there's, a, there's a lot of that coming through. So there's a lot of, a lot of people that, you know, and, and, and as I say, I'm always looking for more. So more anecdotes, bring them on. So I, I noticed on, on the, the the funding page there that you're at 83%, I think, right now, is that? Yeah, 83 the last time I checked. Now, is the release of the book hinged more on getting the right financing for it, or, or is it more you want to get to a certain number of pages, et cetera, a number of articles? Because you, as you said, you're still actively getting new ones to add to the book. Yeah. But is it is it kind of both are going for the same goal, or is you, are you waiting to get a certain amount of stuff to put in the book first and then it'll be ready to go or is it the funding or both or how does that work well the the funding is a gatekeeper essentially so if we don't get the funding the book can't happen uh that's pretty much the model that unbound use it's one of those things that shows yeah there's enough people out there that's interested but we can actually pay a printer to print up x copies of the book so regardless on how much of the book is or isn't written if it doesn't hit 100 then game over doesn't happen now, do you have a hard uh, deadline on trying to meet that, or, or are you keeping this open-ended since you're ac actively still researching the book, too? There is a hard deadline, um, which is middle of this year. Um, now, because we're 83%, I'm really hoping that we get there long before that. Um, yeah, so it's one last thing to worry about. Yeah, uh, because this year is the 40th anniversary of pretty much half the computers that came out in the UK. You know, oh, oh, and even in the States, Commodore 64, stateside, um, yeah. Dragon was 82, Spectrum was 82, Oric was 82, Vectrex was 82. All these machines, it feels like this is the 40th anniversary of the golden age of retro. So I would, you know, I'm really pushing to get as much uh, of, the, of the pledge and funding done as soon as possible so that we can be sure that it comes out this year. Because it's the year that it really should be out. Yeah. Because then we can also put it into bookstores so that, you know, Auntie Mabel looking around will see it and go, oh, this looks like old computer stuff. I know someone that likes old computer stuff and they'll get it for, you know, whoever they know that likes old computer stuff. Because Auntie Mabel is not going to, you know, listen to this podcast, let's be honest. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, the hope is that when we get the 100%, everyone that's pledged is going to get their books, signed books tour of the museum, whatever it is they pledge for, and then we can get the, the others out into the real world, which hopefully will cause a second printing so that everyone that missed out this time can get the next one. But maybe even all... some updates by that point too, maybe. Oh yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but everything that naturally is uh, relying on the 100%. Now for the book, it's currently about 40 to 50% written. I wrote a chunk of it uh, way back back when the idea was still fairly nascent. Uh, and I showed that to Unbound. I said, well, this is the sort of thing I'm writing. It says, well, we don't normally do this sort of retro type book, but that's really good. We think that's got legs. So let's do it. So every time, you know, I get another uh, a pledge up and thank you to Terry who's just said he's donated. So that's, that's another one. And every time I get one of them, it's like, well, that's another person closer. And with a rough guesstimate on how many people I need to pledge, versus how much I need to write, I write a section every time I get another pledge. 
So if you want to make me work harder and through the night, you put more pledges in. So I have to keep writing these things, to keep them up to date. Because what I don't want to happen is it hits 100 percent and then we have to wait six months for me to finish the book. I'm hoping that by doing this continual writing process, that we hit 100 percent and within a day or so, we've got the book in its first draft. So we can then get copy editors and proof editors and everyone else to have a look through it, get the layout people to position everything nicely on the page so that there is a shorter time as possible before it goes, before it gets to people. I mean, there'll always be a, a lag um, because we've got a few pledges in there like favorite machine and things like that. Um, and one of the things from that is um, you say, oh, my favorite machine is the Cocoa. My favorite machine is the Spectrum. And when, when the pledges, when, when we close the pledges down, everyone that's done that, they get to write back to the publisher and say, this is the machine I want to make sure is in the book and will get accumulated. So there will be little infographics there saying, of everyone that pledged for this, it turns out that this machine is the most popular. Okay. So there's, a, you know, there's, there's some extra interaction there. Um, and obviously um, people can find me on Twitter and they have been finding me on Twitter. And, and sending me other messages saying, oh, have you got MSX in there? It's like, yeah, I, I talk about MSX because I talk about standards and competing standards, uh, and that goes back. And that links to basic code as well, because that tries to solve the problems of competing basic standards. MSX tried to solve the problem of competing hardware standards. So there's an actual link there. So yeah, now, are you planning, is, is the book being published in the UK and then shipped everywhere? Or, do you have, or does your publisher have one of those arrangements where they can electronically send it to another you know, quick print place and then print it in different countries to cut the shipping cost down. Yeah, they've got all these clever shipping things where they just send files to people and they get printed and distributed. Okay. Uh, yeah, it was asked of me um, last year because UK decided to leave Europe um, and that's a political discussion for another year. Yeah. But essentially, I was having people from the mainland Europe saying, yeah, but you're in the UK. We, you know, since Brexit, there's a whole heap of extra taxes. There's VATs and, and all kinds of stuff there to add, yeah. And it's like, you know, is this going to mean that my 20 quid book is 50 quid? And it's like, I don't honestly know. So I had to go back to publisher and I go, what does this mean for us uh, shipping? And they go, oh, don't worry, because we have all our bits over there as well. So they can print and distribute mainland Europe to mainland Europe, continental US, continental US. To, I mean, I guess for them, it just saves them a chunk of cash as well. Yeah. yeah. That's like, so if it, somebody wants an autograph copy, though, then they're going to have to order from the UK, correct? Well, it goes through the UK, um, but I'm sure <laughs> it'll go through some dodgy channels. <laughs> oh, cool. It's a, it's a really interesting book project. I really like the fact that you're, you're concentrating on numbers and then doing all these links, sometimes random, sometimes, you know, purposeful, like possibly this Pokemon one you mentioned earlier with the call 151. So, yeah, that um, was an accident, though. I, I would like to take credit for it being a, a conscious decision to actually work through and come up with the idea but it actually came through lots of random almost accidents you know it started off with like well i don't want to write a book that everyone else could have written you know and i don't want to copy things from wikipedia or cocopedia or, or some random retro site because people have probably read that yeah. you know there'll obviously be you know the the data is the same the information is the same you can't change that you know that machine had 16k of memory always did always will i can't change that but I can change the way I present that information. Yeah, and you picked a very I, unique angle to do it. And, and numbers just happen to be one of the ones. Uh, I've got a book in the in the popular science section of the library here, which is a dictionary of curious and interesting numbers, where he talks about taxicab numbers, for example, which is one of the most famous numbers um, in, in mathematics, for, for recreational mathematics at least. I thought, oh, that's quite a nice idea. I could do a book that features numbers. But it was never the, the driving force. And I was thinking, well, what else? You know, I'm, 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 in, I'm in this retro thing anyway. I'm thinking, oh, yeah, I've got some of those fighting fantasy books where you go between numbers. What if I moved the number to the start of the line? So instead of the section being the 16K RAM pack, it was actually 16, the number of kilobytes in a 1 RAM pack. And I could talk about memory expansions, how they work, how they don't work, and banking memory, and all those technically interesting bits. I can do that by putting 16 at the beginning. And then I thought, right, well, I can then jump to sec sections. And it's like, well, how am I going to get to the sections? Well, go to seems obvious. And <laughs> go to was what everybody typed on the computer screen. So it was 10 print, <laughs> I am skill, 20 go to 10. It's like, right, well, if I'm going to use go to in the text for navigating around the book, 
the book has to be called 20 Go Through 10. And through this rather Sutertrix route, I got the whole thing together. And as soon as it came together, I just went, that's it. That's the hook. No one else, I mean, obviously other people could write it. Yeah, but, but nobody came but, up with that idea, it's like doing a choose yeah. your own adventure based on like, you know, basic non literature back in the day. So Yeah. And you know, my gaming background means there's such a creative sense of fun. I can put dead ends in the book, on which there are some. There are a stack of Easter eggs in there, which you can't get to from the text. You have to find it in amongst the other text and then read them. There's going to be a game inside there that you can type in, which, again, is not linked anywhere. So if you happen to be reading a page and you just happen to see a line of game code, then you can type that in and then go and follow its links to all the other lines of game code. There are a couple of in-jokes, there's some proper jokes, and there's all these little layers of things hiding in the book as well, which are, to be fair, some of the most fun things to write. They're not that, you know, in total, all the fun bits, there's only a few pages of the total book. All, you know, the meat and potatoes of it is the stories about Spanish law and screen displays and composers using computers for music and all, all, all these other things which are going on, licensing issues, all that stuff. But around that, there's all these extra little bits that you just suddenly find, like these little Easter eggs you'd find in old computer games. And you go, that's it. There's an extra thing there. So I'm, I'm really hoping it's going to take off like I think it should. Cause it's yeah, that's really cool. I didn't know you had all those levels in there either. That's That's really interesting, so... Yeah, it's one of those things that's really difficult to explain in the written form without yeah. people going, eh? but when you can actually explain it verbally, it sort of makes sense because you've got that two-way thing of like, oh, so that's how, oh, right, got it. Yeah. Now, I've hogged you enough on this interview. I've actually okay, having you totally myself here. So I want to get some of the panel members in and also some people that have been monitoring the chat. Uh, I look like the Zoom chat exploded here too, so I don't know what's all been mentioned in there. Uh, but if anybody else on the panel has some questions for Stephen or comments or, or whatever, and if uh, Mark, if you've seen any comments either in the Zoom chat or in the uh, live chat on Twitch and Facebook, et cetera, to pipe in some Not questions. Not really any direct questions, just uh, side Or chat, comments uh, even, for that matter. Yeah, I like the one about uh, uh, recreational mathematics. <laughs> what was the comment? Uh, about? Uh, uh, let's see. Yeah, David Lord said, recreation and mathematics are opposite ends of the spectrum. <laughs> yeah, the thing is, I back when I was um, sort of growing up, the school library, I'd run out of books on computers to read, and I read math books anyway because I, I I'm kind of that way inclined. And one of the authors uh, that was very prominent in the math section was a guy called Martin Gardner, and he wrote a column for Scientific American back in the 70s and 80s called Recreational Mathematics, and it covered all these interesting and weird things about maths that you would never learn in school but are actually probably more important, more interesting than what you learn in school. And I got really interested in these oddities with mathematics. What, what, I mean, one of the ones which always sticks out is if you uh, draw a series of parallel lines on a piece of paper and you drop a whole load of pins onto that piece of paper, like, and the distance between the lines is the same length as the pin, the chance of those pins oversec uh, crossing and intersecting one of those lines is an equation featuring the number pi. Now, it doesn't matter the length of the pin, or it's just something with pi in it. It's the same as Euler's identity, e to the power of i pi minus 1 equals 0, I think, or plus 1 equals 0. It's like, how does pi, transcendental numbers, imaginary numbers, and exponentials all happen to equal 0? But they do, and it's, the recreational part is the it has no practical application at the time, but it's very interesting to see how those problems are solved. Speaking of numbers, too, six, he had a comment here. He said, is uh, the square root of two in there? Uh, not yet, but it should probably be. The square root <laughs> of 0.25 is in there uh, because there was a bug on the ZX81 uh, caused by someone not clearing a flag properly. Um, so that bit's in there, but square root of two isn't yet. What should I attach to it? I'll let Sixie figure that one out. <laughs> you that. I'm assuming the uh, the Pentium division bug is probably a bit too recent to be part of a retro book. It is, yes. I may put it in as a passing, by the way, because in the section on bugs, uh, which comes under the number 70 for semi-obvious reasons, 
it does mention other bugs that have existed since the, the retro time, and the Pentium bug is more <clears throat> likely to be one of those. That's like 30 years ago. Yeah, I, I was doing a section today where I suddenly realized how long ago 30 years actually was. Yeah, back when there I'll, was still I'll, five volts. I'll, I'll tell you an interesting story about the Pentium bug. I actually worked as a contractor at Intel. And we had a lot of systems with those five volt Pentium 60s and 90s that had the bug. I guess it turned out they bought them back and then they, they built their own machines that were used internally. They had their own machines that were built. They had, they had the, they, um, they licensed the Phoenix BIOS and said they had their own internal BIOS also, which was always fun when something broke because with every other problem that could happen, it could also be the BIOS needs an update. <laughs> But anyway, yeah, they basically ate their own dog food. It, most of the desktop machines we had all had the Pentium bug in them. Yeah. <laughs> if I may jump in. Yeah, um, yeah uh, recreational mathematics, uh, that's a concept that uh, is completely alien to my daughters. Uh, I, I enjoy math. You kind of have to if you're, if you're a programmer, I guess. But uh, they struggle with it a little bit. And so uh, the, the idea of doing math for fun is pretty foreign to them. It's kind of amusing. <laughs> it's kind of like cooking for me. Yeah. <laughs> it's not fun. <laughs> I screw up everything. It's, it's like me soldering, as you guys well know from the story there. So, so Stephen, um, our, um, the um, Easter eggs across the different computers, very similar? Or, or, um, yeah, they, they vary because at the end of the day, the Easter egg is just something that you don't know is there. And there's only so many ways you can trigger it. Um, so the Easter eggs are going to be a, not a section into themselves, but it's a case of they are connected by the fact they are Easter eggs rather than by the technical way they were implemented or what the Easter egg have produced. Uh, so one of the easiest ones to talk about, I guess, is in the BBC Micro all the creators' names and the thanks to are actually in the ROM. At the very end of the ROM, it just has a massive text block. Hidden text in things, quite a common thing. Games yeah. have it. Like the, the famous, infamous Microsoft, you know, embedded that they did to find out if somebody was copying the ROMs, which actually went against Commodore. But... Yeah, you know, there's, there's the word Mount Weasel, which was used for that. There was a, um, a, a court case back in the 80s where the people who made Trivial Pursuit were being sued because they copied a question from someone's quiz book and the question was not valid. It was, uh, what is Columbo's first name? Now, Columbo doesn't have a first name, but the quiz book wrote this question with a name in it. I think it was Patrick or something. So when Trivial Pursuit used it, the guy said, ha ha, you've copied my question. That's copyright infringement. And yeah, and that goes back to ancient times. They even did that on maps. Like map makers used to sneak in an extra yeah. island. They would just pop in, you know, at random just to see if somebody was copying their map, even though the island didn't exist. Yeah. So there's a lot of those things around. And, uh, yeah, I think it's called Mount Whistle or Canary Trap. So I guess well, one, 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 one we'll ask you here, because, I mean, there's obviously there's a few in the, in the Cocoa and the Dragon. Like there's a CLS 9 to 255 Prince Microsoft at the top when it clears the screen. Uh, the Cocoa 3's got a rather infamous one that actually just about got the Cocoa 3 cancelled, as we discovered during our interview with Mark Siegel a while back. But the the programmers that did the ROM updates there, and there was a whole bit of a war between Microsoft not wanting to update the ROMs but not letting anybody else change them type thing, so they had to do a series of patches. But if you hold on control and hit the reset button, you get a, a full picture of the three main developers of the basic. Mm -hmm. And they were basically, that was, they asked Handy, like, we've got some extra ROM space, what do you want to use this for? And, you know, basically they suggested, well, just put in some random garbage we can use it as a random number generator you can just pick pick a piece for that so they actually did size a picture of themselves and that was their quote-unquote random numbers so i don't know if that one's in your book or not or if it's any use to your but i thought i'd mention that one i think it will be now <laughs> called the three muggeteers yeah yeah i'm sure it's on cocopedia yeah yeah there's actually there it is and running in the background there yes There's a, there's a couple stories behind that whole thing, like the fact it was actually three digitized pictures merged together after the fact. Two of the people are wearing the exact same physical jacket because they were taken at different times, and et cetera, et cetera. There's a ton of... Ton of and what's the significance of the M? That's microware. The, fu the funny part, remember at PenFest, one of the fellows in this picture was at PenFest, and when he came up yeah, to speak, everyone everyone brought this Easter egg up on their, on their computer. 
Yeah, I think he was. I think he was a little freaked out by that. <laughs> Did yeah, he the wear entire the same show jacket. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're all wearing the same jacket. That's that's the joke too. It's the same jacket on three different people. Yeah. Unfortunately, one of them has sadly passed away now too. Yes, fortunately, unfortunately, yes. Yeah, but yeah, there's just like you said, there's just tons of different things. I don't know how you'd link that with a number though. I guess. Uh, I'll find a way. Yeah. In some cases, it's uh, you know the memory location of, of of the image itself, you know, which is what I'm doing with the BBC example. Yeah, I mean, the yeah. only number I can think to connect with that right off the top of my head is the fact that it's been nicknamed the Three Muggeteers, as Jason mentioned. Mm. So maybe three could be the number, I guess. Yeah, and it also ties in with the fact that the original concept was we could use it for random uh, number generation. The number three yeah. also ties in with the number of ways of generating a random number in various forms of basic. Yeah, and you could also link that, like, that's unique to the Coco 3, the three yeah. Muggeteers, et cetera. So, yeah, a few ways to do it there. Also, the, um, the, uh, some of us changed the uh, picture um, only on Saturday night. You know, um, yeah, Paul, 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 Paul has, uh, uh, well, I can show it here quickly, possibly, on his computer. I don't know if you can see. Well, you can't see it because yeah, you have, have to shut your background down. Yeah, darn it. Okay, well, he has he has changed it, and um, many others have over the years. Yeah, because it's part of the like, super extended basic ROM. So yeah, you just reburn a ROM. You make, you yep. Know. Um, what what was the Spectrum game you wrote? The the Spectrum uh, game was the version of ZX Adventure. Um, ZX Adventure, right? Yeah, that that will be out at some time soon. But you can, if you, if you um, find my Marcus Geek site, I've got a, a, a previous version of that game on there. You can get download from GitHub and just compile it. And if, I think the image is there as well, the binary. So you can just grab that from the web. Right. Yeah, my games career started a lot later than the retro era. So my first games were things like Grand Prix Manager, which was on Windows uh, PCs. So nothing, nothing uh, commercial on the spectrum until, funnily enough, the last few years. Right. One, one question about development I was going to ask you too is you mentioned that you've been involved and wrote your own emulators. So what, what emulators did you do back in the back in the day, or do you still do those? I still do them occasionally. So I've done the, um, obviously I've done the, the Dragon and the TSR80. I've done Spectrum ZX81, ZX80, Jupiter Ace because it's all Z80. I've done a chip eight emulator because everyone has to do a chip eight emulator. It's kind of the law. Uh, I've done one for the Elliot, which is one of these really old sixties machines. I did the mega processor, which, uh, if you've been to the Cambridge or if you've seen the Cambridge museum in the, in the foyer, they had this massive microprocessor built out discrete transistors. Um, so I built one of those in JavaScript, uh, and offers other emulators, obviously for Pac-Man and space invaders. Because the 8080 chip is just so compatible with the Z80, it's like, oh, if I do, if I just change the screen display code and add some sound code into it, I can use my one core for, for I think, both. six different emulators. And these yeah, the these were all these were all online like Java-based emulators, or were some of them standalones, or they're all JavaScript emulators. Um, yeah, I can. I'll, you know, if you get bored, I'll post the link in the chat, and you can disseminate it to whoever you want. Um, I don't know why that's decided to do the non-HTTPS version. That's a bit stupid of it. There we go. Because I had this idea that I'd like to emulate it, but I didn't want to keep writing them. So I came up with a description language that describes how the machine fits together. You know, where is the RAM? Where is the ROM? What's the CPU? And then I hit a button, and it just generates all the code. So it builds an assembler and a disassembler and an emulator and a memory monitor, all from one text file that describes the machine. And at the moment, it generates JavaScript. It used to generate C++. And before that, it generated ActionScript uh, for when I was doing emulators in Flash. And I haven't had to write them. I just gener regenerate them. I write a new code module that says target this language and regenerate the emulator. And how, how, how accurate do. is it, like, doing it that way, how accurate are the emulators when you get into, like, funky timings that some of the demos and stuff do? Is it not 100% compatible, or is it 100% compatible? Oh, it's nowhere near 100% compatible. <laughs> It's good enough for, good enough for the uh, standard uh, stuff, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, every emulator developer has to make a call of 
why am I writing this? If you're writing it because you want 100% compatibility on everything, yeah, fine, off you go. That's, that's your thing. You go and build that. For me, I wanted to build emulators just so I could peek under the hood, so I could have my debuggers and I could connect it to my things in my way. And uh, last year, I connected my JavaScript emulators to a big LED screen, one of those big sort of display boards, up 75. So you know, I wired it all up and everything else, which I could do because I'd written the emulator so I knew how it worked. Whereas if I got to download someone else's and then learn it, it's, it's, a, it's a step up. Um, so my purpose of writing it is, what is the minimum amount of work I need to do to make an emulator that works good enough for a few games and for me to explore the workings of the machine? And in doing so, you learn about a lot of things on how the machine fits together. And the timing is, is adequate for most things. The things it's not adequate for, I'm not that interested in fixing. But because okay. the emulator was automatically generated, it's like, well, it took me five minutes to generate that emulator. Someone else, you know, that's a lot of time saved. If someone wanted to go away and make it cycle perfect, I've just saved them six months of work by doing it in five minutes. It, it gets you a lot of the way there. And then if, if it's important enough for, you know, the game that you really want to run or the particular project you really want to see cycle perfect, then you can spend as much time as you like because you haven't spent time writing the emulator to get there. Yeah. That's really cool. Any further hey, just, questions? <clears throat> yeah, it just occurred to me, our guest has something very, very unique. I was reviewing my notes here, and uh, as Ken Ken Make It said, we have a regular feature called Hit the Guest with Feature Creep. This is the first guest we've had where that's what he's looking for. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Most of them are like, uh, yeah, I'll get right on that. <laughs> but no, it's, this, is, this puts you in a very unique category. Good to know. Yeah, because yeah, any like suggestions the, we can help make for the book type thing, if it helps you along, that'd be awesome. Oh, yeah. And, you know, as I say, you know, you can message me after the fact, you know, you know, the, the hosts here have my email. I'm on Twitter as Marcus the Geek. Just let me know if it's just a case of pointing me to someone else's bit, you know, like you've done with the, the Coco Easter egg. It's like, oh, yeah, this bit might be interesting. And then, yes. I'll aggregate it in one of my many, many research files that I have on the on the work machine. And I should be able to find some way of putting it in. Cool. Got a question from Mark Siegel, who's actually the one of the guys uh, in charge of the Cocoa 3 at Tandy back in the day. He said, did you ever do a Cocoa 3 emulator? Or did you not stick yet. with the one and two? Not yet. Yeah, no, I've, got the, I've got the Dragon 1, so I figure there's probably not a great deal I need to learn, because I already know a lot of how that fits together. So yeah, it, it should be on the to-do list at some point. Yeah, because basically you're just adding in the extra graphics modes, double speed, the gimme chip's the main thing. That's the new thing with the MMU and everything else. So that, that's a little bit more, but you know, the core stuff is pretty, pretty identical. Yeah. See if you didn't change this faster. Hmm. I, I think he's talking about a Coco 1 and 2 version. Yeah, that's what he's done already. Uh, Coco 1 and 2 and the Dragon. Yeah, game. all right. So, Mark, did you, I, I'm assuming uh, one of you guys has posted links to it in the chat here so that people that view the video afterwards will be able to find the link to the, uh, the project for the book itself. We've already had some signups here during the show, which is good. Um, and the deadline, you said, is around the middle of the year, 2022? Yeah, I'm hoping it's going to be way before that, um, just because I, I, know, I know the time it takes for publishers to get stuff, proof stuff, printers. You know, you've got to get a slot in the printer schedule, so I'm trying to get it as early as possible. So I'm setting myself a deadline of March the 20, uh, is it March or April the 23rd, uh, which was the anniversary of the Spectrum. So I'm hoping I can get a lot of Spectrum people on board to sort of top up my numbers. Because uh, that, that would also be, a, you know, as I said, everything is happening this year. I've already missed the 20th anniversary, 40th anniversary of the Commodore, which was yesterday, day before. So I'm thinking that Spectrum one, that, that's a good date to try and tie everything together. So, Steve, what is the computer that's closest to your heart? Oh, the Dragon, obviously. Really? <laughs> you don't just have to say that because you're on the show. <laughs> yeah. This man knows his audience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the honest answer to that is I don't really have one. It probably has to be the ZX81. 
um, partly because it's the first, and also partly because I managed to completely mansplain myself um, at a computer meetup once with it. Because uh, I, was, I was one of these things, you know, back in the before times, it was a case of people, computer geeks around the table were talking about computer security, this or that computer, that. And someone, it wasn't about retro, but someone just mentioned, oh, does anyone remember the old, old computers? They go, oh, yeah, I remember, you know, someone said, oh, I had a Spectrum, I had a Commodore. And someone said, I had a ZX81 and it had some weird uh, bug on the maths thing. And I thought, I know about this. So I started talking about the square root bug on the ZX81 and what caused it and how it was fixed in hardware and, the, and the, you know, just the sheer luck of being able to put a few transistors across the CPU to fix that bug. Uh, you know, because I knew a, a lot of really esoteric knowledge about the 81 by emulators and by programming it back in the day. I hadn't realized I was actually set, sat next to John Grant, who had written the ZX81 ROM. And I had just been explaining how the ZX81 <laughs> ROM worked to the guy who wrote the ZX81 ROM. <laughs> so, you know, the man... Did you take it well? <laughs> oh, yeah. No, we're still friends to this day. I have no idea how. I, I, know. I mean, mansplaining, that's, that's 11 out of 10 for mansplaining there. Now, this is what you really meant when you wrote this. <laughs> yeah. But he goes, yeah, yeah, I know, but I didn't actually write that part of the code. And to be fair, he didn't, because uh, I still don't... Uh, last time I spoke to him, he admitted that he still doesn't know how the floating point stuff works in the VIX-81. So I believe him when he says he didn't write that bit. What's the ZX81 market like? Is there a lot of new games coming out for it at the moment? There's about three or four a year, it seems, at the moment. Oh, yeah. Which, I, you know, it's three or four more than I would have thought there would have been for a 41-year-old <laughs> machine. Um, but, yeah, there, there, it, it, it seems like all of these machines, there were still people making stuff. And while there are still communities around the machines, people are still going to build because they've got a community that even though it's only going to sell you know, 10 copies, 100 copies, whatever it is. It's never been about the money anyway. It's always been about that community thing. Yeah, the love of the machine, et cetera. Sometimes when you want to push the boundaries. Yeah. Because you didn't have time to do it back then, especially commercial developers. They were they had deadlines to meet. You have to get up for the Christmas rush or whatever. Mm. So you didn't worry about trying to optimize it as best as you could or, you know, finesse it. Yeah. Steve, um, Steve, we have a section of our show sometimes that we play. It's called, Why Did Tandy Do That? Mm -hmm. And... Um, there's a whole lot of uh, things that we wonder why Tandy did the way they did it. And it's generally sometimes because they didn't want to spend money. But um, do you see or is there a, um, a scenario in your head about if somebody would have just done this, that, you know, a different company would have taken over or something would have been different, you know, in an overview of all the systems? I mean, do you have that um, in your head somewhere? Every now and again, I think that of Commodore, if they hadn't messed up the Amiga, then maybe the Amiga would be what we consider the PC now as the machine that is just the default on everyone's desk. You know, for my money, the Amiga still was the better machine at the time, uh, but it was just slightly mishandled. Um, and I think um, David Pleasance of Commodore UK um, holds that up and is quite vocal about his dislike of Commodore US. So that one, I think, of, of the latter day uh, machines, that could have been different. Um, certainly, if the bottom hadn't fell out the market in 84 in the UK, when Acorn had all these electrons, but nowhere to sell them, and they came in a bit late, that could have been a changer. Uh, I think there are so many possible uh, deviations from the history we have, that it would be a whole other book to actually go in and sort of do a what if Philip K. Dick style Man in the High Castle and write it in, write it as Man in the High CPU Castle or something, and saying, well, these are the points where computing diverged on a different path. I mean, I have, yeah, I haven't properly analysed my history to give a definitive answer to that but it would be it's a very interesting question and if someone else wants to write that book i will be the first one to pledge <laughs> for it 
yeah, there's a lot of what if scenarios. Every single computer company has a ton of what if scenarios that could have happened in certain ways. If didn't it? Uh, wasn't IBM close to deciding between like the eighty eighty six and like the six eight zero nine? You know, what if they'd chosen the six eight zero nine? I think I remember somebody saying a what if about that. Possibly that's not in my um, brain at the moment. Plus, Curtis, wasn't there a chipset coming out or that they, uh, Tandy could have used that would have been like the Amiga or something? Yeah, the was it the RMS, the whole video system they were trying to do that they were actually trying to sell to Tandy to, to put in the Coco 3, actually, was part of the original Coco 3 design. Then it became too expensive. It was going to require multiple chips. Um, and it, it really was designed more for 68000. It didn't really run all that well on the 6809, but Motorola claimed it would. So they ended up having to scrap that idea entirely and then you know went back to square one and did the gimme chip we, we got now. Any further questions from the panel? I've been kind of monitoring the chat here. Most of it's been firing a few other numbers at you if you wanted for Cocoa specific stuff. <laughs> like the length of a P mode 4 screen is 6144 bytes. That was in response to how big the graphic was of the three mega tiers. Yeah, I can't but remember if they compressed it or not. I'd have to take a look. I haven't looked at it in years. We've been watching your cat, Curtis. Yeah, he decided to pop in here. So, like, he's not jumping on my keyboard like he usually does. Is that the Actually, first he's only cat, my cat sighting of the week. show? Yeah, he's only cat cat for me for one more week here. Then he's going back to his normal owner. After the oh, you're just you're just leasing him. Yeah, they, they they got another cat that, that just had fairly major surgery, and they didn't want him like trying to play with each other and hurting hurting each other type thing. Well, him hurting the other cat. So uh, I guess the healing's been going fairly well. So he's probably leaving by the end of this next week. I think. I oh, know. Right now he's sunbathing, looking at a foot of snow outside. Uh, I'm out of questions for now. So I noticed that the, you guys have been posting the, um, the links there. Um, what, one the last question. Oh, go ahead. Uh, are, you, are you familiar at all with the MC10? <laughs> uh, the baby Coco. Yeah. Yeah, I, I saw that. I, I, I've seen it a couple of times. We got one at the museum, and we had some. I think either this dragon meetup or the previous one in 2019. And and I've do you know that. what what some of the things that we've done to it? <laughs> no, have you have you done evil things to it? Yes. <laughs> Go ahead, tell them, Curtis. Oh, well, there's a bunch. There's a VGA upgrade boards for it that add some extra graphics modes. There's memory and SD card reader upgrades for it and all kinds of stuff. So, yeah, so it's actually been pretty active the last year or so. Set it on fire. Nice. <clears throat> so I have a question. Can you port Spoon to uh, 6809? Is there, a, is there a Dragon version of the Spoon interpreter? Um, there is no reason why there couldn't be. Someone's got too much time on their hand to dig into my other random stuff I built years ago. <laughs> uh, yes, so for the benefit of everyone else that hasn't been um, cyber-stalking me in the last half hour, uh, I wrote an, uh, an esoteric language called Spoon many years ago that only uses the symbols 1 and 0 as um, its instructions, essentially, um, which means the interpreter is incredibly simple. So it would probably not take a lot of time to write a, a 609 specific version of it. So that could be a thing to do. I did do a version for the web a while back. I discovered th um, a thing that you can do on, on the web page where you can actually live trans um, translate files as you download them. So you download them in one format and then you live translate them and then put them back into the browser. So I could actually write JavaScript code in Spoon, and well, or at least Spoon code that would call JavaScript and would modify the DOM, uh, which may be a bit too geeky for anyone that doesn't actually do DOM manipulation in web work. Yeah, well, I saw the other language that you did that with and uh, thought that was fairly interesting. But given this is a family show, I don't think I should mention that language. I just call it brain. There you go. Or so brain you could have brain spoon translating. Yep, I've done that. That that should be in one of the original archives because it's how I got my very first Hello World working. I took the original brain fudge and I converted it into spoon and then ran the spoon version. 
I think Boise converted that over to the Cocoa, didn't he? I'm trying to remember. Didn't he port that language? Alan, do you remember? Not off the I'd have to go look in my archive and see if I have that. Stephen, how's the uh, brain working as you get older? <laughs> my personal brain seems that it slows down occasionally. Yeah. It's a weird dichotomy um, of an oddity thing where some of the days I'm thinking, wow, I've just created this thing by doing that and that and that. It's amazing. And, you know, and I write music every now and again, so I might write something. It's like, wow, how did my brain come up with that? It's amazing. On other days, it's like, how do I even remember to breathe in? <laughs> you need a piece of paper that just says breathe in breathe out breathe in breathe out otherwise i'll forget to 20 go to 10 mm. yeah <laughs> so there is you know it, it, it's a real weird thing and i and i get the same when i look back at old code i think that half the time it's that guy was an idiot and half the time <laughs> that guy was a genius how did you come up with that solution that's that's inspired yeah sometimes you just have to sleep on it and then you convert from one to the other yeah Oh, Mike, Mikey's confirming. He said, yes, the, the brain fudge is, there is a Cocoa version by Boise. So I was pretty sure he had boarded it at one point. Okay, well, I don't want to take up your entire time because <clears throat> you haven't eaten yet and it's getting late there. So I just want to check one last call for questions from the panel. We'll give about 10, 15 seconds to see if any show up in the chat too. And, and thank you for coming on and, and thank you for morning book. It's a really interesting book. It's, it's uh, a very unique take on the retro hobby. Um, and, oh, and a oh, very unique you. approach to the writing of the book as well, you know, the choose your own adventure style thing. So, well, thanks for having me on and letting me take over half your podcast. It's uh, been good. Well, knowing how long our shows have run, this might only be a quarter of it, but uh. yeah, <laughs> and it's still early. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got some good new leads as well, things to look up. So that it's all good, two way. And you can play it back. Did you have uh, anything you must post for contact information? You said you're on Twitter. Yeah, I'm on I'm on the Twitters and all that, so I'll post it into this one. Okay. So that's in the chat, um, and I'm also that at dot com and GitHub and everything else. Yes, yeah, so, and and you know, and obviously do tag me in Twitter and that because that's one of the ways that we get out to new people. So you know, people tweet about it, and because obviously being in the UK, my Twitter time zones don't necessarily match with the US. So yeah. there doesn't seem to be quite as much action on the US side. So periodic, I periodically have to come back at, late at night to tweet something to try and get into the US reach. So anything people can also do to you know, reach other people in other forums or on other Twitters, other blogs, other podcasts, you know, just yeah, let them know I'm here. I can talk for an hour and a half if, if, if let alone. And... Uh, Hopefully, they'll, as well as mentioning the book, they'll actually mention some more numbers because, as you say, I like feature creep in this instance. Yes, <laughs> in this instance. So well, one thing I will ask you is uh, when, when the book does get published, because I'm fairly confident you'll, you'll make your goal, um, would you be willing to come on to kind of help promote it and you know, kind of let us know how the book finally turned out? Because as oh, you said, sure. you're still adding to it at, at this point. So. Oh, yeah, no, happy to. Okay, so we'll have you on. Just uh, you, know, I think you've got Stevie's email and probably mine too, or just the general Coco Talk one. You can just send it off, and it's getting yeah. close to that point. Well, can I help you do a product announcement for our audience? Yeah, well, I have you know, well, I'll have to, I'll have the book, an actual physical book like this, in my hand. And you know, if there was anyone that didn't end up pledging for it, do some kind of competition. I'll just send them a copy. I don't, I don't know what the question would be. It'd have to be something you folks would have to set. <laughs> But yeah, happy to come on, you know, give out some prizes or something. That would be, you know, might be an amusing um, diversion. Yeah, and it might get some people to order the second edition of it too, as you were mentioning before. So, Yeah, well, I hope there will be sort of uh, more. And hey, maybe when people know that it exists and they've actually got a physical copy, then they'll start giving even more numbers. So the yeah. next version of the book can have, you know, even more content. Yeah. That would be really good. I'd really like to see that develop into, you know, not not an annual thing that per se, but a a continual process where the book keeps coming out with new things as new things are discovered, hiding in ROMs, Easter eggs, or new ideas or other coincidences are discovered. We just keep adding them in as a as a thing. But let's face it: in twenty years' time, if this if that book comes out, and then in twenty years' time, the book itself is going to be retro. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, retro is a moving target, so yeah. 
Okay, I don't see other questions in the chat. Any other final questions from the panel? No. No? Okay, well, thank right. you very much for coming on, Stephen, and thanks for uh, talking about the book and, and the unique uniqueness of the book and, and also a lot of the nice geeky stuff that a lot of us will appreciate that's going to be in the book and, and the way it's presented, etc. And uh, we hope to have you on when the book launch actually happens. Will do. Thank you for having me. Good night, or good morning, or even, or afternoon. <laughs> yeah, go eat now. <laughs> Yeah, go, I'm going to go and eat. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. You are watching Coco Talk, the world's leading weekly video podcast featuring a candy-colored computer. We spread the love to the past, present, and future for all models, including the original colored computer, the Coco 3, and the world-renowned exclusive French Canadian Coco 2. The Radio Shack. At Coco Talk, we'd like to thank the patrons who sponsor our program. So our heartfelt gratitude goes out to Alan Huffman, Alan Murphy, Blair Ledoux, Bowden Aaron, Brendan Donahue, Brian Weasler, Karen Anscombe, D. Bruce Moore, Daniel Williams, Diego, Eric Canales, Glenn Hewlett, Graham Vebke, Grant Leedy, Henry Strickland, Jason Downs, Ken Reichert, Kyle Etter, Malfunct, Michael Pitsley, Paul Fiscarelli, Paul Shoemaker, Paul Thayer, Rick Eulin, Rob Inman, Rocky Hill, Stephen Wagner, Steve Batson, Steve Rasmussen, Terry Steen, Terry Steggy, The Backyard Shed Gang, Tom C., Tom Gunderson, Tom Heron, Tom S., Tony C., and William Athing. Thank you ever so much, patrons. Hi, this is Eddie Zerbinski from beautiful Quebec City. As you're enjoying Coco Talk, we also want to remind you about the Coco Discord server. This is a place where people come to connect, to ask questions, to provide answers, to share information, and to socialize. So when you're done, why don't you head on over to the Coco Discord server and we'll continue the conversation there. The easy to remember link is discord.cocotalk.live. See you on Discord! Coco123 is the Glenside Color Computer Club community newsletter that's been in publication since 1985. While the Rainbow Magazine may be gone, it doesn't mean you still can't have a cool Coco periodical. Head on over to the Glenside Color Computer website at glensideccc.com and then click on the Documents link to view all the past issues of the Coco123 newsletter. Not only can you read all of the past and present issues, we'd also love to hear some submissions from you. So if you'd like to send an article, a column, uh, something to talk about, maybe even a program listing, send an email to glensideccc at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. The Coco World Map is a cool community resource where you can view cocoa nuts from around the world. Head on over to map.cocotalk.live and see where your fellow cocoa nutsians happen to be living on the planet Earth. If you would like to submit yourself to be on the Coco Map, send an email to cocotalk at cocotalk.live and we look forward to seeing you on the Coco Map. Hey guys, it's Stevie Stroh, and if you've been watching Coco Talk for a while, hopefully you understand that everyone is welcome to join this show. So you don't need an impressive resume to get on. You just need to enjoy the Coco and be willing to talk about it. There is no wrong way to Coco. There is no wrong way to be a fan of the Coco. There's no wrong way to be on Coco Talk. You just have to want to talk Coco. So if you would like to join us, then reach out to us on our Discord server, which is discord.cocotalk.live, or send an email to cocotalk at cocotalk.live, and let's get you on the show, and let's talk about the Coco. Hi, I'm Tim, and you're watching Coco Talk Live. And I'm playing Daggereth online like that idiot from the book. Right, can you can you dial back on the condescension there as you respond there? It's time for everyone's favorite segment. Who's new to Discord this week? Wallach. Hi, I'm Jason. I'm doing some Z80 programming on a system, a bit like TRS-80 and hope there's some assembly gurus around. 
the previous bios were edited for time's sake. Thanks to Melly, Voice on Tech, Paul Fiscarelli, Terry Stagey, and the Coca Talk patrons for boosting the server. Please consider joining Discord and visiting the welcome section to read these bios in full and see what the community has to offer. At discord.cocatalk.live. Hi, I'm Paul Thayer, one half of the Coco Brothers Software Company. I do that with my, uh, my brother Tim as a hobby. I'm Doug Laney. And my brother and I had Nimbus software years ago, a long time ago, back when computers were uh, hand cranked. Uh, and we're going to do uh, an interview at one o'clock Eastern on January 15th on Coco Talk. Well, my slacker brother, Tim, will be joining me that day to talk about some of the things that we've done and ask Doug and his brother, Kevin, some other questions about what they did in the past. And my brother's at home right now probably uh, on his cane, you know, sitting in his uh, recliner and, uh, you know, just trying to take it easy, work up enough strength to be here for next week. We'll see you all there live on Coco Talk. It'll be exciting, we promise. (laughs) And one more thing that I forgot to mention. None of this sleepy Nitrous 9 stuff going on with this group. Tim and I will be announcing a new game for the Color Computer 3, 128K. Runs in basic. See you then. And we're back. How about that Nitrous 09 trash can? <laughs> yeah, I audibly heard Nick laugh when, when, when Paul said that. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well I want to know. If, I want to think through the whole operating system in the trash can. Will it like delete itself from your disk? <laughs> I've joined an SD card. <laughs> oh, uh, you know what? We didn't think about what are we going to be doing next. You want to go into the game on challenge? Oh, we can. I just want to check with Boat first. I know he's okay. there's a new promo video for um, these guys. Retro Ring one, Frank. Yeah. Um, Boat, are you around for a bit to talk about the, the I promo am. at all? I'm around for the duration. Okay, so do you want to wait until we get into the news for that, or do you want to do it right away? Um, We can do it. Well, since this is gaming-related, it is a gaming-related promo. Why don't we do it now? Okay. Do it. You got the Um, link there, Mark? No. (laughs) I sent it to you in the uh, the, the Zoom chat. Uh, Okay, this... I don't think I have that. You are okay. Mark B, are you not? Yeah, well, if you send it directly to me, then it's uh, on the wrong computer. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, Curtis, can you run it from your computer? Because I sent uh, it to yeah. you on Discord. Oh, on Discord? Okay. Yeah. We'll get this. That's like about our show. It. We're so prepared. <laughs> this, is just, this is a great rehearsal. <laughs> it's live breaking news. So All right. That's... All right, I think I can you guys this. just vamp for a minute or two here while I get this set up. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, Actually, mm-hmm. if you want to introduce the clip, uh, Boat kind of explain what's yeah, going so, on. Yeah, uh, so Retro Rewind, uh, friend and partner of many a retro gaming related show. Uh, Curtis is wearing the shirt. Uh, they uh, are uh, now sponsoring uh, the Coco Show, which is the, the Coco Show that Aaron and I do. And uh, we thought that uh, we'd put together a quick. Uh, promo advertising their wares on their site because they're also making the Coco SDC these days. So that's what this is. All right, here we go. Are you ready to take the plunge into the exciting world of the Tandy Color Computer? Have you tried emulation and found it to be confusing and unreliable? The hell is Bitbanger? It's time to get yourself a real Coco and get yourself over to RetroRewind.ca get it out with everything you need to enter the Coco universe. The Coco SDC is the fastest, easiest way to jump into the nirvana that is gaming on the Tandy Color Computer. Preloaded SD card is already included, so just pop it in your Coco and away you go. Pick up your Coco SDC at Retro Rewind and be sure to use the promo code AMIGOS10 to save 10% off the already low price. Thank you to RetroRewind.ca for sponsoring the Coco Show.
So has there ever been uh, a, I mean, you guys, you guys are into multiple computers other than the Coco for the most part. Has there ever been a flash interface better than the Coco SDC? I mean, I've got them all. Um, I haven't found one that's as easy to use, that's as easy to add games to, and that the user interface was as good as the Coco SDC. It, it is it is pretty unique that way. It's it's, it's definitely uh, one of the easiest to use. In fact, they just uh, the author of it actually just released a new utility to flash the ROMs if you want to put actual cartridges on it now too. Wow! Using that same interface that just got released this week, probably coming up in the news. So if you actually want to load an actual cart as a cartridge as opposed to a disk image or something like that, you can do that now too. So it keeps improving too, which is nice. So I don't know if you saw that, Curtis. I think there were some, there were some, there were some hiccups running the video, but the, you, you, you are featured in that promo for a split second. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll rewatch it later. I was actually busy trying to set up some other stuff here at the moment. So, can I get the actual confused boat face picture to use in like lots of other documentation? <laughs> Finger one. Yeah, I didn't see that one. What the hell's a bit bigger? Stock photo. <laughs> Stock boat photos. That's a new website coming yeah. to to a web browser near you. <laughs> All right, game on challenge. Okay. And then uh, we got some more of that kind of stuff to run at the uh, next break. All right, let's see. That kind of stuff. <laughs> uh huh. That kind of stuff. <laughs> High Score Challenge with Nick Marona. Hey there, everybody. Welcome to the results of this week's Coco Talk Game On Challenge of the Week, where we played Junior's Revenge. We had a total of 15 players. We had Coco Discord user with 2,000. Mark B, 3,200. David Craker, 4,600. Mr. Dave 6309, 7800. Kieran, 16,400. Kathleen, 17,100. Rich N, 17,400. Jim Rye, 18,800. Sloopy Malibu, 19,400. Brian Walsh, 20,300. Canadian Retro Things, 23,400. Flutterball, 24,700. Tasman, 26,800. Buck Owens, 39,200. And the number one score this week is... Tom Gunn with 105,900. Thanks to everybody that participated, and we will see you next week. Wow, Tom Gunn blew it out of the water. Holy cow. Absolutely, and that was like a last-minute... Uh, Submission. So, well, a few hours before the end. So, that's yeah, better than I would have done anyway. So, there's no point in me. Just <laughs> uh, you, you didn't have five minutes while you were making supper? No, I was planning on playing on Thursday because I had one job, the first job we got of the new year, in, and I got it finished actually by Thursday. And then all of a sudden, Thursday night, two more showed up, which I'm still working on because they're a little bit bigger ones. So, I'm, I'm actually going to be doing that right after the show. So, which is nice because it was the first work I've had since November. So, as uh, you saw, the game this week, Junior's Revenge. One thing that I found interesting that uh, Jim Rye put into the uh, um, Discord chat there was the cover of the game from the Dragon 32. Which is a lot better than the little Xerox sheet we got with the uh, North American one. The thing that I find really interesting about this is the main character, or the bad guy there, Luigi. They don't use Mario in this one, but he doesn't really look like an Italian plumber. He looks more like a Canadian lumberjack. <laughs> he's he's a mitts. lumberjack and he's okay. And he's got mitts on. <laughs> well, it's cold in Canada. <laughs> I was thinking Irish leprechaun. I think yeah, maybe he was awesome. from some Scandinavian country or something there. Yeah. <laughs> well, doesn't look like an Italian plumber anyway, so. His name's Boris. <laughs> it's a not to me, a Mario. Not me. <laughs> uh, let's see, where is... Speaking of books, someone just gave us a book in chat. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, it's a comment on, on, on Junior's Revenge from Tom Eric Anderson. I was read it out here since we were talking about it. Oh, okay. <clears throat> he says, I really didn't play that much on the Dragon back then, but Donkey King and Junior's Revenge were probably the ones I played the most. These were also my favorites to play in the arcades. Junior doesn't really get harder as you progress besides a snap, but we're here, more here and there. You also get a lot of new lives as you go. Learn where the safe spots are, stay on the correct sides while climbing ropes and chains, and count the enemies as they are coming, and most important, and then he trailed off, and I have no idea what's most important. <laughs> Hopefully that's a second message coming soon. Anyway, go, please go ahead. So there was a number of uh, reviews that I found. Um, let's see, this one is from Rainbow from the January 84 edition. Uh, basically, the guy really liked the sound and graphics. Um, says it's an example of the color computer's capability. It lays to rest many of the claims that he's heard about the Atari's graphics superiority to the Coco. So I had to include that for Sloopy. I actually think that's a female. If I remember, Judd Caphammer was one of the main editors or something at Rainbow, if I remember oh, okay. correctly. Anyway, so um, then there's the uh, color computer. Um, liked it, but he said it's not enough reason to upgrade your computer to 32K, but it is reason enough to get a different, <laughs> different joystick, joystick. <laughs> because uh, he was suggesting that you use like an Atari joystick with this game rather than the Black Beauty, because... Which is what you forced yourself to use during the Game on Challenge live. Right? I did, and my hands are still cramped. <laughs> <laughs> and then in Hot Cocoa, January 84, this uh, author said that the only flaw he could find was that uh, the um, the documentation states that you can get only get killed in practice mode by falling, but you can also die after the 50-second timer runs out. So one of the best color computer games and he rated it quite high with a nine for graphics nine for sound eight for playability and eight for documentation so back in the day this game was really well received i wouldn't put it up as high as donkey king itself i think that was a real groundbreaker for the coco but it was very close to arcade at all four of the screens it had little bits of the intermissions and stuff too so while the sound and the graphics aren't quite as good as Donkey King, it, it definitely was a very, very good clone as far as playability goes. And here we have some uh, footage from Buck Owens. This is on the second screen, of course. Yeah. Interesting colors. Yeah, he's uh, actually, he's got the colors right here. At the beginning of the video, he had their colors reversed, so he was uh, dropping blueberries on everybody. And but the purple and green, though, that, that's the opposite phase. It's not the red and blues. Well, he's got the tint a little bit off. Yeah, the yeah, the tint. Yeah. Oh, okay. Of course, you've got the tint. Yeah. Yeah, because you wouldn't have, have been used to that having your pal things there, Nick. So yeah, no, the... <laughs> I asked, I very like. If you that. have the colors wrong, then the uh, apes are uh, blue and the fruit are blue. So. Right. Yeah, so he's got the right color set, just the, the adjustment on the TV of the monitors, the hues a little off, which yeah. is what we would be used to. But It's got to be the smallest Donkey Kong Sr. ever to appear in a Donkey Kong Jr. clone. Yeah, he's about as tall as Jr., so Jr. must be one of those you know, you know kids that grow to be six feet tall when they're 11 or something. <laughs> uh, so, for tips and tricks on this game. Um, um, when you're climbing vines, if you have two vines next to each other, obviously you, you reach across with both hands. You can climb up twice as fast. Notice that twice as slow when you're going down. So you want to go back to a single vine where you're going down. Yeah, you slide. That's the same in the uh, real arcade game too. So. Yeah, and that's critical, especially on the second screen. And it was nice that this actually includes all four screens, though I did not get to all four screens. Yeah, um, I, I have gotten to it, but it's it's been a while. I haven't played it several years now, probably at this point. Which, after seeing that high score there, I'm kind of glad I didn't because I'd have been embarrassed. <laughs> I, we will mention, too, I think we mentioned it last week. <clears throat> there was a Coco 3 version of this, and it was actually the, one mm -hmm. of the very first, if not the first, third-party Coco 3 game released for the Coco 3 after its ah, initial I'm... launch that did the 16-color graphics. But basically, it's the same engine, the same sound. And because they're moving a screen four times as big, even though the CPU runs at twice the speed, and they hadn't really learned the gimme chip yet or anything else uh, at that early stage. I think this was released in October, if I remember. And the Coco only came out, you know, September was announced in July. 
that uh, it's not as good. I mean, it looks out on a screenshot better, but it doesn't play quite as well. Um, yeah. It's too slow. So, you know, they tried to get to market quick with it, and they did. So I imagine it probably did fairly good at the beginning. But this this one, to me, plays better than the Coca-3 version. And one thing I did discover by accident on this screen, if you fall off the top chain right above the uh, the springboard, it you just land on the springboard and bounce over to one of the islands so that you don't dive. It's the only place uh, I've found that you can fall from a large really height, big height without dying. Yeah, it's a fun game. It's it's like if, if you wanted a, a playable clone, not you know pushing the machine to its limit or anything, but to get the playability of the arcade game, like all, most of the nuances are there, all the levels are there. Um very, very good game. Uh, very serviceable. I, I wouldn't have like the hot cocoa review there. I would have ranked the playability higher and the graphics and sound a little bit lower, to be honest. Because mm -hmm. I mean, by this time when this one was released, which is a good year or two after Donkey King, um, not too long, you know, before Sailor Man type thing, I don't think I would have put it quite as high in the graphics and sound category. It was good, but it wasn't great. But the playability, you know, trying to match the arcade play, that I would have put way up there because it's it's pretty close. And at the end of the day, that's the most important thing. Um, yeah, I agree. One of the things that I kind of had a question in my own mind about is, uh, I remember correctly on the uh, arcade game, you could do a super jump off of the uh, springboard and land on the the floating island at the top there. Um, is that possible in this game? I tried it I quite think, a few times. I'm trying to remember. I think it is. Um, I'm trying to remember how to do it, though. So I tried quite a few times and was never successful. I, I could be remembering wrong, but I could have sworn you you can. Maybe you have to have the joystick stick in a certain position when you land on it or something. I can't remember the details. I'll have to try this one again. Unfortunately, I just didn't get time. But I, I did. It's funny. I have some people during the live stream were commenting on how much of a pain in the butt it was to put your high score and people were saying, why can't you just type it in on the keyboard or why can't you move it up and down and left and right? Well, because they were, you know, the arcade game didn't do that kind of stuff either. And a lot of people back in the day complained, I don't want to have to go back to the keyboard just to type in my initials. I want to get on to playing the next game. I just want to keep the joystick sit back in my chair type thing. <laughs> So it's it's funny how tastes have changed over the years. Yeah, with the this is kind of an interesting question. Um, you guys that are into the nuts and bolts of Cocoa programming, how hard would it be to create a state where, as long as you have the game on and you enter your initials, those initials are saved? So if you're playing multiple games in a row, you don't have to re-enter the same. Super initials easy. Every time. Super, Super easy. Super easy. Yeah, some games actually did do that. This is not one of them. Oh, Tom Eric Anderson. Is that the same Tom that uh, did the high score? This Tom gun? I would guess so. Yeah, he said the yes, super jump is possible. Uh, Tom, if you want to explain the details of how to do that, because I honestly don't remember, but I do remember doing it. As we wait for uh, um, him to type into the uh, chat. To get him another one of those comments is two miles long. <laughs> no pressure typing. Uh, I was so, just waiting. <laughs> so, you um, type. We'll wait. How did everybody else uh, think of this game? Like, who, who all got to play it, and what did you think comparatively to the arcade version? I just, in honesty, in my case, I actually played the Coco version before I played the arcade version. I played the arcade Donkey Kong, and I was sucked at it, so I didn't. I didn't, you know, tackle Juniors or, or Donkey Kong Junior when it came out in the arcade, but when the, the Coco version came out, I did try it and I found I liked it. Then I went back and played the arcade game. So it was one of the few times I went the other way around. I actually, for fun, well, this week, uh, fired up my Atari computer and loaded up Donkey Kong Junior on it. And even though the graphics and everything are a bit better, I actually enjoy this version more than the Atari version. I think it's a little easier. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Tom says, yes, uh, the, the high score was him. And he said, push up while landing on the spring. So I did kind of remember that, right? Okay. Because you can jump onto that lower platform there, for sure. I, I do remember doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, for uh, for somebody who really never played it back in the day, cause I didn't have this game back in the 80s. Uh, so it was probably my first time playing it this week. Mm -hmm. And uh, In the so live stream? 
Yeah. Well, yeah, in the live stream, actually. Yeah. Um, so uh, my first impressions were really positive. Uh, I, I agree. It's really good gameplay. And the uh, graphics, I think, for the time uh, were really good. Um, and uh, it's a little frustrating, but uh, that's because I was it was my first time playing it. You know, um, you, you know, it takes a while to learn, like where all the safe spots are and the best way to navigate around to avoid all the all the dangers. But, you know, that's true of pretty much any game. So, yeah, um, I mean, yeah. yeah, I I, re I liked it. I thought it was really good. I, I didn't get very good at it this time I played it. But uh, well, you did manage to conquer the first screen. I, a I lot did manage to than Slippy did. <laughs> that's right. I got past <laughs> the first board in like 20 minutes. Um, took Sloopy an hour. It, yeah, it took Sloopy like an hour. That's right. That was that was kind of funny. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> but I really, that was the only time I got past the first board. I tried several times after that and couldn't get, couldn't pe get past the first board again. So, um, yeah, so I'll have to play it again. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it was fun. It was good. Uh, one other thing that I did, uh, discover is that, uh, when you're on this screen, when you're going from one of the higher platforms down to the lower ones on the bottom there, you don't have to jump. You can just walk off them. And if so you want to play the real challenging level, do it like Ken and play with a black beauty with no self-centering. That's a challenge. Yeah. That, that's probably the way I would play. I actually played it on an emulator uh, for the, the Game On Challenge. Um, did, you, did you play with a keyboard or with an actual joystick? Uh, with a keyboard because I didn't have a joystick I could use. Um, I don't. I, I played on my laptop. My laptop only has a USB port. I don't have a. I don't have a joystick that's uh, USB compatible. So. I was kind of forced to use a joystick, which I don't – no, sorry. I was forced to use the keyboard, which um, I wasn't crazy about. But, um, you know, eventually I was like, I want to play the game. I want to try it out. So I guess I'll live with it. So, But uh, I'll have to try this on a real Coco. I'll, and uh, I'm sure I'll be using the Black Beauty because I have a deluxe joystick, but I really don't like using it. Uh, I try to avoid it when I can. Um, well, it's – Here's why. It's because the button's on the left side, and I'm a lefty. So, um, <laughs> so like, you know, moving the joystick with my right hand and pressing the button with my left hand is very awkward for me. So, that I, I don't like the deluxe joystick. So, um, I've always prefer the Black Beauty uh, if I can. I, I never really thought of that before, but yeah, the, the Black Beauty, is, is, you know, as, as much as this line for not having self-centering, etc., is it quite nice in the fact that it's it's. Not it's not job, left though, or right centric. At all. That's right. You, the button is in the middle of the back, so it's perfect. You can play it just the same with either hand. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's awesome. So, so you probably yeah, didn't like Atari preference. joysticks either. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> well, the modern ones you can buy for the Atari have buttons on either side, so they're yeah. ambidextrous. <laughs> yeah. And the ones from the back in the day, you could adjust the wirings for left-handed use. Yeah. Now, um, the pistol grip joystick, I actually really like. Um, it's not suitable for all games, but um, but because they're the same thing. There's like four buttons on this thing, so you have your choice of buttons to use. And and uh, so pistol grip joystick was good. I, I liked that. You know, for games that it was good for, you know, it wasn't good for everything. Yeah, and I would definitely not recommend playing this with the mouse. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you think the Black Beauty is bad. Holy cow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and mouse can only be used for certain games, like Arkanoid Shanghai works or something. Well yeah. Arkanoid, yeah. it works well. Shanghai, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't have anything else to add to it. It's it's, it's a good solid port of the arcade game. That's what I would say. Mm -hmm. And it's nice that it works on Coco One, Two, or Three. So, yeah. And if you want, you can play it at double speed on a Coco Three. Though I found that pretty well unplayable, so I never did that. Okay, well, I guess do we have anything else to say about it, or should I pass this over to Sloopy to talk about the live stream? I have a new product idea, the left-handed deluxe joystick. <laughs> cool. Um, I have a um, case of those. <laughs> what, what's his name from the Coco Crew podcast? Makes uh, His name escapes me for a moment. He makes the game Neil Blanchard. joysticks. Neil Blanchard. Uh, Neil Blanchard, thank you. Yes, Neil. How did I forget his name? I'm sorry. Um but yeah, he makes the game store. I've been meaning to order one of those because he, he he can customize them for you, and uh, so I'll I'll certainly they look get really a, nice. 
I'll certainly uh, ask him for a left uh, left handed one. Yes, and uh, that's what I ordered was a left handed gamester, and it is fantastic. Nice, nice, good to hear. Cool. So, Alan, have your scores in all games improved since you got that thing? Because I don't see you participating too much in there. Well, when I get to use it, yes. What do you mean get to use it? Well, I'm not able to participate every week given reality. Well, oh, okay, just because you're too busy like like I've been. Yeah, okay. Get to you. Well, I'm not able to participate every week given reality. Well, when I get oh, okay, just because you're too busy like like I've been. Yeah, I'm getting some echo back here. Like some I was going insane there. I'm not going to lie to you guys. <laughs> Glitch in the matrix. <laughs> oh, okay. Just because you're too busy, like like I've been. Yeah, you know, getting some uh, echo back here. Yes, Tony, I think, is causing it. Uh, I was uh, going insane there. I'm not going to lie to you guys. <laughs> Glitch in the matrix. <laughs> oh, the cat <tab> changed. <laughs> A bit of double speak happening there. Echo uh, back here. Yes, Tony, I think, is causing it. Uh, was they've caught us up in here. <laughs> Mark, Mark, can you mute Tony for a bit here until we get the yeah, sound screen? Just had go. to find him. That was our inception moment there for everybody at home. Wow. Uh, how meta. Hey, go ahead, Sloopy, with uh, the Game on Challenge. Oh, Why? I can talk. You can talk. <laughs> All right. Let's see here. Let's see if I can share my screen. Yep. And let's go to this one. Share. Say hi to all the beautiful people. All right. No beautiful yeah. people. <laughs> yeah, what show are you in the wrong out? place? What show are you watching, <laughs> Slippy? Oh, my my vision's all fuzzy. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I can't tell anything. It's like beer goggles. I can yeah. recommend a great optometrist. Uh, yeah, but can you uh, uh, recommend a good dietitian for diabetes? Or actually, someone who can smack my hands every time I look at sugar and go, "Ooh, yummy!" And they're like, "No." Oh, you go all David Ladd with Dr. Pepper. Ooh. Yeah. Well, actually, squirt. But we won't go there because this is a family-friendly show. No, oh, God. Don't bring him into this. <laughs> all right. Yes, obviously the game is uh, Junior's Revenge, which we just covered in every minute detail. So <laughs> I don't really have much left to say. Um, how, how was participation? Uh, hey, yeah, I could talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, kind of low this week, but uh, we still had uh, uh, three to four people playing at once. Um, and for some reason, as in typical weeks, we had a uh, separation Um of the show so it's in two parts but skip the first part there's nothing interesting there um we had uh i was playing uh mark b was playing um uh, jim rye was playing and obviously as you said heard we uh had our uh, new uh guest uh, player to this week uh um fred provancia um don't forget oh, me yeah him too <laughs> yeah that guy I love oh, yeah. the two people on the game on thing just cooperate so much it's just awesome yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 you know what's his face yeah who are what's you what name? are you doing here it's <laughs> yeah canadian retro things i think i've heard of it yeah that's the guy that does that uh that other thing i've heard i heard about once um the nitro uh, 09 uh, videos yeah there we go um, oh, now I'm awake. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah ins insults half a candidate all in one sentence. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, we also had uh, Ken of Kennedy and Retro Things, who actually runs the Game On Challenge for the first time, and hopefully we'll have him again soon. Um, other news in the uh, Game On uh, world is um, starting uh, this month, once a month, we're going to do a matinee edition which is going to be uh, where we start earlier local time, which is going to be 1 p.m. Uh, in the uh, eastern U.S., and which will hopefully be around 7 p.m. in the Netherlands area and 6 p.m. in the U.K. area, where people from across the pond can uh, play without having to stay up until 1 or 2 in the morning. So starting this Wednesday... On January 12th, 
at 1 p.m. U.S. time, which 6 p.m. Uh, U.K., 7 p.m. Uh, um, Netherlands. Only reason why I know Netherlands is because uh, one of our regulars, Frodo, is, is from there, and I discussed him timing and such. So that's why I'm using that as a reference. I don't know too much over the pond. I never went over there. I think so, that's the European equivalent to Florida time. Ah, okay. That would make right. sense. Stevie time, Frodo time. There you go. There right. you go. There we go. <laughs> so uh, my uh, – oh, and also there was a noticeable lack of uh, Curtis. And uh, we had the uh, uh, El Jefe himself, uh, Stevie, uh, show up. Uh, unfortunately, he couldn't play, but – he did show up and hung out with us for a bit. Um, yeah, I popped in the chat, I think, at the beginning of the night. I had yeah. to get back to work, so I didn't stick around. Yeah. For I didn't see it. A lot of people need to fix their priorities because we had people going to do work, and we had people that were like, oh, I don't have anything set up because I've been so busy. And <laughs> My kid's falling. <laughs> yeah, and then we had this really big excuse about some sort of having to make trailers or something or – or, I didn't hear that one. What's that all about? Um, the uh, two brothers uh, promos. That's the oh, promo okay. The, the bumper trailer. Yeah. I, I thought you yeah. meant like you know, physical trailers like to go camping. No. Like, what? <laughs> no, no. The, the, the bumper trailers were being made while while we were doing the, sh the show. I thought it was a U-Haul trailer. Uh, no, we couldn't get insurance coverage <laughs> for U-Haul. <laughs> so we had to assemble something in the backyard with some plywood and duct tape. But, uh, yeah, so um, starting this Wednesday and then for all you people in the U.S., I'm sure that you're going to be complaining, oh, I can't come at one o'clock in the afternoon. We've I've got work. So we're going to do the same standard Thursday night at 6 p.m. for all you U.S. people and uh, for uh, over in the um, Australia, because towards the end, I mean, although it officially ends at 10, <clears throat> I have been waiting until uh, – Nick uh, of the uh, OS9 trash can fame shows up to uh, signify getting close to the end of the show, but last two episodes he didn't show up. And and last week with Dragon Slayer, I was so confused because he didn't show up to say, hey, it's time to go. I kept uh, streaming until like 1 o'clock in the morning. But, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll uh, be doing our regular show Thursday so that we can uh, – <coughs> do the uh so that uh, the regular people in the u.s and uh later in the evening the uh people in australia can show up so and what time on thursday 7 p.m the regular time okay 7 p.m eastern gotcha. yes and the matinee one is 1 p.m eastern 1 p.m u.s eastern and it would be six o'clock uh, in the uk and seven o'clock in uh netherlands seven o'clock frodo time Correct. Hey, a couple of comments in chat there. Uh, one I'll save up for Ken here, but one to you specifically uh, from Tom Eric Anderson says, how do you connect to participate in the online game on? Okay. The, to uh, be able to connect to be a uh, participant, you join the, the Discord, um, which links are uh, in, the, um, in the description, and I'm sure Marco will be putting it in the, te in the text if you're not already a member. And once you're in there – you have to uh, go through the sign-up pro uh, process, say, hi, I'm so-and-so, and, -so, and <clears throat> you get to become a full member, and then uh, you join a, um, a channel that's for uh, Coco Gaming. And once you're in there, that is what I share to uh, the um, to the YouTube and Twitch for people to see you play. Um, Does Discord do still have a 10 video limit, or is it 25 now? Uh, I, we've had nine on there with no problems. Okay. Um, we're trying to get that many people, but <laughs> let's see if we can break it. <laughs> yes. Yes. Cause we've got a great game coming up. I know it's a great game because it's played on the cocoa. <laughs> the color script said, that's not what you said after Thexter. <laughs> I didn't say all, I didn't say all games on the cocoa were, were great. <laughs> Anytime uh, you don't like a Coco game, just play Predator for five minutes. Then yeah, and you, it'll you seem can, great. You can, that that will cleanse your palate. 
I'd also no. like to suggest WrestleManiac. Ooh, WrestleMania. <laughs> yeah, you guys. Oh, just I watched your review of that uh, quote. I, yeah, I'll, I'll pass on that because not only does not, do I not care much for those type of games, I'm not a very big wrestling fan. So it would you, be you will not be impressed. It will not turn you around on pro wrestling. Uh, you, <laughs> need, you need two people to play that for to have any to have fun. any fun. Yeah. <laughs> I have no friends, so that's... Yeah, really and preferably also sounds. with a lot of drinking between the two friends. That would be probably help too. Uh, we can do that. I've got some eggnog left over from but the I, holidays. I heard a rumor that, that that might be a game that's on display at Boat Fest, so... Oh, yeah. It's going to be on the main stage. Yeah. Uh, with a target on it? <laughs> <laughs> with, with free shots to all participants. Air, air, airsoft? <laughs> yeah, not a bad idea. <laughs> so is there any other questions <laughs> no i guess just what what is the game that is going to be the inaugural episode of the map may uk friendly version of? um okay. i don't know that would i've be been, to I've that, been that trying would be my, that would be my place yeah that would be ken's place but i've been trying to get people to do in in honor of all you wonderful canadians i've been uh trying to get get someone to do a mckenzie brothers uh game but maybe because Ken somebody's just so going to make one freed up. Yeah, because Ken's had so much free time, maybe he made one in the inter intervening uh, days between <laughs> then and now. Have you seen my programming skills? <laughs> no, I have not. I that's program why... about as well as Curtis Sauters. That, that's that's, you know, why that's bad. bad. Come on. <laughs> I have not seen your programming skills. That's why I have so much confidence in them. <laughs> Okay, Ken. So uh, we're going to pass it on to you I'll to announce the next. Game. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to you to announce the next game. But I just wanted to mention one comment from um, Exile in Paradise, which of course is Alan in our live show. He says, "I sent a number of Dragon games for the game on Map Nay, speaking for the UK. Now that is something actually you're going to try to avoid, I believe, isn't it? Yeah, I want to try and get uh, people playing games that they wouldn't have normally played over across the pond. But uh, yeah, if you do have suggestions, I mean, it's not going to be a specific, like a different game for the matinee. It'll be the game on of that week. So, so we won't okay. be doing like an extra game for the matinee. Hey, Mark B. No one wants to look at me. Oh, hi, Sloopy. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> we'll get to it. <laughs> there. Yeah, that's Curtis or. Oh, no, 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 no. You can skip that one, too. So next week's game there we go. comes courtesy of L. Curtis Boyle. Yeah. Suggestion. Oh, what did I pick? I don't remember. Oh, what oh, is it? Oh, right. Ooh. Ooh. I like this game. This is fun. But yes. This is not a Coco 3 game, is it? Yes, yes it, it is. is. It is. You do know that the Coco 3 was never released in, in Across the Pond. Yeah, but a lot of people can play on the emulators and stuff. And they can yeah. get the Australian version. I'm pretty sure yeah. that uh, most people will not have or across in Europe. It's a game that they haven't played. Yeah. <laughs> so that is this one. Pack Dude, Monster Maze. Yeah. So it's Coco a, 3, 512K required and a joystick. Yeah. Good game. Good game. Oh, and this is one where the pistol grip joystick actually can... Uh, isn't too bad. It's pretty good. So this is lefty friendly with a pistol grip. Yeah, you couldn't wait until my new five twelve K RAM came in from uh, Karen. Well, you'll have to play it on an emulator. Uh, <laughs> Karen's yeah. comment was, "Irk, this is hard. <laughs> this game is hard." <laughs> can Pac Man jump? Yes. Yes. Oh, cool! Yeah. You can jump over the ghosts. That's uh. See, um, yeah, it's a clone of the arcade game. I'm trying to remember what, what was the arcade one. Was it Pac-Mania Pac or something? Pac-Mania. Or, yeah. He's yeah. jumping over the ghost right there. I wouldn't really okay. call this a clone. Uh, this is more of a taking the idea and doing something very... It's like mega-bugging <laughs> like, Pac-Mania. Reimagining. Yeah, reimagining. <laughs> I like mega-bugging because that's what they do. They take, they take a maze and they, they make the it's maze pushing, uh, huge. It's pushing uh, Pac-Man into the third dimension. So it's a, it's a fun game, and it is uh, really nice looking. So, yeah. And for, for you geeks out there, the source code is actually released by Brian on the This one, it's uploaded to the archive. I think it's even on my site. 
Um, and I'll, a little bit of trivia I'll mention too. Chris Spy, Chris Spry is the one who did the music, composed it himself as a teenager when he was in high school. And Chris Spry is the same person who coded the uh, the Mario Brothers clone, the Princess Rescue for the Atari Twenty Six Hundred, and I believe the uh, Sonic the Hedgehog uh, clone for the Atari Twenty Six Hundred called Zippy the Porcupine. Mm. And also, one other announcement um, for Pack Dude is going to be episode 99 of uh, the Game On Challenge. So, for episode 100, I have taken our six most played games, the ones that had the best participation, and we're going to vote on which one we want to play for the 100th episode. Also, oh, it's going to be like a rerun game for people. It's going to be a rerun of these are our Death six. Does. These are our six games that had the highest level of participation. So I'll be posting them in um, Discord, and uh, I'll pin this, and then list the games under it, and just give a check mark to whichever game you want to play for episode one hundred. Please only vote once. Don't vote for all six. <laughs> and uh, again, again and something I've seen on other discords is they'll use different symbols. So it's like you know you you'll yeah. use the use the number one for yeah. one game, number two. So then you can basically have one post with six oh. different. So yeah, yeah. I guess I and can that, do that. That way the system limits you. Well, you you can vote multiple times, but yeah, yeah, and just do happens. like. Yeah, just use um, the one, two, three, four, five, six emote. emote there, there's a poll bot. Both, yeah, both you've got use. one you should mention. Yeah, yeah it's, there's uh, also. It's called Poll. Hold on. That's an add it's on. It's called yeah. Poll Master. Poll Master. Look up the Poll Master bot uh, on just Google that for Discord. And uh, it's a really easy way to make polls. We use that on all of our shows. And oh, it, okay. it makes you cool. not be able to vote twice. Yeah, make sure you put on Discord. Because searching Pole Master itself probably wouldn't come up with something useful. <laughs> depending on how you spell Pole, yeah. Well, <laughs> and depending on what game wins, I think we'll we'll have a Coco Thoughts uh, already for most of those Cocoa games. Coco Thoughts rerun. Yeah, so we can even recycle Coco Thoughts. Okay. Well, I have nothing else to say. So. Yep. Uh, the only other thing I'll mention, uh, Pack Dude Monster Maze was one of the late Coco 3 games as a commercial product. It came out in 91, 92, I think, 92. So it was actually advertised in Rainbow. Very small, because by that time the Coco market was kind of dying down. Um, I think it features six mazes, if I remember correctly. Several different tunes, depending whether you have Power Pill enabled or not. It's a very good game. It's uh, one of the more impressive visual ones. It's got four-way scrolling and hardware scrolling and a whole bit, multi-voice music, etc. Uh, shall we take a short break and then go into the game on news? Sure. Sure. Which one am I going to run here? Okay. Hi, this is Randy Kindig of the Poppy Days podcast, the Antique podcast, and other podcasts. I'll be live on Coco Talk on January 22nd, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you'd like to hear my interview and ask me some questions, be sure to tune in live. Pull out a vintage computer and compute as if it were yesterday.
Hi Retro Tech Heads, Data Soup here. You're watching Coco Talk, the world's leading live talk show featuring the Tandy Color Computer and proudly Patreon sponsored by RetroTechTime.com. Take it away, Curtis. Okie dokie. So we'll do the game on news first, then we'll segue straight into the regular news after that. Wake me up when it's over with, please. <laughs> Were you ever awake, Grant? I'm Seven always awake. I'm always awake. Minutes. <laughs> okay, yeah, seeing that? <clears throat> yep. Okay. So so three. Yep, so this is a video by Neil Blanchard, of course, is producing Karen Anscombe, 60 in our chat, uh, his Tetris-style game called Blockdown. This is the Game Master cartridge version of it, so we actually posted a, a video of it in play. So I won't play the whole thing because it's about three and three-quarter minutes, but I'll play a little bit with his introduction. I'm Neil Blanchard, and it is January 2nd, 2022. Happy New Year, everyone. I'm here to do a quick video today uh, of a game I just finished producing called Blockdown. Uh, Karen Anscon did the programming of it, and I did the um, hardware production. So it is now using the uh, GMC cartridge that uh, John Linville kindly produced, and it gives us uh, some bank switching memory, and obviously a much nicer sound with the TI-76489 sound chip. So I'll give a little uh, demo here so you can check it out. This is running on real hardware. This is a Coco 3. However, you don't need a Coco 3. This game will run on anything that has 16K of memory. So a Dragon, Coco 1, 2, 3. As long as you have 16K of memory, it should run fine. But uh, for today, we'll run it on my Coco 3 here. All right, let's uh, get into it. So I'll take it to the uh, main menu here. So that's the main screen. When you first turn the computer on, that's what you're going to get. Now, if you want to see options, you can push the left arrow key. So here's some different stuff you can change. Uh, you can change your monitor type. So in this case, we are going to change this. So I have RGB and music medium. That's the volume level. So that's fine. Um, garbage easy mode is good. Speed, we'll leave that normal. You can change that as well. And obviously players. Uh, it does keep a high score as well uh, while the game is running, mind you. It does erase when it shuts off. There's no NVRAM in this cartridge. All right, let's uh, let's give it a whirl. You can hear the nice music and nice graphics. Here we go. So there it is running. I'll get you closer to the speaker in case you can't hear this. All right, as you can see, it does show the next piece is coming. It's pretty generous with that, actually. It shows quite a few, uh, six in total, actually, so you can definitely plan ahead. Uh, the, to control the game, you use these keys right here. So Z, Z and C will move left and right. Yeah, let's see if I can zoom out here. Yeah, so Z and C moves left and right. S changes the configuration, and X down here will do a hard drop. See how fast it goes? I shouldn't say a hard drop, it just speeds it up for you. So if you don't want to wait, if you're impatient, if you're a pro Tetris player, you can use that option. So there you have it. It's a really nice version of Tetris. I'm actually a fan of this game. Used to play a lot of it back in the day, still do. And um, nice to have some great music. So I hope you all enjoyed. Uh, this game is definitely still available. There's some copies left. You can reach me at neil at cococrew.org. Or you can find me on, um, on any of the groups. I'm, I'm on the Facebook group, Coco Mailing List. Pretty easy to get a hold of me. Hope you all enjoyed. And um, great start to the new year. 
Thanks for watching. So yeah, it's really cool seeing that. You can actually see the, the box and the artwork there on the right, little right screen at the moment. 60s mentioning there's a X, the key that Neil was showing. There's a soft drop. There's also a key for a hard drop. And one thing he's curious on, as with Dungeons, I'm interested to hear anyone's experience playing two-player, because this, this version of Tetris actually allows two simultaneous players. And that garbage option on the screen is a two-player only mode thing. So for anybody that gets this cartridge, um, let us know what your experience is playing two-player simultaneous. And then uh, we'll pass it on to Sixty if, if he's not actually on the show to talk about it himself. Next up after that, we have Paul Shoemaker. Now he's, of course, done all the Poker Stars stuff. And uh, he's decided because he's made so many versions of it, he's got like a Coco 3 version, he's got a Coco 1 and 2 version, he's working on the Dragon version, which won't artifact colors, uh, Coco VJ version, etc. So he's actually making an, a menu system now that you'll be able to pick which one you want to play on the hardware that you've got. So I'll just play, this is a work in progress, this is not complete yet, but just to kind of show where he's going with it. Nice little animation here in, in low res. And he hasn't got the dragon version on here yet because he's still working on that. So yeah, like I said, that's a work in progress, but it's it's kind of nice because he's made so many different versions here for different platforms. And but having it so you can select like you can if you have a Coco 3, you can basically play most of them except for the Coco VJ edition. You can play the four color Coco 1 2 version if you want. You'll be able to pick the dragon one if you want, you know, the, the base VDG colors and no artifacting, or you can pick the Coco 3, you know, 16 color mode type thing. So it's it's kind of nice because he's eventually planning on having one disc that you just download one disc image and then it has all the versions that you want all pre-installed at once. You just pick which one you want. I did see a comment. Sloopy, I think it was Missy that actually mentioned that uh, right now it reboots or something when you exit, and she would prefer not to have it do that. No, basically your accumulated uh, dollar amount um, goes back to zero when you restart it, and because she had to reboot her PC because we put a new video card in it, it um, brought her uh, winnings back down <laughs> to basically zero. So and what she, she wants is a game save feature. Yeah, gain, say, yeah, save how much money you've won so far because she just wants to continue to accumulate money on it. I have 4000 <laughs> Yeah, she had $4,000. Oh, wow. Zero. Yeah, now she has zero. <laughs> well, she has 100 bucks. so. Well, yeah, now, then, right. now that this will be disk required or disk image required type thing, that should be actually fairly easy to do, I'd imagine. So, yeah, yeah hopefully she, she gets that message. She knows yeah. that's not 4000 real dollars. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. <laughs> she realizes it's not real money, but it's the thought that counts. With, yeah, with with a boyfriend like me, I mean, she'll take what she can get. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so kudos to Paul for doing that. This next one is actually a, a kind of a, a video. We covered this game last week, uh, Jim Gary game for the MC10, and he's using the SG6, so the 64 by 48 uh, mode, which basically just has a couple of colors on it. Uh, and then it had uh, on the video that I showed last week, it had these little vertical striped green things, which I thought was uh, because of the way the SG6 works in MT10. But actually, Jim corrected me on this. And this video kind of explains what's going on. It shows what happens on real hardware because the emulators generally don't do this quite right. So as a, both a technical service and also for people that didn't see the video last week from this game, I'll uh, play the entire two minutes. Some of you and might have seen my tank capture game from last week. And notice that it uses the semi-graphic six mode, but it also uses the the green characters, and they look all line they look all liney when you see them on uh, emulators. But uh, what people might not be aware of is that that actually works out to a kind of semi-graphics um, with artifacting in real hardware, so that uh, the characters are actually just a kind of a solid light green and a solid dark green uh, with some other variations uh, where you can kind of see in the lines. So the two character, main characters I use are the solid dark green and the solid light green uh, characters uh, in my games. That means I get at least the blue and red uh, 64 by 48 pixel uh, characters, 
plus two solid greens of uh, dark and light shades. Uh, the other colors are pretty useless. They're all these line-y characters. But in this game, I actually use all of the other lines to try to hide them amongst the other uh, light uh, green uh, blocks on the screen, uh, which is part of the game, is that the, the blocks, after you've played a little while, um, can get lost a little bit amongst the, um, the light green um, trail characters that are left behind by the two tanks. Uh, so that uh, it be, gets uh, harder and harder to notice where they are uh, buried amongst all of that confusing green. But the green characters that are being used for the trails are, as I said, themselves not particularly stripey. They're just uh, light green blocks when you see them on real hardware. I, mean, I just thought people might be interested in, in, in hearing about that. So I think that was something I did not know. So that, that's uh, thanks for the correction, Jim. Um, but it's, it's nice that that 64 by 48, the slightly higher res SD6, actually does have support for a dark green and a light green character, so you can mix colors a bit more than just the basic black, blue, and, and red. So uh, good to know, for, especially if we want to actually design something to run in the SG6 mode. And then Jim did another update here, too. So this is a game that he's released previously for the MT10. And it's called Solo Poker. Now, for those of you who bought the cassette-based card games that Tandy sold in around 82, 83, it was actually written by Datasoft, the same guys that did Zaxxon and Puyan, et cetera. Uh, but it was actually a bunch of a collection of basic games. It was six different games, including War and Poker and a few other things. So uh, what Jim did here is he ported the P-Mode 4 original written by James Guerin at Datasoft and actually made a low-res MC10 version. And he's actually done some improvements on it here. So I won't play the the whole video here because it's over five minutes, but I'll play a little bit so you can kind of see what the game looks like. In fact, you might kind of recognize, recognize this from the game from Paul we just showed earlier. <laughs> Is this based on the same the same thing? Yeah, similar. It's basically you 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 draw a card off, and then you have to pick which row and column to put it in. At the end of the round, it'll count up your scores on the columns, count up your scores in the rows. And the white ones in the middle, they get kind of flipped over every so many turns, and you don't have any control over those. So you're kind of guessing, where am I going to get you know, a four of a kind or a straight or whatever. I see. But that's, that's the MC10 version. So the MC10 people have the same game that Paul Shoemaker's just been you know, doing that, you know, menu system to do the Coco 3, Coco VJ, Dragon, Coco 1 and 2, etc. I guess now I'm going to have to install an MC10 emulator into Missy's computer. <laughs> yeah. Next up, Gwen Major, of course, who's the uh, host of the Color Computer Archive, also the creator of the Coco SDC uh, software, SDX Explorer, and the new Flash version which we'll be covering in the regular news uh, for updating the Flash on the Coco SDC. He also did another one here. He took the Star Suit game, which is a semi-graphics 8 game, with some very nice animations for semi-graphics, including the little stars flying in the background. And uh, that is one game that we've uh, mentioned a few times on the game on section of the uh, show in the last year or two, as we've seen some videos of it being played on the Dragon itself. But it's one of the games that had not been converted to the Coco before, so the key controls were kind of really wonky to try to sort of do remapped because of course the keyboards are mapped differently in the hardware so he actually took the time to, to go into star swoop here and actually change it so that it, the keys are proper for the coco and this is available on the color computer archive he's got some screenshots of it here in case you're not familiar with the game but you can go grab that one so that's another one you can add to the list ken that we can now run on the on the coco if you want to run it on the real hardware as well as on the dragon on the emulators that's kind of a galaxy installed game in semi graphics Next up after that, uh, Paris Surratt has announced the next batch of AGD games. These are ones converted from Spectrum and the uh, AGD engine. Uh, so this is, I think, the fourth new pack um, where he's basically catching up the library uh, out of nine packs of six that he's, he's having released weekly at this point. So this is number 45, and this includes the six games mentioned up here. So it's Dan Terrific 2, Journey to the Unknown, Mystery presentation, which is kind of like the intro to the game mystery and then mystery part one. I'm not sure if there's another mystery part two or three still coming yet. Um, then Springbot Mars Attack and Tapper Demo. And here's some screenshots. So nice little skeleton graphics there. 
Um, most of these kind of look similar style because of the way the engine works, but there's a few here that actually look a little bit different that I thought of that I tried to kind of highlight here. Um, nice custom font to here too, kind of the hellish font, I guess you'd call it. There's more standard font on that one. This looks more like the standard, you know, games that I usually see done with AG the engine, which is kind of like Jet Set Willy or, you know, kind of along that Elkmanic Miner style. There's the mystery, the intro part of it. Now, this one's a bit different because it's actually kind of got different perspectives. So the sprites are a little bit different sizes than you're normally seeing in the AGD. They're actually combined sprites. So this one looks a bit more unique. This is one I would like to try because it, it, it looks like they're pushing the AGD engine a, a little bit of a different direction than it normally has been used for. And then here's the actual gameplay screens from the actual game itself. Like that's a pretty large, if this is animated, I haven't actually had a chance to try it yet, but that's a pretty large for Sprite for the AGD engine. So I'm assuming it's a bunch of Sprites or tiles together. And uh, definitely more, you know, multi-screen platformy than just the, you know, Kind of playing on the same screen concept this one it looks like you'd be bouncing back and forth a lot more often but very very well done two color graphics on it of course the spectrum would have the, the color color attributes added on as well there's springbot mars attack just looks like a pretty decently designed game So that one's now available for download. If you uh, hit the World of Dragon Archive, which is where I'm on here, you can grab them on there. Um, he releases the monthly path, packs, as we mentioned last week, which is basically the sum total of every single game out on the AGD engine. If you that are new, that you if you don't want to like you know do the weekly updates, you can just wait you know once a month and grab the big pack that has everything in it. And these, of course, work on the Coco One, Two, Three, or Dragon Thirty Two Sixty Four. Next up, Anders Carlson actually mentioned this. Now, this I did not know. Now, the, there's some people on the panel that I know are fairly regular users of Atari Age. I think Mark, you're one. I think Alan's another. Is that correct? Am I getting that right? Mark Overhoser, I should miss today. So apparently they have a, a weekly gameplay tracker that has been running since 2008. It originally was meant for the Atari 2600. They expanded it since to cover a variety of the platform, same as the actual form itself, the actual website does. And the current top 10 for the MC10, he listed the most 10 most played games for the system. Um, and they seem to be almost all adventure games, which is a bit of a surprise. Like, I don't know if, if maybe they're not aware of all Jim Carrey's 500, 600 games or some of the new ML ones we've been, you know, talking about lately that have been produced in Japan, et cetera, or some of the other ones that have been done in the last year or two. So I'm not sure if, if they're not aware of them or they just haven't, you know, filtered up through that. Or maybe just people on the Atari age really like playing text adventure games any comments from alan or mark anybody that actually kind of follows these forms what what, what the scenes like with the mc10 on atari age yeah sorry i don't know uh i tend to stick to the atari stuff on atari age i do know they cover a bunch of other things though, but i think that this is actually being tracked from within the engine so it's like an automatic tracking thing yeah it's just telling you how long you've been playing the things and then they just post them up there but uh, it'd be definitely worth more worth hearing more about how all that works because it kind of goes in well with uh, the Coco Show and their the way they work and the uh, game on Challenge here. Cool, Marco Overholzer, did you have you done anything with this, or are you still on the call for that matter? We can ask James D too because I know he spends a lot of time uh, over on there and uh, is far more connected to the MC10 as well. Oh, good, good, good point. So, James, if you're listening out there, maybe uh, fire us a line, or maybe pop on the show next week and kind of you can talk about it a bit. Next up here, we've got the next episode of Sibling Rivalry. This is Tim Lindner, of course, playing with his sister AJ. In this case here, they picked Glenn Hewlett's Coco Three Transcode of Joust, played on real hardware. Now, this is a game they both say during the uh, the show that they actually both loved playing in arcades back in the day. They actually mentioned a specific movie theater they used to go to as kids that had this and a couple other games that they really enjoyed. And it sounds like their skill levels have not changed since then. AJ is still not quite as good at it as Tim. 
and and Tim tends to you do the more combative role of you know taking care of the other human player as opposed to cooperating like you're supposed to. So once again, it's filled with a lot of laughter and comedy and stuff. It's a it's a real fun. I'll just play a little bit of it here. There might be some blue language depending on. So I'll uh, I won't play too far into it before that starts. <laughs> It's a good series, though, and it doesn't just cover Coco. It covers other platforms as well. Hey, Tim! Yeah. Welcome to episode 11. Well, thank you, AJ. This is, uh, I'm really glad to be here. I'm glad, too. Guess what we're playing? Uh, I think we're playing Jumps, just like it said on the screen. Yes! I love this game. When, I, when we were kids... And we go to the movie theater. We always had a little extra time. The Briggsmore Seven. Briggs Briggsmore Seven. That's right in in Modesto, in Modesto California. Modesto, California, where George Lucas got his start. Yep, George Lucas got his start, and that was mentioned in the movie uh, with Eddie Murphy and uh, Nick Nolte. Uh, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> can't remember the name of the movie. Uh, I hate that. If any of our viewers can remember. Extra it, points if they can remember the name of the movie. Extra points if you put it in the comments. Okay. But anyway. Uh, we've anyway, I won't play the whole thing. You guys can go check it out. It's, it's a fun series. A lot of. There's, there's, it's a combination of like sibling rivalry, which is the title of the show itself. Um, but also just basically having a lot of fun revisiting their youth. Playing a lot of the games they played back. They've covered in television stuff. They've covered Coco stuff, etc arcade etc too so it's a, it's a really good series and it's always games that you you have simultaneous play it's not any games where you take turns so you actually get that interaction between them and both on screen and off so it's, it's a real fun series highly recommend it. and the last of my uh game on news here uh paul clues on youtube posted a video here playing a game called mission moon base running on his real dragon 32 and he's actually loading it from a wav file on his pc now, this is loosely based on Moon Patrol, but it's a little little bit different. Um, I'll, I'll show a little bit of it here just to show the kind of intro screens, and then I'll kind of skip the actual loading of the full game. And this one actually has a double load screen loader, which is a little bit different. I didn't see that done too often, especially on the Coco side, but basically load a text version to give you the kind of the credits. And then it actually takes the time to load in a PMO3 screen with the actual graphic background, which means this game could have loaded a lot faster if you just skipped all this and just loaded the darn game. But... I had to make it look fancy. And I, I, if, if one of you guys correct me if I'm wrong, but this is one I do not think we have shown before on, on the Game On News as one of the ones that say, hi, Retro Game Alert, or somebody else has uh, done video plays of. This is not one I remember seeing before. And Sixie, if you're in the chat, is this one you played back in the day? Or anybody else that was in Europe and the UK? Skipping at the actual gameplay. So right away you can see that mechanic's different. On Moon Patrol, they fly around, they drop bombs on you. These ones they fly across and they just dive bomb you straight off as kamikazes. And you have these little comet like meteor things that are going by that just fly straight across and, and as far as I know in this level anyway, they don't actually shoot at you or anything, but you can shoot them for points. So it's taking move patrol, but it's shifting it around a little bit, so it's a little bit more original. And of course you can't run into the holes in the ground. And that almost looks like he has a smart bomb or something, which also is not in move patrol, obviously. I think in the original Moon Patrol, they did bo do uh, bomb dive you as well. If you took too long to shoot them, they would come yeah, down. Yeah, that's that's true. At the very end, they would come down and hit you, but yeah, not immediately yeah. like they do here. No, no. Yeah, I think if you're running out of the timer for whatever your current checkpoint was, it would, it would just... Yeah, it just says, oh, I've got I've to end it for this guy. <laughs> yeah. He's taking too long. <laughs> But the animation of it driving over the hills is actually quite well done on this one. But it looks more like a, a you know, a, kind of an ATV or something. That was an interesting take, I thought. It's, uh, you know, graphically it's using one of the ones where they, could, they didn't have artifact colors. So they could pick a black screen unless they wanted just black and white. But uh, nice animations, pretty good sound, and a little bit of originality, which I really like. 
That's the end of the game on news. So now I'll switch over to the regular news. Let me get that queued up here. From around the world, what you need to know. Get caught up on news with El Curtis Boyle. And now a Muppet News Flash. We're back. Okie dokie. Okay, is you guys seeing the CMOX screen? Yep. Okay, so the first update here is from Pierre Sarazin. Um, he's released the latest version of the C-like compiler called CMOX, uh, 0.1.73. And there is a little bit of a known issue he's, he's going to be fixing. It. It's a, one, if you're using smart quotes, it doesn't quite parse those correctly. So fix that. It's a pretty minor thing. But he's added some additional floppy support. Uh, including a standalone floppy, so you don't need the ROMs mapped in to do discon routines, for those of you who are familiar with discon from the semi-language programming. That actually has a little bit of its own internal library you can use, so it just needs that routine in there, which means you can actually use the full 64K, you don't have to keep swapping ROMs in and out or preserve tons of you know, lower memory here for basic to keep track of, which you currently would have to do for using discon, so it actually frees up more memory for your game or program. Um, at the same time, he's also added a companion piece for those with Cocoa 3s, which is a separate little download, but it's a library for it called bgraph here, which is down over here. It requires the new version of CMOC. So what this does is it adds graphic 3 command support, handles all the memory mapping, the MMU mapping, and stuff like that, so you don't have to worry about doing all that stuff manually yourself, uh, to run on a 320 by 216 color screen. And it has some of the graphics primitives like line and draw and paint and circle, et cetera, too. So... He's got some native Cocoa 3 support of the graphics, higher res graphics, and the higher color graphics modes from the Cocoa 3 uniquely. So a combination of running the new CMOC uh, 173 plus this new B-Graph means I think it's going to be a lot easier for a lot of people to write Cocoa 3 games if they're familiar with C. So hopefully some of you guys that actually do use CMOC now may give this a shot and let us know how the new graphics library works. I don't know what its speed's like or anything. I haven't tried it. Uh, it'd be interesting to see what your guys' reaction to it is. And speaking of software updates, and Mark Overholzer, you might have to help me a bit more with this because I'm not super familiar with the move. It's obviously a, an upgrade board for the Dragon and the Cocoa, which I think adds in an MMU and up to 512K or something like that. And this is basically a mm -hmm. software update from my understanding. Uh, what exactly has changed here, Mark? Um, I don't know. I actually haven't tried this yet, so. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Because he, he yeah, mentions I... here in the readme, like it's a multi-ROM builder and runtime. Is that something it's not had before? Um, ROM builder. Um, you know, honestly, I'm not quite sure. I've only messed with it just a little bit, so I'm very fuzzy on the whole thing overall. I mean, it does have extra memory and MMU, and it has SD cards, so you can uh, boot stuff from it. But yeah, I'm not sure if this is to add extra RAM ROM capability for like booting stuff or what. Okay. Anybody else in the panel much familiar with the move? Like maybe Alan or somebody? If any of you guys have one of these, or Nick for that matter, I don't know if you have one. Uh, you don't? Okay. I, I do know a little bit about the hardware. Um, I know there's a OSINE level two for the, uh, like the Dragon, for example, that uses this so you can get the uh, MMU hardware, which is required for level two. Um, and he's got this SD card really out here where you can actually have multiple boots in here at the same time. You can boot like uh, multi ROM or Fusix, Nitrous 9, standard disk images, et cetera, here too, in certain size partitions. Um, and Tormod's been the guy in the head of the hardware and software for this project for years. Um, well, if, if one of you guys gets a chance to fiddle with this sometime in the near future, I wouldn't mind getting a bit of a mini review of what, what, what's all involved in the, the update he did. This is strictly a software update. There's no hardware update at this point. Um, but I'd, I'd like to know exactly where Correct. exactly is, is the move mainly aimed for people with dragons and Coco 1 and 2s? Yes. So it's yeah, because it contains really its own MMU and 512K of RAM. I do right, that. so it's not a Coco 3 thing, yeah. Yeah, and it also has the SD card reader, so you can actually load in stuff. Yeah. Now, speaking of the SDC, and I mentioned this before when we were talking to Boat, uh, when the, the Retro Rewind commercial for the SDC was on, um, Gwen Major, of course, hosted the Color Computer Archive and uh, the SDC Explorer and you know, a bazillion other things, including that new Star Soup implementation for the Coco. Is introducing SDC much. Flash. What's that? He doesn't do much. No, he's, he's he only got one project he concentrates on. 
So the SD card itself, for those of you familiar with the hardware side of things, actually, in addition to being an SD card reader, it also has eight ROM slots. And defaults, I think, to Disk Basic and SDC DOS. And then you can populate the other ones with alternate DOSs like ADOS or HDB DOS or RGB DOS or whatever. Or, you know, game carts like, you know, Rampage or whatever you want to do type it. thing. Yes. <laughs> well, that wouldn't be high on my list, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what he's done here is he's introduced SDC Flash. Now, there has been Flash utilities before, but they've been not what I would call user-friendly. And this is something Wim is really good at doing because SDC, SD Explorer, as, as you well know, and as Bodis pointed out, is very easy to use, even compared with some of the other SD card solutions on other retro platforms. So what he's done here is he's taken the ease of use that he's put into that, and now he's put it into the Flash ROM utility. So now you can just you know pick your ROM set applications, figure out which ROM you want, what bank you want to put it into, it'll tell you what size is required because, I mean, the cartridges vary from 2K up to 32K or even higher if you're getting into some of the MMU-based ones. And uh, you can download this now and it's just as easy. So if you want instant load on where you don't have to go through menus and select, you know, a disk image and then let it load and all that stuff, if you want to actually just, you know, flip the dip switches and say, I want to boot right into Rampage or right into whatever ROM game you want or scripts it if you really want to, um, you can actually do that now, and it's very easy to to install these now without any you know but programming it, skills whatsoever. Do you know if it's limited to a certain ROM size? Um, I'm trying the to remember the size. Are, ROM banks are 16k, so there should, yeah. should be eight 16k banks. So yeah, yeah there so, is a limit. Yeah. Does does oh, he it, allow using two of them simultaneously to map in like a 32k? I don't think ROM? he does. Okay, so this would be mostly the. Well, cover all the Cocoa 1 and 2 ones because those only went yeah. up to 16K. Yeah. And some of the smaller Cocoa 3 games, I think, actually did fit in 16K, if I remember correctly. I think Vexter is one of them, to be honest. Yeah. I think yeah, so. So it will work on some of those as well. But yeah, and if you I'd want like the to instant just, loop. I'd like to point out that there is a disc version of Color Script Set 2 that you could do instead. Yeah. Then you have to select the menu and go <laughs> down to the script set and yeah, pick but that had, disc and launch that program. This would be turn disc on your one. script set, man. That disc one doesn't have the checkerboard, so you can play chess. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, if you want a really easy to use solution to preload ROMs, and these can be like utility ROMs, like I was mentioning before, for alternate DOSs, especially if you find some compatibility problems, or if you have a DOS that's set up to run 80 track double sided discs or something like that, like a lot of people did with ADOS back in the day. Um, or if you just want your, your most popular ROM games, if you want to be able to instant load them without having to you know, go through menus and stuff and just turn on the machine and bang your games up, here's the way to do it. It's super easy. Next up, there's actually been an update to VCC. So this is now 2.1.0.5. Um, minor bug fixes, uh, some updates to the manual. The biggest thing they've added in this one, though, is they've been doing a lot of changes to the key map editor making it both easier to use, fixing some bugs in the existing version of et cetera. Now, this is something like I know, Nick, you yourself have mentioned this week that yeah. you were having issues trying to figure out what the heck is a shift at the bottom. I think basically. that's what uh, kicked off this update. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, they've been working on it before your, your oh, question. Right. <laughs> coincidentally enough, though, right way, as soon as Nick yeah, announced that he right. needed to find this out, they said, oh, here, here you go. Uh oh, let's avoid this guy. <laughs> So basically what this does is because PC keyboards and, and modern Mac keyboards that are obviously do not match what the Coco had, you can now redefine the keys to whatever you like for whatever apps you normally use or games or whatever else. So this way, instead of having to try to guess, you know, where did they map a shift at? Because if you look at a modern keyboard, you have to hit shift two. You're already hitting shift and an at. So how do you do a shift at from a Coco? And this way you can actually just define it to whatever you want. If you want to make it the yeah. home key or shift home or whatever else you want. So you can go through and define all your keys. And this is really useful in some of the oldest games too, like the Coco 1 and 2 games, because the arrow keys were the left and right on the right side of the keyboard, the up and down on the le left side of the keyboard. Some of those games were much, much easier to play that way than trying to play it in the little you know, diamond shape or even the, you know, the H shape or the, what, what do they call the modern one, the inverted thing? But basically they're all crammed together. And for some games where you need to free up some other fingers and thumbs for other keys, like firing and smart bombs and stuff like that, it just doesn't play as well with the current modern keyboard layouts, even though you can look at the key and go, oh, that's the up arrow, that's the left arrow. So for certain games, I'll pick Avenger by Cornsoft Group as being one in particular because of the keys they picked. Play is so much easier if you can remap the keys to map what the original Cocoa 1 and 2 layouts. And this makes it a lot easier to use. 
um, and a lot easier to set those keys up and save that so that it becomes your default. And you can change it if you if you're switching to Nitrous Nine. Some key combos would work better if you map them differently. So you can actually change them on the fly if you want. So that is available for download now on the GitHub. And more updates coming from what I understand. Next up here, so the Super Sprite FM Plus board by John Whitworth at Dragon Plus Electronics in the UK has actually been shipping now. There's a few in uh, North America. I know Brian Weasler has one. I think Terry Stiggy has one too. I'm not sure who else in the panel. Does anybody else in the panel have a Super Sprite FM Plus yet? Not yet, okay. Is there anything Brian Weasler doesn't have for the Coco yet? <laughs> not much. We still have to do his special at some point too. Um, so basically what happened here is that Simon Jonasson wrote a demo because MAME has now had added support for this. So this supports basically, if, for those of you who don't know what the Super Sprite FM Plus board is, it's basically MSX2 graphics and sound chips in a cartridge that you can plug into a Coco 1, 2, 3, Dragon 32, Dragon 64. And if you get the software to support it, you can get the extra colors, hardware sprites, multi-voice music, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Paris Rat's actually done some demos, including porting a couple of the AGD games we mentioned earlier. He's actually ported to be on the 16 color with real music, et cetera, and hardware sprites. So what happened here is that Simon Jonasson has started fiddling with the main version of it because he's got a very early prototype, which has a bit of a few glitches from my understanding. I was hoping he was going to stay on to talk about it, but he unfortunately had to go. Um, and he's uh, done this little demo, which is basically loading a 256 color uh, image in the background, then scrolling it up and down, smooth scrolling. And on the emulator, the emulator is pre-clearing the video RAM. So you actually, you get this black, nice smooth background in the background that goes up and down. Ron Klein decided to test it since he's one of the people that actually has the hardware board here and did a video of it and uh, found out there's a bit of a difference between the main emulator and the actual real hardware on the real Coco. And that the fact is that the video RAM is not cleared by default when you turn it on, you have to do that manually. So this is showing the first run that Simon did uh, which actually will show the bouncing graphics and the actual colors and stuff, but it has this you know, random garbage that happened to be in the video RAM at the time. We can see the color there and the, uh, the amount of uh, smooth scrolling and stuff going on there with a fairly high res screen. So good to, good to see that we're getting some other people besides just Pear coming in and, and working on this. And I'm really curious to see what these people can do with this board. And it's going to be a really good game changer, I think, for the Coco 1 and 2 and the Dragon 32, Dragon 64, because we have sound cards and we have the Coco VJ, but we haven't had anything that really combines both onto a single card. You don't need a multi-pack for this at all. You just plug this in and, and you bang, you've got, you know, very much improved graphics, hardware sprites, and a multi-voice sound chip all in one, one package. Unfortunately, we're getting so many of these different add-ons now, it's, you know, getting hard for developers to pick which one they want to support. Next up, Robert Galt up uploaded a little utility here, uh, D2T. So this is disk to tape is what that stands for. It's a little semi-language program. And this came up from a question that was asked on the Facebook group. Somebody was trying to get in some of the adventure games from one of the Rainbow Book of Adventures. Now, a couple of the old games there were written for tape systems. Now, on a tape system, you have more RAM available for BASIC because on disk systems, BASIC reserves like half a K for disk buffers and there's disk tables and a bunch of other things. You've lost some RAM and some of these old text adventure games maxed up 32K right to the hill and they will not run on a disk-based system. Uh, they just get you an auto memory error right off the bat. So what this little utility does is it's small little machine language program. So what you, what you do is you load in the basic program itself. Now, before you run it and start assigning strings and variables and stuff, you do have enough room to load it. You just can't run it by getting an auto memory error. So you load that first, then you load in Robert's little program here, which is a tiny little machine language program that loads way up at the high end of memory. You exec that and it basically shuts the disk ROMs off and returns that memory back to basic. And then when you type run, now you've got the full tape base, but you loaded it from disk. You didn't have to go back to loading it from tape. And there was a program back in the early eighties in one of the magazines called Disk Detach that did something similar, but it was a basic program you ran and you loaded it. It was more meant for machine language programs to be able to run so it shut the disk ROMs off because it also remaps where graphics screens go and a bunch of things. So this is kind of the equivalent version of that utility, but for basic programs. So if you have a basic program, um, it could be graphical, it could be text-based, but it's just a little too big to fit into the 31,000 or the 24,000 bytes, or whatever it is on disk basic. You just need a little bit more room. You can include this with your game or program and give the instructions to how to run it properly, which is basically just load this in after you load in the other one before you run it. And you can actually gain um, you know, like a K of extra room for your, your program to run it. 
I remember something my... similar, like in the rainbow, they had, they had some, I used to use it with adventure games. It was called disc off. And then there was a uh, yeah. Coco three version disc off three it's in that same vein. Yeah. Yeah. My, my, the problem is original... with the rainbow ones, you have to hunt them down. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Uh, my original uh, game, my my original uh, and dark game from the third Rainbow Adventure contest was designed for cassette, and uh, I don't think properly ran on a disc system because there wasn't enough memory. If if I if my memory serves me right. Yeah, and my very first version of Ring Quest for the second Rainbow Book Adventures, I had the same same issue. It was cassette yeah. only. Now that was more because I was young and stupid and did not a program properly. Because actually, <laughs> dimmed the rays too big and all kinds of stupid things. Yeah. Like, yeah. I just didn't bother with changing. So I changed like one line. It run, runs properly on disc, but I didn't know that at the time. Could you could you explain that one more time? When you're when it's when it's cassette only, you're you're, you're able to use more RAM. Did I hear that right? Yes. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. Because let's say you have a 32k RAM machine. Uh, the cassette basically has one little buffer for holding the cassette as you're loading and saving stuff. The disc system is meant to be fairly complex. You can have multiple files open at the same time. So you can have a text file here and let's say a, you know, a, a graphic file here and that type of thing. So it defaults to having two full sector buffers plus a lot of overhead to keeping track like what drive motors are on for which drives, which is the current selected drive, all this kind of stuff. And then I'll take extra RAM so it has to keep track of all this stuff. So it eats a chunk of RAM out that it uses for the disk operating system itself. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. I never thought yeah. about that, but that's interesting. Yeah. The Atari 8-bit was the same way. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I never used, I used very few cassettes on my Atari 8-bit, so uh, I never <laughs> thought about, I always just thought about these things were crap, and I couldn't wait to get a disk drive, so. <laughs> <laughs> Which is basically what I, I did, too, but yeah. Yeah, I never it, had it, a cassette it, on my Atari either, so. I had cassette on the Coco for the first two years I had mine. I couldn't afford the disk drive at the time, so I, I lived on cassette, and I just gradually upgraded my RAM. That was my way of getting around it. Yeah, same it. year. Like first couple of years, I was on cassette, and then finally I got a disc drive around eighty-five or so, I think. And one one ah. thing, as, as Boat well knows too, I mean the the whole difference, with the major one of the major differences between the North American and the European market is they stayed on cassette because disc drives there were even more expensive proportionate than they were here. So yeah, and there kept, was also there was also a whole budget scene of publishing that supported the cassette because they were so cheap to produce. Um, you know, you could get one pound 99 games, you know, all the way up until the 90s through the 90s. And uh, we didn't have that here. No, no, we didn't. I mean, cassettes were cheaper here, but not by much. I mean, you can cassette games on the Coco, for example, might be four to five dollars cheaper than the equivalent disc game. But that yeah, was like WrestleManiac. I think WrestleManiac, mm -hmm. the cassette version was still like twenty four ninety nine or something like that. Yeah. So. And that was just standard Coco prices for all right. the way across the board at that time. And I think I'm trying to remember. It was Martin. worth the extra money, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> this took forever for those games to load. I hated it. Yeah. So Sloopy and Mark Overholes are here. I was trying to remember what were the prices, like the average prices for commercial games on the Atari and the Apple II for cassette oh. and or disc versus like Atari cartridge games, for example, back in the day. The, the Apple, they ditched the, the cassette pretty, pretty much right away. The disc came out in uh, 78 and uh, pretty much everybody moved away from the cassettes. I don't remember any of the cassette games. But usually it's around $35 US for the game. Things like Wolfenstein and most all the really big games, they were like $35, $40, bucks, which was yeah. really quite a bit when you think in $1982. Yeah, that, that, I know like Boat's pointing that out on the show, like how much cheaper stuff was in the UK. Uh, like there, the Spectrum. Yeah. There were magazines, though. It's like uh, a lot of people don't realize <laughs> that um, id Software, the people behind Doom and Quake, they started out doing Apple software and uh, like a uh, magazine, there was a sock disc, I think it was called, and it had discs you could get. And those were usually, you know, you'd have a subscription for the year, which was, you know, 50 bucks or whatever, but you know, you'd get discs every quarter or something like that, game of stuff. So there were cheaper distributions than you know, the big name titles. Yeah. And yeah. Sloopy, I mean, you were back in the Atari back in the day too. Boat Bo was obviously, that was your first machine too, but you're younger. So you probably didn't see the original early 80s prices we had to deal with. So I didn't Sloopy, see any prices? prices. I powered everything. <laughs> <laughs> Five finger discount. Um, so Sloopy, what were the prices for Atari cassette and or disc based games back in the day? Honestly, uh, I didn't get my first Atari until I had owned a uh, Commodore for a year. Um, okay, but, well, take, uh, take Commodore have, for that yeah. example too. Then, but what were the yeah. prices back then? 
but I also had uh, all the old magazines and such because I really got into it. So like uh, from seven, well, from like 1980 to 82, when cassette was the main thing, they were anywhere from 10 to $30. And then uh, discs were starting around 20 up to uh, 40, $45. Um, as for Commodore, uh, I don't know. I had a Commodore Plus Four, so oh, okay. the only thing that was re- that was uh, released was not in this country. <laughs> so the only the only software that I had for it was uh, was uh, type in magazines and such. Well, and- I, I do know that you know, for example, when um, uh, Minor Twenty Forty Nine er was released, it was released on cartridge only in an effort yeah. to uh, keep it from being pirated. And it, it, the MSRP was forty nine ninety five. Yeah, that was fifty dollars. Yeah, I mean, even yeah, my car- cartridges store- are more expensive on every platform because just you had to, you had plastic molding costs, circuit board right. costs, chip costs, etc. And I know that that is when it, when you talk to people from the UK, that's one of the reasons why they say that the consoles didn't take off over there immediately. You know, when the NES came came out, it didn't immediately take over like it did here because people were so used to paying under ten pounds per game. And then, you know, you have the NES cartridges coming out at 29 pounds. Uh, just the, the whatever we considered full price software here was a small part of the overall computer software market in the UK. Yeah, I think I think generally discs were just, you know, five to, or 10 bucks more than a cassette. Right. So, yeah. Sim- yeah. And, and really, part. it's a bit crazy when you think about it, because it's cheaper to put something on a floppy disk. Than well, a cassette and getting bulk cassettes recorded and all that. Well, I, you know, I, I wonder yeah, if it, it was, has to do with uh, the economies of scale because cassettes were also used in the music industry. Music. Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah, that might be. Yeah. That was pretty much it because, I mean, you could get a individual cassette, uh, a cheap and expensive cassette in bulk for 25 to 35 cents. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, I mean, when I was uh, helping someone uh, release their Commodore software, uh, we could get discs as low as uh, 40 cents, but uh, cassettes, we could get like 25 and that was in thousand quantity. Well, you remember buying individual ones or small packs like back at, at you know, Radio Shack in like 81, 82, or like when the disc drive first came out, it was like, I think Radio Shack was charging $6, $5.95 Canadian for a single floppy disc. Yeah. And, and the cassettes like a C10 or C15 was like a buck 99 or something like that. So it was definitely, you can get three cassettes for the price of a, single yeah. floppy at that time radio shack yeah. was fleecing big time oh yeah no that was one thing they they, they charged a lot for the blank media they fleeced <laughs> always the the most expensive disc i ever bought was a single floppy and it was ten dollars and it was an eight inch hard sector disc yeah the eight inches were quite a bit more but they were um, they're a lot bigger so there's a lot more you know material to, to produce plus they were not that common i mean they weren't as popular as the five and a quarters were you got a free battery though. Every month. <laughs> right. yeah. Every month. You got one for just showing up. Yeah, get the nine volt. That's what's really me in there. That's month, so I did. As it much as I loved my now. new disc drive when I got it, I it did take me a long time to acquire a lot of discs because, like you said, they're so expensive. <laughs> so I like reuse discs over and over uh, rather than buying more. Or hole um, punch the uh, second side. Yeah, the, yeah. the right protect thing and then that's, the index that's hole. That's right. I've got yeah. hundreds of those back in the other room. Yeah. The, uh, the uh, so-called flippy disc. Yeah. Did any of you guys do any dumpster diving at Radio Shack? Uh, yeah, I've got the um, uh, trespassing ticket to prove it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, really. They threw away good stuff. Yeah, yeah the just... uh, friend of mine worked at the local Radio Shack, and he said, yeah, we're going to be throwing away a bunch of stuff. And, uh, and I says, really? He goes, yeah. He goes, make sure you get me some stuff too. And I'm like, okay. So that night around 1 AM, cause the radio shack was walking <laughs> distance from where I lived. I walked up there cause it was about a mile and, uh, I go in the dumpster and start taking shit out. And I'd taken it, brought a black plastic trash bag with me and I'm loading it up with all kinds of stuff, half <laughs> stuff. I don't even know what it is. Cause it's too dark to see <laughs> all of a sudden, uh, police car shows up and, and uh, I get uh, hauled off to the police station. And uh, the, the good part was it was uh, thro- thrown out of court on a technicality. 
evidently in the state of Delaware, once trash pickup day comes, like like after midnight, the contents of trash con uh, containers become public domain, so anyone can take out of them. And because that was the day that they that, that their regular pickup for their dumpster came, it literally became quote unquote public domain. So because originally they were tr trying to nab me for the original. Uh, MSRP of everything that was in the bag, which was like something like two thousand dollars, and because you're, you're, you're it was needed, become uh, needed, public domain, because it was, the yeah, it was that <laughs> was the day for the pickup. It got the the whole court case got thrown out, and uh, and the manager did not like me after that because <laughs> he thought he was going to be able to make some money off the stuff that he had to throw out. Let that be a lesson to you young kids of today. <laughs> Get off and that's this week's can. edition of Don't Do This at Home. <laughs> yes. Get so off your trash can, Nick. I like that. My, my recommendation is if you're going to go dumpster diving, make sure it's trash day. Because I also found out that uh, uh, not only Delaware, but Maryland and New Jersey and Pennsylvania are all the same on the day of pickup it becomes public domain and anyone can take it legally. Well, the other thing is if you take two people, you got a lookout. The other thing uh, is if you're in too deep, they can grab your ankles. Yeah. <laughs> not actual well. advice. Do not follow. <laughs> <laughs> and just uh, as a side note, I am not a lawyer, so please look up your lo your laws as these were looked up uh, 30 some years ago. So yeah, your laws have may change, change, even in these mentioned states. If I get arrested, I'm calling you, Sloopy. <laughs> okay, and I will uh, be your friend on the outside. There's only one thing: there's there isn't any more radio shacks around. So, don't. Yeah. Well, there are some. There's still the network of independent radio yep, shack dealers. I've visited several in my travels, but uh, still, stay out of their dumpsters. Yeah, yeah just, a, just just don't go steal out of the dumpsters. Just you, know, you buy them as NFTs instead, right, boat? Yeah. Yeah, there's uh, if, it, that's right. if, if there's we a, jump into a dumpster now, we're gonna have at our age, we're gonna have trouble getting out again. <laughs> yep, yeah, just uh, dump, jump in, can't get out, and then sue the company for uh, for uh, leaving the dumpster there that you could fall into. Yeah, and my coffee was too hot. Um, asparagus, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think we've, we've, we've milked that one to death. Yep. Yeah. Next story. So next up, uh, Bill Noble, and I didn't even know he was working on this. So this is good. It came as a surprise to me as just about everybody else here. So what he's been doing, he's been taking the source code for VCC itself, and he's taking the 639 core specifically, not 6809. And he's got a Teensy 4.1, and you hardware guys can explain exactly what that is. Um, but he's converted the VCC source to run, and he's actually got it partly running now. It'll actually support the MMU. It'll support an SD reader that's compatible with the SDC. Um, handles uh, RAM from 128K to 8 meg. Now, he doesn't have the graphics and stuff working. He just got the text mode and stuff, but he's working on that. And he actually will overclock to the equivalent of a 6 megahertz. So for you hardware types like the Marks and stuff here, uh, what exactly is a Teensy? Mark, your controller board. Yeah, basically, uh, there's a guy who actually lives real close to me, about an hour and a half, who uh, uh, basically started taking, um, I think they're ST microprocessors. Um, Actually, I don't like an Arduino. Well, yeah, except the 32-bit. So I have the TC35 because it works with those little proto boards that I have. But um, yeah, basically they're a, a high-speed 32-bit processor, potentially 64-bit, and so they're just they're like an Arduino, but they're you know much uh, much beefier, um, and tinier. How different? Um, That's why it's called the. Oh, they're very small. They're oh man, they're like two centimeters by six centimeters. I mean, they're just real small. Was that up on the top card. of this this picture here <laughs> about uh, the screen? It's on the left. On oh, the left. The left. Yeah. The left lowering cable. Yeah, with so the SD card going into it. Yeah. Is the Ethernet? Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So the processor is the kind of square thing uh, beneath the ribbon cable connector, and then the SD cards at the very bottom of the board. Well, so yeah, they're that they're is they're not very big. <laughs> They are. They are that size, right? There was that. There's pies that size. They're w uh, I think this is probably half the size of a Pi Zero. I think the yeah, Pi Zero is about twice as wide. Yeah, about they're the about way. yeah, they're about the size. If you extend a uh, sixty-eight hundred nine from forty pins to forty-eight pins, that's how big they would be. 
Okay. Yeah, that's small. And it's basically a whole computer. Oh, yeah. So it's got like input, output, and everything else. It's not just a CPU. Yeah, it has a SD card mm -hmm. and everything. Obviously, yeah. it's got network. Yep. And is it, does it have a screen driver too, or is that some external thing you got to add on to it? Yeah, you, you have to add. You can program it to actually control a screen like he's doing there. Okay, so the screen doesn't need any smarts. It just needs to be a display, and it'll actually be able to drive the display. Is that my understanding? It, right yeah, it's probably Something just a standard 6840-type uh, display. It's sending the commands to the display. Right. Okay. Oh, cool. We'll have to have Bill on the show here because we're going to need to do some updates on uh, various projects both of us are working on here, and he can update us on this one, which I had no idea he was even doing. So are these cheap? I have no idea. Yes. You guys know what the um, prices are? Uh, it's like 25 or 35 for the 3.5. This is probably around 50, I think. I haven't looked at them recently. Okay. And they're oh. not very expensive. And you can buy clones. I mean, I bought mine from the actual guy who developed it since he's uh, local to me. Oh, Bill's in. Uh, Bill's on uh, YouTube listening. Oh, okay. So ask your question. Hi, Bill. Bill, if you just pop on the show, we can talk about it. <laughs> I'll, I'll leave that one there just in case. Hey, okay, so next up after that, uh, James Jones posted a link on Facebook to this um, particular article here. And it's an article by a programmer. He's comparing programming in 1987 to programming today. And in this case, programming a lexical scanner for an adventure game, which is basically a word parser that figures out your verbs and nouns, et cetera. And he, we talked about doing it in 1987. So in 1987, he had a roommate that had a Coco 2, and he decided he wanted to write it in a text adventure game that would be able to handle complex parsing. And the one example that he still remembers to this day that he tried is right here. Hit the skeleton with the sword, take his ring, and then walk north and touch the altar, which if you remember most text adventure games from that time, that's not how complicated they got. They would basically do like hit skeleton and then you'd have to do take ring and then north and then touch altar would all be separate commands. There was a few like Infocom that allowed you to cascade a few of them together, but this, this is pretty sophisticated for that time period. And he actually got it to work running Coco 2 Basic on his roommate's Coco 2 and it took eight seconds to parse a sentence, which is pretty slow for an adventure game for interactivity purposes. So he got kind of upset with that and he decided to learn assembly language and he kind of goes through and explains when he redid it in assembly, which took him several weeks and he had to like print out the code and lay it on the floor to try to figure out where bugs were. But he actually did get it to run and it would run very, very fast, you know, like less than a second, obviously. And then his roommate moved away and the Coco went with it. So he never did get a chance to finish it. But he wanted to compare like what was programming like then comparing to now. And he had to set up, he kind of goes an explanation a bit of the programming in basic, you know, have parsing and using uh, token numbers representing each word. And then you have on go sub statements that jump to all these to process them. And then he kind of compares it to what he does nowadays in Perl. And that's the entire parser right there that has a, you know, references a dictionary, everything else. So he said, you kids these days have no idea what we had to go through to program stuff like this back in the day. Oh, snowflakes now. <laughs> <laughs> get off my lawn <laughs> <laughs> which is i mean that that is true there are so many <laughs> libraries out now that everything is like a built-in function i mean honestly if you go from disk basic to os9 it's kind of the same thing there's a whole bunch of stuff you have to do manually in disk basic is already done you just make a system call and you're done so I'm, I'm kind of in the middle here because obviously there's more stuff in modern systems way beyond what os9 does but that same jump, it was one of the reasons I switched, you know, back in the late 80s, early 90s, is because I didn't have to write all this low-level stuff all the time anymore. I feel like... Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> because it's kind of mid-ground, I'd say it's more like a raindrop. But <laughs> it was an interesting perspective, and it, it, it's very true. And yeah. as he puts it right here at the very end, you kids have no idea how easy you have it. And the other thing he pointed out here is that... Um, this quick and dirty hack that he wrote in a couple of minutes replaced two works, weeks of work worth of work in 1987 and ran almost two million times faster, which also gives you a nice, you know, metric as to how much faster computers are now than they were back then. So I thought that was just kind of a cute article. Next up here, Mike Rojas has actually uh, been giving us updates over the last couple months here on his Coco 3 replacement uh, membrane for the keyboards. And now he's decided to tackle the Coco 1 one, which is a little bit different um, 
for the chiclet keyboard. So he's giving a bit of an update here. Started to lay out the board um, and those little rubber caps. You guys probably remember those for springing back rather than actual springs. And uh, so basically he's been working his way backwards from the Coco 3 back to the Coco 1 of getting these replacement um, mylars. Yeah, mylars out. Because that's one of the things that does wear out. Those, those contacts are wearing out and then certain keys quit working, et cetera. And I've got that same problem. I've got a Coco 3 keyboard and a Coco 1 keyboard here that both have that same problem, which is one of the reasons I upgraded from some Mid Snyder mechanical keyboards now. But depending on the price of this is, or if you want to keep the original feel of the keys, et cetera, there, this might be an option for you to be able to fix this once he gets this all, you know, from working out. But uh, he's actually making, you know, some of the stuff kind of like public domain. You can download the schematics and stuff like that too. So do you guys um, think that the uh, model one keyboards lasted longer than the uh, Coco twos or three? Because that's been my experience. All, all my Coco ones keyboards, none of them ever failed. Um, they key bounced badly, the early ones. Yep. The early ones were horrible. But they work. Yeah, no, if you want to always. hit a key once and get four of them on the screen, it works fine. No, I've had, I've had to repair more Model 1 keys than I ever did on a Coco. Huh. Because they, they were mechanical. I don't remember how to change a lot of models. I wasn't speaking of Model 1. As uh, the TRS-80, I'm thinking of the first model, Coco. The ah. The chiclet keyboard. Oh, okay. That's stuff. different. Yeah. I've got one chiclet keyboard here that still works, and that's a 1983 yeah. vintage one, and I've got one from 82, roughly it's an e-board. Um, but those, you know, some keys don't work. And if you take it apart and take a look at the model, you can see it's just worn right through. The I mean, if I really one. wanted to get technical, I could use that, you know, um, electrically conductive paint that they use to repair like windshield defogger lines and stuff like that and actually try to fix it. But I'm, as you all know, I'm not mechanically inclined to the slightest, so I'm not even going to attempt it. Good to know your yeah. limits. Yeah. And that's the point of this article. It's, he's doing a new Mylar. Yeah. So you can get to keep the keys, you get the key, the key caps, the keyboard you surround. Just replace the and just replace the Mylar and voila, brand new. Yep. No hair was lost during the, this operation. <laughs> <laughs> okay this this next one here i just want to mention it for the discussion you guys if you're interested in this particular subject here should go join the discussion it, it's got 87 comments so far so it's an ongoing running thing and it's 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 interesting seeing all the different perspectives and stuff on it from a variety of people in the community and basically uh, brian palmer initiated this so this uh, talk about sound and music support for the coco both through the built-in jack and the sound music chips nick i know you were definitely involved with this sorry um and basically, it's it's a fact that we we need to get multi packs. I mean, some people have said, well, "Why couldn't we put a sound chip in the SDC? That'd be perfect." Because then you don't even need a multi pack to get the sound chip. Unfortunately, too late now. Uh, as as it currently stands, Darren Atkinson does not want the design to change. He wants it to stay the same. Um, even though he'll let other people manufacture it, you're not allowed to modify the design, at least at this point. So um, that's not an option at this point. But uh, they were going through a lot of different hardware. I mean, Nick, you want to talk about a few of the things that were discussed here, but. Uh, it's a pretty fascinating read to go through it. It's going through like you know, you know the, the hardware part of it, the programming part of it. You know what is what would have to be a, like a, a, a low level of sales to make some game developers even consider taking the extra time to code for it, et cetera, versus just the built-in DAC. Any, any comments on that, Nick, from your perspective? Well, I think most of my comments were that well, I stick to the DAC because that's available in every Coco, so. You know, I, I prefer to do that. But if we needed a sound chip, since we've missed the boat with the uh, SDC, which would have been the ideal place to have it, um, the only thing I think I mentioned in that, in one of my comments there is, we've got so many Coco 3s, and I guess Coco 1s and 2s would be the same, that have had the CPU socketed because they wanted to put a 6309 in. Um, so with so many of those now, Coco 3 is with a socketed CPU now, why not just make a board like the like the memory uh, expansion? Yeah, the old DAT board. Like a DAT board, which is, you know, anyone who's got more than 512K has got a DAT board there. What about a new DAT board that has the DAT board plus a sound chip like the GMC one? They don't take up too much interfacing to added on there and you've got the entire 6809 bus there available 
Yeah, which you, you don't access. on the cartridge port. No, no. So maybe another DAT board with the sound chip on there as well. I mean, there is room in the uh, Coco to have a slightly larger DAT board. Yep. Of course, anyone who has a or is going to get a Gimme X won't need that DAT board. So just have a, a – stu- you can still have – a dead dat board, say that's only got the sound chip on there. That doesn't matter. Well, you don't have to hook up the uh, the, the the dat part of it anyway, but and use the sound chip. And while you're there, throw in a real time clock. Obviously, that's more important than the sound chip. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> now, now with all these add-ons on top of the CPU, are we going to need a shim like we need with an MC10 to put a Coco VGA in it? Well, you wouldn't need a Coco VGA on a Coco Three anyway. Well, no, but you've seen the, the MC10 where you can't fit it in there. But um, yeah, he's he, right. what, what Jason's talking about, Nick, is, is stacking things up on top of each other, like kind of uh, going up the back yeah. end well, of I'm, a ZX81. Uh, yeah, I'm talking about getting adding, like, rid of it yeah. so there's only the one board. So if you have a Coco 3 that has a, a DAT board, well, this would be a new DAT board. So you don't keep stacking them up. Mind you, there is more room in a Coco 3 to do that stacking up anyway. But, yeah, I would do a, a whole new DAT board with the sound chip and uh, hopefully a real-time clock. Cool. No, it's a, it was a very interesting discussion. That, that was I my did. idea. So, yeah, I don't know what other people suggested. But I think Barry <laughs> Nelson <laughs> – well, mine's the only right one. That's so, that special um, Nick myopic view. That's it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Take confusion out. Just erase everyone else's. Um <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I would recommend people go read that. I mean, even if you're not a hardware software developer, it's kind of interesting seeing what the pros and cons of each different approach is. And, you know, why, why have we not seen one really take off yet? So uh, the big problem it, is that then who's going to write the software to support yeah. that sound chip or yeah. any of the sound chips? That's, that's why we haven't got much support for any you know, much in the way of sound chips. Look yeah. at the Tandy... Uh, yeah handy sound and speech pack that's been around for 40 years how many games use that yeah not like really a couple dozen yet. and how many used it fully not many at all yeah so if they couldn't get it right in 40 years i don't think much that they're going to do anything with the multitude of standards that are out there now yeah which as, as you why, mentioned before if it had been in the sdc that would have been perfect that would have been the best place which is why my comment was i'll support the most common sound system the DAC which you can do some pretty good things I mean it's harder and uh, you know you, you do use up a bit of CPU time but that's just part of the the challenge of writing good routines or efficient routines and I think I've put a demo there of my um, pipes game showing the music I generated in that um, yeah. it sounds like a PSG so so you might make some room if you were a Orc 90 and speech sound pack and whatever whiz bang new thing you had compatible all in one card thing. Oh, don't forget well, about MIDI. Yeah, I, at I, a reasonable price. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah well, the, we, we've, we've discussed this topic several times before. So many years, times. So, yeah, yeah. It, it goes nowhere. It just <laughs> keeps going in circles. <laughs> now, Bill, since you're actually on here, I'll bring up your story again here too. If you want to do a quick talk about the teensy and, and where you're going with this well okay already some of you know about the teensy uh but the 4.1 has added quite a lot of extra hardware inside the actual unit itself uh like you, you can see in the picture here uh i've got the ethernet attachment for it uh which is full ethernet no serial like the WizNet uh that Rick is, or Pat's doing. Uh, this is direct. And of course, the SD controller. Uh, it also has eight serial ports built into it, a uh, real time clock. Uh, Ooh. Oh, yeah. And, and uh, the actual TC itself, you'll find are used in a lot of audio applications, uh, which is MIDI controllers, uh, synthesizers, all kinds of things. And it actually has a full 16 channel uh, 
SP or digital audio out for full stereo in multiple channels. So you can have like five channels of stereo being produced for audio. Like this thing is just phenomenal. Also, uh, it actually has added the option now uh, for adding extra RAM. Uh, in my case here on this one, I've added two extra PS RAM chips, which will, gives me a total of 16 meg of RAM on the CPU itself, which is all directly ad ad addressable. Where is it? The, uh, the RAM itself? Yeah. Uh, is actually on the back of this unit. Oh. Yeah, it's actually uh, soldered to the back of the unit. They're very tiny chips. It's only a six pin chip uh, for each of the actual RAM upgrades. As I recall, they use SPI to interface to them. Yes. What, like, what size uh, AC adapter do you have to have for this thing? Uh, it's oh, actually a normal uh, standard five volt wall wart. Uh, it's directly powered by USB or you can go external power supply, which you can see on the top right of the board here. I've got an actual little power supply board there, uh, but USB works just fine on its own. Oh, and one other thing that the TNC has now added is a USB host. So you can actually connect numerous USB devices. There's already drivers for keyboards, mice, joysticks, all kinds of different USB devices are already handled. <laughs> How much did this one cost you? Because I don't know what the cost is. The actual total of what you see on screen there, including the LCD, the Ethernet adapter, the PS RAM, and that power supply unit, uh, the, the actual total was just shy of $80. Oh, wow. That's pretty cheap. Yeah. And that's uh, for Canadian. And that's Canadian, yes. Oh, so wow. it's like, like five bucks. Yeah, uh, the actual Teensy <laughs> itself, the Teensy by itself without the PS RAM uh, was twenty nine ninety five, I believe it was. No, that is cheap. That, that is cheaper than a Pi too, isn't it? Yes. It actually yeah. is a little bit cheaper than a Pi. And it's actually running uh, basically the same ARM processor as the uh, Pi 400. So what's the language you use to program it? It's actually C. Full C++. C, so it's Spanish. Yeah. <laughs> C, senor. C, yeah. It's so, an ARM Cortex M7, so yeah, you can do Yeah, it's C a Cortex plus. M7. And uh, the beauty about it is the RAM that's built into the unit, uh, it is one mega RAM built in minus the extra RAM. Uh, and the actual RAM is what they call tightly coupled. So it splits the RAM into two 512K banks and the compiler itself will actually uh, sort out your actual data variables and actually take your most commonly used ones and put them into the lowest part of memory so that there is a very fast access. And plus uh, the ARM Cortex has branch predictions uh, built into it with, on two different pipelines. Uh, like it's literally split. Like uh, I used to have a Pi 3.6 and that one was only running at about 60 megahertz. This one is actually running at 600 megahertz. <laughs> wow. And for 29 bucks. For $29, yeah. On the screen there, it says 6309 emulator. So can that run an emulation of a CPU, can it? Yes. It's actually running the actual CPU already. I'm just adding all the extra hardware features into it now. And okay. you base it on the VCC uh, 639 core, right? Yes. Which is the same one as the main one, I think. Yeah, it, it's the same one. That, uh, yeah, it's a common, Walter, yeah, it's a common uh, CPU yeah. core that's in MAME, VCC, and I believe XWAR is even using it now. Uh, like it's a very common CPU core. Which brings, brings me to the next brilliant idea. So oh, if that God, can emulate a CPU, what about having it, designing it for a Coco, uh, Coco 3, say, or even 1 and 2, I guess. Uh, so it emulates the CPU. You take out the 6309 and you plug this with an adaption board, of course. So it is the 6309. And then it, 
it you is got... possible uh, with le uh, level shifters built in because the Teensy itself is strictly 3.3 volt. Oh, okay. It, it uh, will not like five volts. You put a five volt unit on there and kiss your Teensy goodbye. <laughs> okay. Well, but if it's it possible, is possible, it is okay. possible with level shifters. Because then you could put a, well, a 6309 on there. Uh, but also, you said it's got sound. It's got USB. You just solved the next got, problem we were just talking about. Yeah. Yeah, so, it's got it all. It's yeah. So it, that's why I wanted to actually jump on when I heard yeah. about Nick talking about that. And I'm going, well, that's right. I mean, this thing yeah, has you, got it. <laughs> you saw it was a brilliant idea. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I thought, well, here I am talking about replace making a new DAT board to put under the CPU. Now you brought this on. Why don't we just take the CPU out and put, put this, this instead? Instead, so it, it is. Nick, you mentioned this is like sixteen channel stereo sound, and well, oh, yeah, yeah that's right. And, and a real time and, clock. And I mean, USB, what else do you need in life? And right? a real time clock, and yeah. whatever else you can squeeze into it as well. Oh, it, it's, and it's all, so small. It's all kinds. It's it's like I'm I'm just scratching the surface on the hardware that it actually has built into the unit. It's still all right. not going to yeah, be cool. my uh, high color correctly though. Uh, well, I haven't actually implemented the graphics yet because the LCD that I'm using here on the actual prototype is only a 320 by 240 uh, full 24 bit color. Yeah, so I should but be able to do a high color once the software algorithm works. Yeah, yeah. BCC doesn't interpret it properly. No, it, uh, I have not actually taken the BCC core for the graphics portion, but I do have the MMU. Like I actually have the, the Coco 3's MMU built into this unit. So uh, you can actually do the full addressable right from 128K right up to 8 meg. Cool. Well, thanks for hopping on there. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I had no idea you're even working on this. So. I've been uh, tossing this around uh, for the last few years, uh, ever since I got my first Teensy, which was uh, the 3.6. And I've always not carried it forward because the TNC 3.6 only had 512K in memory. So I was Only. keeping it kind of minimal. But since the 4.1 came out, I added two uh, 8 meg RAM chips right off the hop. And now I can do the full 128 right till 8 meg. Cool. Well, keep, it, keep us posted on this as, as you progress on yeah. it. Maybe even you know, come on for a live demo of it at some point. Yeah, yeah, I actually, have it ready uh, for next week. Since I actually posted this, uh, Bill Pierce and EJ has already been in contact with me. They want to get all of the SD controller that I'm, I've actually recoded. So they yeah, because they can put that into, into a VCC it, then as exactly, well. Exactly. And, and make yeah. it Coco SDC compatible. Yeah, and plus I found a few hidden features in VCC. Yeah, you mentioned uh, the one little bit setting that you can actually have it one at quad, quad, quad speed. Yes, and actually, you could, uh, uh, Bill and I discovered last night that you could even go higher. Like, uh, we both had our VCCs running. The CPU clock itself was running at five, 400 and some megahertz in VCC itself. Yeah, because right now you can use the VCC menu to overclock it, but you can't control it from the Cocoa itself. And then this way you can't. Yes, you, but it actually uses that overclock in the configuration settings. So when you do your configuration settings, set your CPU overclocking, and then you have this extra bit, which adds a multiplier into that. So it'll actually multiply the, the CPU rate that you have in the config menu and double that. So you're not okay. gonna smell any smoke coming out of this thing, are you? Nope, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> not not, only, not nearly hooks up to five volts. <laughs> or you do it three times in a row but the nice thing about it is like i'm uh there's 32 dma channels built into this thing too and i haven't actually touched the dma channels yet so that the actual ram oh you could put like this, a blitter and stuff in here too then this yeah. thing can actually uh outperform uh vcc itself I'm, uh, by the time i'm done oh definitely because i'm closer. actually taking <laughs> all of the OS9 windowing commands, which are all escape code sequences. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually 
embedding them into the actual emulator itself. So the emulator handles all the windowing functions instead Sweet. of the actual. So basically in Nitrous 9, GraphDriv disappears. It's yeah, gone. it just becomes just straight calls to the chip. Yep. So this is going to be a $700 item down the road, right? <laughs> uh, well, right now it's under GNU public license, so. But you because, can have it for four yeah. easy payments of $20. Yeah. 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 Because actually Joseph has actually got uh, built the, the VCC core in GNU public license, so I can't actually really sell it. It's yeah, it's kind of like Nitrous Nine itself, where we're with you yeah. because of the deal with Micro, we can't either. And I wouldn't want to either. I want to share that, you know, because one of the bragging points of running Nitrous Nine in the first place is to show that an eight-bit machine could do all this multitasking and windowing and stuff too, which most of them didn't. Yes. So, what is the screen output? Is it? Uh, what is it's it? not your standard VGA or HDMI or anything like that. This is uh, uh, through SPI which is a special serial protocol used on many uh, devices. So it's 80 by 24? Uh, well, three, it's in pixel form. It's 320 pixels across by 240 pixels down for this particular LCD. No. But uh, I have actually, uh, in the last few days, found uh, somebody on the internet that has actually got a VGA controller for the TNC 4.1. Okay. So it actually will produce a VGA signal internally on the TNC. Cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah, then, that he, is. then he just hook it to a regular monitor then. Yep, oh, straight standard VGA out. Cool. Definitely keep us posted on that uh, once you get some updates or if you want to come in and actually do a demo of the one you have. Once you get up to a point uh, well, that the, you're comfortable with it. What I have right now, it, uh, for demoing wise, uh, the actual ROM core code that I have in there, uh, it just does basic one one time commands, like I'm checking keyboard or I'm checking display or that type of thing. I don't actually have a functional ROM yet. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm imagining it's a little bit ways off. Like this is early days, but yeah, when you get to the point where you, you hit a milestone, come on, come on and show it off. Yeah, because the actual ROM layout that I have decided on is the standard 32K ROM right on power up. And then you can, of course, switch that off into all RAM mode and go your merry way beyond that. Cool. Cool. Well, thanks for stopping by, Bill, and, and giving us an update on that. Yeah, I, I wasn't actually expecting to make any... Get roped in. <laughs> yeah, roped into it, but... <laughs> I just happened to be listening and I almost, well, oh, Kurt's actually saying, <laughs> producing that. <laughs> You're actually listening? Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, keep us posted on that and I'll continue on with the, the last few stories here. Yeah, go. Yeah. Yeah, interesting gizmo. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, turning out quite nice. Huh? So next up here, this, this came out a little late for Christmas, unfortunately, but Jamie Cho is also the author of the Space Invaders style game that was done with the Dynasprite uh, library. Uh, uploaded this uh, video and he's also uploaded uh, the actual disc image you're gonna grab it, but it's a Coco 3 Christmas card type thing of Coco 3 graphics and some music being played in the background. Um, so I'll play a little bit of it. Unfortunately, I think that if I remember correctly on this one, the, the audio is really, really low. So I don't know if you're able to hear the music or not, but I'll, I'll play enough of it. You can just kind of get an idea. Yeah, it's really, really quiet. Is there a collection of these type of things? I mean, are there more than these type of things? Because I would love to be able to run these just sort of in the background while I'm doing other things. Demo there there are some. Um, yeah, there are. Yeah, there's a Coco one and two, and I remember it was a whole disc of, of Christmas carols, which would just load in like a static graphic in between songs. And then do different ones. Uh, right. Like, are, know, is, that, is that available in the archive? Does anybody know? Uh, there are a few on the archive. I know I've got a few here buried in my disc collection that are not on the archive yet because there's a ton of stuff I haven't had a chance to put up in the archive, but there's, there's definitely some. And Ron DeVoe, you probably have quite a few of them, I'm guessing. Well, Roger Taylor made a um, like a fireplace that runs and plays music. You know, you know, Is that one on the archive too then, Ron? Or? 
think so. I, I'm not sure. But there is the if, if, if you find just, it, Ron, or to give me the name of it anyway, what the disk image is called, and, and send it to me, and maybe I'll, I'll grab it and send it up to both. It just so happens I looked myself um, a couple weeks ago, and there's uh, at least well, there's a whole bunch of stuff on the uh, on the SDC that I found. Um, oh, I was looking around on the SDC. I must have not been looking in the right place or at the right yeah, files. Um, well, yeah, yeah, I just didn't get far enough down the list. That was probably it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I I think I have a copy of the SDC archive on this on this laptop. Let me take a look here. Are you talking about music only or a demo as like this? I, a demo, I guess it would be a demo. It would be graphics and a little uh, yeah. tune playing. Well, in there's there. the yeah. official Tandy ones. Tandy had a Christmas demo back That's right. Back in the day. Yeah, 48 okay. KRAM did a stream where he showed it here not too long ago. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a look. I'll be back in a sec. And just fire it off in the chat when you find it, Fred, and then uh, both yeah, grab yeah, it. Yeah, well. So apparently he did that actually years ago and he just kind of found it again and then and, and put it up for uh, download and as the actual video demo there. So thanks, Jamie. Next up, this is a German site, a retro guy on YouTube. And uh, so the, the actual talking is in German, but he's actually got captions in English. So you can kind of follow along. So this is a joystick adapter for the uh, Coco and the Dragon. Um, you know, what we were talking about earlier during the game on challenge part here. So he shows a couple of sample joysticks, including the actual original 2600 style you can see there. And links the standard Atari joystick with the new pin anschlüssen on a dafür. And he talks about the differences between connectors. And then I won't play the whole thing here um, just because we're running a bit long, but uh, he actually goes into what parts are needed to build it, et cetera, type thing. So for those of you that have not gotten an adapter or want to try to build your own here, this is a pretty good uh, tutorial on it as well as, you know, very good photography of what you need to do. So. Sure, this is great in the audio version. <laughs> well, can you guys hear the German speak? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Krankenwagen. <laughs> so yeah, that's pretty cool because it's not a channel I've heard of before, and uh, you know, doing a hardware project uh, for gamers in particular, right off the bat, is kind of cool. Well, imagine being in German doesn't come up to the top of your list. <laughs> yeah, probably not. Oh, Germany apparently did have a pretty good dragon scene, from what I've heard, at least for the Dragon Thirty Two era. I don't know about the Dragon Sixty Four. Uh, next up, uh, we've got another follow-up from Alan Huffman. He's been doing all these basic videos on manipulating bits. Uh, they're being able to read them or order them in. Uh, last one he did was on shifting them left and right. And in this case, he gets into some basic code for actually rotating them through like the rotate command does. Now, obviously, it's a bit slower doing it in basic, but it's good for prototyping stuff if you don't have to you know, fire up the assembler type thing. So it's, it's a good part of his uh, tutorials on manipulating bits in basic. So that's the latest episode. And next up, one, of course, you're dear and near to my heart. Uh, Ken Waters put up one on uh, using Basic 9. So this is a start of a series he's going to be doing. And hopefully he'll allow me to pop on and help him out with a few of them. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to play the whole video here, though. I should force it on Nick Morenis just to be cruel. Um, <laughs> We've got a guy now. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, one thing I wanted to point out, that the ability to call external programs from within Basic 9 very easily and also some of the winning stuff that built in. So I wanted to show this particular little demo here because you can see the code on the screen here while I have it frozen, where he's just, you know, basically he's printing, this is a sound and then playing an actual WAV file uh, in a loop three times and uh, how easy, like it's four lines of code and that's all you need to do, so. So here is our program. And that took me all of what? 10 seconds, 30, 15 seconds. If I could type faster, it would take me about five seconds to write. So there we go and It is simple as that to put sound effects into your basic games with Basic 09. And then you go into stuff like covering like little overlay windows and changing fonts and you know that kind of stuff too. But what if you don't have the, what if you don't have carhorn.wav? How do you make the car horn then? It's right in uh, Nitrous 09. Um, yeah, it's it's right on the ease of use. So we get a whole yeah, bunch the, of sound samples. Yeah, yeah. and you can there. put in any uh, wave. Wave file or uh, what all does it play? 
8 SVX, files. which is the Amiga file format, the old yeah. uh, 8-bit or the old 16-bit uh, Macintosh format, um, AU files from SunOS, was it? I can't remember. One of the Unix systems. Alan, or some of the Unix gurus here can probably tell me what that one is. Right. So yeah, you just have to stick the file right somewhere onto your uh, hard drive and then uh, just point at it when you want to play it for from basic 09. Yeah. Another so nice option, which... The- Okay. The shell command there is allowing yeah. you to run a, a, a an operating system command directly from BASIC. Yeah. Yeah. Without destroying right. BASIC because it actually runs totally separate, right. separately. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it gets its its whole environmental world there to run your music without interrupting your BASIC program one bit. Yeah. And the nice thing with the play command in particular here is if you put a dash O as a command line option within that shell command, you can actually have it play through your orchestra 90 in stereo if your WAV file scored stereo. It was, it's really nice because we went through and did some very small, very easy programs of like a screen size listing at the biggest. But he's showing off, like I said, some font changes and changing the graphics mode on the screen, uh, doing overlay windows that restore the uh, contents underneath when you when you pull it back off, and then also you know forking out something like this. And you don't have to fork out simple utilities. You can fork out entire environments. You can fork a C compiler. You can fork the assembler. You can fork uh, G shell if you wanted to, though that probably wouldn't run too well. Um, just a ton of things. It was just kind of, we like I did talk to Ken a little bit about this before we recorded it. And it was trying to show some pretty cool stuff you can do that doesn't take much programming at all. You don't have to do any complex, you know, type declarations or anything weird system call type of stuff here, but just very easy if you want to have a, Sound effects in the game, it's it's a perfect opportunity. There's a bunch of web files included you can use for some sound effects. You can create your own on your Windows machine, your Mac, or whatever, your Linux box, and just throw them onto the EOU or onto a floppy image if it fits, and you can run them straight off that as well. So, so just showing some of the power in Base 9. And yeah, that's definitely going to become a full-blown series. We're going to be getting into all kinds of stuff. Um, we're going to try to eventually, hopefully, do some interactive ones where you kind of do a live stream, kind of like Sleepy's doing with the game on Challenge where people have questions they can fire up or they can fire up along with us an emulator on real hardware and try out the same examples we're doing live. So we'll try to try to make it as interactive as possible. As well. Interactive 10 liner um, show where you spend, you write little 10 line basic programs and you have it interactive as a, you know, as, as the show, you explain it on the show. Yeah. Yeah. That type of thing. And of course, yeah, I'm, I'm sure Ken will do some tutorial type ones too, just to go through. Tutorial. Like one thing I'll mention, Ken, you probably I forgot to tell you is that you can do the shortcut for print the question mark, same as Microsoft Basic. Okay. So if you don't want to have to type in the word print every time you want to do a print, you can just put question mark, just like huh. you can. I hadn't tried that yet, but hey, over I'm sure the, I would have messed up and done it at some point. <laughs> over in the chat, uh, J.E. Jones asked a question. Um, so when that play command is executing is basic waiting for that shell to finish yes okay especially so with that... the play command because the play command shuts interrupts down so that the sound plays smooth <laughs> so if you so it... uh did it with the uh, ampersand after after the command uh will basic continue on while the uh, shell is still playing separately Te- technically yes but because the the play command actually like as i said it shuts interrupts down to keep the the sound smooth without it jittering like crazy because of the you know v-sync interrupts and all the stuff that nitrous nine does in between Sinks. Um, mm. It will technically do it, but it will still pause the machine while it's playing the sound. Now, there's some other utilities you could run to do other things that you don't have to pause the machine for. That yes, it would run in the background, and the base nine program will continue to run. So, okay. yes and no, depending on what you're doing. And the play command specifically, <laughs> no, not really. If you had a sound chip, though, yes, it would. Yeah. Back to your sound chip, Nick. <laughs> Always about Nick. Right, Nick in his right, trash can. Right. <laughs> oh, so this, this one, I wasn't cool. quite sure to put this in the Scripts regular it. news. <laughs> in the regular news or in the game on news, but because this is more the development stage, I thought I'd put it in the regular news. So Robert Sieg has been working on designing some <laughs> graphics to do a chess game on the MC10. So he's using a utility he talked about before, and I think we mentioned it on the MC10 special which was originally designed to do the Game Boy. And it's a tile map maker for the Game Boy. So he's got this set up as a four color mode, 80 by 80 pixels, decided to try to design within those limitations a, a chess board with actual chess pieces that are at least semi-recognizable in P mode one, which is 128 by 96 by four color. 
So this was his first little draft. And it's pretty recognizable. You can tell whether a rook's a rook and you know bishop's a bishop, etc. The knight okay. looks good. You can recognize a knight. Yeah, some people are commenting it looked like a dog or something, but uh, <laughs> close enough. Dinosaur. It's a four-legged Long animal, so it has to be a knight. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then he did a kind of a, a later mock up here where he actually expands on it a bit, where he's expanding, like he puts a little border on and he's got some, you know, levels of thinking, et cetera, here and uh, the placement of the pieces, et cetera, here. So this is more getting to the native res of the MC10 itself, going beyond the 80 by 80 of the original tile editor he did, which is what the Game Boy's original res was. So this is actually looking pretty good. And you get some people, James Diffendaff and a few others have offered to actually help write the code to actually do the actual thinking part of the chess game. And uh, Robert's more concentrating on the graphics presentation. So that'll actually make a really good chess game for the, the MC10 once it's released. And good to see yeah. some collaboration between members of the community. You know, I have to go back to the night for just one second. It's actually brilliant to change the graphic like that. A knight is never represented, not standing. But it gets the idea across and it doesn't have to be explained to you. Yeah. It, it just, it works. Yeah, no, it's it's very well done considering, I mean, what's the extra size of a square? One, two, three, four, five. Right. You, five. You, couldn't, you couldn't do a traditional standing knight statue thing in that space. It just... Yeah, because these pieces are all basically six by six pixels. That's what he's working with. That's pretty darn good design for that that low resolution. A bit busy with that border, though. Well, I think he kind of just threw that as a placeholder. Like maybe he's going to yeah. reserve that for some comments or something that as the game's playing. Because the A through H and one through eight is for placing your pieces, obviously. You know, there's no joystick to do it on the MC10. So yeah. you have to punch them in the old style way. And that's it for the news. That's the way they do chess games anyway. All chess games are recorded on a coordinate system, so you know which player moved where. Right, right. So for the evil old days where you had KQ or, you know, KR3 and crap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a few Coco ones like that, for sure. I got something to share. Okay. Are you ready to do project updates acquisitions, or did we want to yeah. run? Do you have any more commercial break to do? Uh, uh i've got more commercials but i think we've uh, covered all the promos we needed to run okay so you want to go straight into project updates and acquisitions then or yeah we can yeah okay well ron you volunteered first so take it away let me know if you see it yeah okay um first i want to go down to um you know, I, I show a lot of junk because, you know, I got nothing to do. So <laughs> this is uh, the Rainbow in 86 when it first came out. And um, it had a, uh, it had a uh, thing on the Coco, which is neat to read because it first just came out. Yeah, the original announcement of the Coco 3. Yeah. That My my copy is so worn because I read that so many times waiting for the actual computer to Right yeah, stores. This, this uh, cover was all screwed up. I had to fix it. It, it looked, it was all twisted and everything. Anyway, and then uh, I did some uh, high screen color stuff. And then um, Alfredo did this. Awesome. What yeah, hot cocoa with hot cocoa in a, in a cocoa yeah. coffee mug. Pretty cool. And uh, that's the cover of a, a box when you get a new color computer three. And I cleaned it up a little bit so from one I had. It was interesting. And then there's this uh, ad showing uh, an astronaut on the MM1. And it said, for the first time, a community is handed, banded together to design the next computer, a revolutionary new computer conceived by you, the MM1. Uh, Pretty neat ad. Yeah, I they, remember they, that ad. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that, that, was, that was huge because this is the first Coco 4 announced. Yeah. The TC9 and the TC70 were the other other two, and the System 4, System 5. But this was the first one announced, and, and Paul Ward went all out on this. I mean, he did full-page ads. and Yeah, it is. It's two two pages. It's a gatefold, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then uh, let's see what else did I want to show. Oh, I did a, um, a, a redo on uh, my Disto controller because it, it, it was all screwed up and looked bad, and I figured I'd do it and make it look new, and there it is, all new. 
So if somebody wants, uh, I, I posted in the uh, file section, um, you can print it out and cut it out and stick it on your controller if you lost yours. And then after I did all that, I took, say I took a picture of the controller and then did the artwork over it. And then um, later on, I went and looked and then the um, archive was uh, Disto controller <laughs> artwork, which is exactly the same as I'm <laughs> controller. <laughs> I probably could have used that instead, but oh well. And what else? Um, and <laughs> Back in 78, my computer was this uh, typewriter here. <laughs> and that's your entire telescope collection in the corner there. Yeah, back then. Back yeah. then. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, this is cool. Did you see this? Yeah, that's kind uh -huh. of a 3D rendering engine, you know, playing with the AGI drivers from the old, you know, Sierra games. Pretty neat. I, th I saw that and I thought, wow. Police I quest. thought that was Leisure Suit Larry. Right. Police <laughs> quest. That looks way cool. Holy cow. Yeah. I, I put Nick. What do you think? Yeah, it looks good. There's like parallax and perspective going on there. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. I got sure, sure. Surely yeah, that's not on the fly, is it? That it's doing that? Yeah, it's not running on a cocoa. <laughs> no, no, definitely not. <laughs> Darn. <laughs> <laughs> Could we do that, though? Ah, uh, yeah, be a bit oh, slower. Yeah. And that eight <laughs> core is three point eight gigahertz, sixty three oh nine. Might be able to run on the Teensy four point one, maybe. But that's what I was going to say. All right, and then um, I just discovered uh, one of my boxes for my uh, MC ten had this cut out, right? And then I, it hit me that I had this TV years ago when I first got the, my first, very first computer was this one. And I actually cut out the um, logo for Tandy and put it on the TV here over the um, <laughs> <laughs> logo for the Zenith TV. Cause I was looking at the pictures and I was thinking to myself, okay, I didn't have a Radio Shack TV, right? So, and then it hit me, that's what I did. I remember that. That's so, not much worse than Tandy did on the Model 1. Yeah, I guess so. Right. Yep. And That's Ron, always that. with those high-tech solutions. <laughs> yeah. Thinking of which. It's fixed exactly. man. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. Well, they did that. that with this monitor. Look at this monitor. It's wood grain. I've yeah, some were, some were. Yeah. Right. I don't know if the sides were wood grain, but the top was. No, they weren't. No, the top was. And and even the ones that weren't wood grain still had the bronze underlay from the wood grain on right. top, and the grain of the wood grain in the plastic. So you could. Yeah. Have... <laughs> so, and I, I was trying to get um, somebody to um, tell me why I couldn't have uh, uh, deskmate on uh, EOU, and uh, I had uh, some help. <laughs> That's all I'll say. Then the real reason Radio Shack. Uh, uh, went to um, doing crypto or whatever. I explained that somewhere here. I think it might be here, which is a bit weird, isn't it? And then here's that um, Christmas is that the Radio Shack Christmas, Christmas demo, demo yeah. that we're yeah, talking about. Yep. And I did uh, 2022 graphic, which came out pretty neat. Try to catch things mm. that were interesting. And then I had I dug out this old uh, monitor. It's a VM2. It just does uh, composite, period, green. Green. It's like brand new. Look at the picture. It's really nice on it. And um, I have the Magnavox equivalent of that monitor. Yeah. There's, uh, what's his name? <laughs> Madden when he died. Yeah. It came out pretty good. So on that composite green monitor, when you boot yeah, up yeah. A, a Coco, you can't really tell any difference at first. No, right? no that's right. <laughs> Yeah. It's pretty good quality, you know, yeah. for the the res. And it's it's freaking old, old monitor. But anyways, what else was I gonna show? Um yeah, uh Sonic on the Coco. <laughs> yeah, so Ron, when's the release date on that? Because a lot of people were asking. <laughs> yeah, they were. <laughs> what I had to do is it wouldn't fit. Um I had to take and put uh this uh Sega here because it was down below 
so it would fit. But you know, it doesn't look colors are washed out. Anyway, look at that car. Ah, Pac-Man car. Yeah. <laughs> Neat graphics. And then I didn't think you were that big fan of Pac-Man. If the car turns blue, are you supposed to run into it? Yeah. <laughs> look at this old man. Get off my lawn. Oh, I thought like, that was you, Ron. Who is that? No, it kind of looks like my dad more than me. <laughs> Uh, figured that'd be a Santa. 1986. Guess what came out? Christmas vacation. And, yes. Yeah, but you think he could have any power left over to actually power up the cocoa? Because <laughs> what are you putting it all on his house? Yeah. Yeah, all the lights. It was terrible. All right, that's it, guys. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ron. That's cool stuff, yeah. Ron. Yeah, something to do. Anybody else have any project updates or acquisitions they want to throw out there? Yeah, just my plea for sympathy for the week. So there was that game that we were looking for. Um, I wrote a game a while back. And, oh, the risk, risk. Talking. And yeah, yeah you, you found a copy of it that was kind of broken. And I found a bunch of broken copies and I didn't find a good copy. I did find my old notes, you know, so I've got the quaint drawings and all of that kind of stuff. And very unfortunately, I also have the dot matrix listing of Stop the version project. of the program that we're looking for. Oh, so no. I have to I have to take my broken version and the dot matrix version and do a very old fashioned file compare. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, so the, the, the final one I only have in a dot matrix print and the early one I only have on online so uh yeah but that's a cool fun that ocr the dot matrix probably will not ocr well enough yeah i've not had great right. luck with ocr and dot matrix either you have to and end this, up correcting it so much you might as well have just typed it in again right and this is a dmp 105 so you know, nothing can not, interpret that we're, we're not going with the best in it. Yeah. no, no I, 24 I mean, pin there unfortunately I don't have the notes of what I changed. I'm sure it's, you know, five lines got changed to fix all the bugs. Which five where? You know? <laughs> so anyway, that's that's my that's my fun. This was supposed to be an easy little project. Go find a file, write up <laughs> a little doc, send it Famous off. Last words. <laughs> right. Anyway, no, it's Next. cool. You found that anyway. When I mean, we can hopefully get that game fixed up and, and yeah, it was it on. was pretty cool. I mean, because the the whole thing was the Risk board game is like so long to play, and there's so much crap laid out. And you know, this was just a, okay. We can save this and come back to it later. I'm I'm saying there's a computer back there on your stand. Oh no, I'm I'm. Working on <laughs> my life's in shambles right now. I've got about eight. <laughs> I've got about eight projects that are all almost done. So <laughs> I'll take your eight and raise you to ten. <laughs> oh, geez, yeah. Do you have a family life? I mean, are you married? Do you do stuff? You know, outside of the stay-at-home COVID stuff. Yeah, I've got the occasional outside entanglement but uh, <laughs> but uh yeah mainly it's it's try to make a living in a you know i i i was i was making my money reselling crap back when you could just go to find stuff all over there was estate sales there was antiques it was a great way to be not working in an office i just go drive around and find crap and sell it you know and, yeah basically okay and and uh, that's not such a good thing to be doing anymore. So, <laughs> people aren't buying much or what? Well, there's nothing to buy. I mean, I, I, yeah, the part shortages and everything else. We've got well, yeah, I can't make stuff because of the part shortages, and I can't resell stuff because nobody's having estate sales and crap. They're just throwing it all in storage somewhere, and we'll deal with it later when this is all over. And so, Oh, so you can't get product to put up. Is what yeah, saying. not I can't make product and I can't find product, which makes it kind of hard to sell stuff. So. It's, it's a st it, the problem is it's a stuff shortage. Yeah, there's there's a stuff shortage in the U.S. right now. Until Brian Weezer. 
<laughs> <laughs> so maybe I thought at first when you didn't have a computer up there that you started selling stuff like that. Well, no, I'm, 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 I mean, here's my life now. Okay, so here's, here's the debug board. We have a problem with the, the cocoa network thing on some cocos, and so I've got to figure out what that is all about. And you know, okay, that's that's a man day, and uh, you know. <laughs> here's a man day in the at risk thing. And, uh, you know, there's a man day in eBay over there and, uh, oh, Jesus, it's Thursday. <laughs> 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 so, you know, such is life. At least I'm not getting bored. <laughs> That's how it is for me. Okay. Um, anything else? Any other um, projects? I, I do have a very quick update. I could show people what I've been working on uh, on the new version yes. of the control program. Control program that uh, I'm hoping to be ready for the next uh, revision of uh, EOU. Um, so, yeah, um, if I can share my screen real quick. Yes. All right. Uh, let's see here. I thought Curtis said EOU was done when he released uh, the police version. <laughs> garbage can. Okay, let's see here. Oh, there we That's go. Next department. Yeah. All right. Can can everyone see? Yeah. yeah it's a great All trash right. can. Yeah, that's a, yeah, it's beautiful trash can. I gotta say, um, <laughs> really <laughs> makes the whole blue and gray. experience really shine. In the, um, in okay, the trash. so let's see. So here we go. New version of control. So here, what I've done is I've created different tabs. Okay, um, I took all of the um, all of the settings that are in the environment file and kind of categorized them, sort of. And um, you know, some have to do with the display, some with the mouse, some with the keyboard, and so on. And so I grouped them together. And um, by selecting a tab, you can jump from, or you know, selecting one of these things on the left, you can jump from one tab to another, and uh, and you have the various settings that you can change over on the right. And so, yeah, so everything's kind of broken up and categorized. Um, yeah, the, the old, I like that. What's that? I like that. Much, yeah, it's yeah. much better. Yeah, it's, it's, it's much easier to get around and much better presentation than the original. Yeah, very slick. Yeah, the uh, the original. Well, I mean, the original one was fine. It's just that if you really want to have all of the settings and environment file in one program, you're not going to be able to display them all on one screen. So, Click on so that. hence the need to like break it up into categories and have different tabs. So, um, so yeah, plus yeah. in the original one, I mean, stuff like printer and R C two and stuff was actually totally separate programs. I mean, the yeah, that's right. I'm going to fold it into this. So, um, let me see printer. Oh uh, well, it doesn't quite work right now. What it what oh. it, what I well what it does is it runs the original version of printer. So if I click on printer, hold on, wait, I click on printer, this happens, boom. Okay. <laughs> yeah. right. So what the other um, one did, yeah, yeah, and and also that crashes the program, so I can't oh. get out of it now. So so that's something I still have to fix. Sorry. But anyway, work, work in progress. Yeah. Yeah, it's all work in progress. And so um, all I've done so far is kind of formatted the screen and enable you to jump from one tab to another. You can't actually change any of the settings yet. <laughs> so, so that's, of course, uh, next up on the list. But I'm still fiddling around with the format of uh, of the different screens uh, to make sure it's all optimal. And, and, um, and uh yeah. So, but uh, so far, so good. It I, this is about two weeks worth of work. So, Where, now yeah. did you change this so that it's instead of black and gray, it's blue and gray? Um, and the cursor is a different color. Why? Uh, well, I, I I can change, I can change the palette basically by using the older or older version of uh, of control. Oh, okay. Yeah. So what I did was I ran the original or not the original, but the older version of control, the previous version of control. And then change the colors, and then swapped in the new control I'm working on, <laughs> and then ran that. And so, yeah. So I have to Good. run the previous version of control in order to change the screen colors, which is easy to do. But 
Um, I don't have that functionality added to the new version yet. So, yeah. Looks good. Yep. It looks really good. Yeah, nice. Thanks. That's okay, it. So, so who's got the new features to creep in? <laughs> I have to try. They got a real time first. clock. Yeah. <laughs> I, if I if I start thinking about it, I'm sure I could start adding a lot more features to this. <laughs> it's oh, like yeah. never ending, really. Uh, it could go on uh, forever. Um, we're more than willing to help. <laughs> we have endless ideas. Operating <laughs> corner with a real, real time clock would go. What was that? Didn't hear that. Real time clock in the top right corner. Oh, <laughs> and you know, in the little bar I, there. I I've been thinking about that. You know, I'd probably put it in G be shell before I put it in control. But. I was yeah, I was just gonna say that. I was like, you could add it to G shell itself. Have a little uh, yeah. running time uh, and and date shell, in the upper right corner of G shell. That would and be there's, there's their corner clock utility in there right now that actually will do that on regular Windows. So yeah, I, I have it. I. I run it. I, I like it. Yeah. I was going to ask you about that, actually, if that could be somehow incorporated. Uh, yeah, I think I would change it because with G shell, you're actually moving most cursors and stuff around. So it's it's doing a fair bit of drawing when you're actively oh, using it. So yeah. I'd probably set it up to sleep and only update it once per minute as opposed to every second or something. Oh, OK. Just, just so it's not slowing the rest of the GUI down while. Yeah, you're... yeah. Yeah. You don't need to show the seconds ticking away. Yeah. You can just put the date in the in the hour and minute and that's it. I don't even know if I put the well the date. Maybe if you click it, it'll switch between date and time because that's a especially on the forty column screen. That's a lot of real estate to use up to draw all that. I mean, it wouldn't even fit right oh. now with the menu. Oh yeah, good point. Good point. That's cool. You guys can figure all that stuff out. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot of stuff you guys can figure out that I have no idea about. So we all have our specialties, I guess. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Drawing trash cans apparently is not mine from what Nick told me. So. <laughs> That's mine. <laughs> That's right. I'm the master of trash. <laughs> Your argument there, Nick. Have our skills. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, maybe you can draw the enclosure for the clock. <laughs> what I need to do is to put the number 80 on the trash can. Oh, trash. no. Trash. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, no, I no. agree. <laughs> now that we're getting Ken into the basic nine stuff, he'll start writing some of these things too. So, Nook, he ran away from me just mentioning that. Yeah. <laughs> I hate when people, uh, oh, you got a trash 80. No, I don't, actually. Well, you do, Ron. You but, saved uh, from the trash. <laughs> <laughs> See, for All me, right. trash 80 was always Z80, Z80. I mean, that's that's... If you're going to call that nickname, that's what it was based on. And we don't have that. So I never did call the. the well, we we did initially go. for the first yeah. two, three years. No, I, we it, just called it the color color computer here. Uh, I, I guess it depends on where you were, too. Yeah, but I mean, it was. And then still, ADC and 81, 82 was more common. And then it became Coco eventually in 82, I think. But it was a TRS 80. So it's still. There were still people saying, oh, you got a, a color trash 80. Well, yeah, sort of. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> All right. Yeah, ready we have for a lot of people. Go ahead. Right. Ready for the outro? Let's yeah, do some sure. more project updates or acquisitions that were. I, I do have just something real, real small. Uh, after uh, a while of having it not hooked up, the Coco is hooked up. So I actually, uh, I just I reconnected it and I used the, uh, the RGB uh, get go thing so i'm now i, I can play mm. coco again oh on good the real we thing not just again mistake. we don't have to keep hey. stunning you that's right that's right <laughs> and did i hear that correctly you nice, actually got nice. rgb hooked up not composite yeah not not composite it kills me it kills me but i must say that uh it, it does look pretty darn good running yeah. through rgb yeah, especially if you're playing Coco 3 games designed for it, it's way better than composite. Yeah. Coco 1 and 2, well, that's, that's a bit more depending. So don't forget to play some Pack Dude this week. Yeah, that's I will. definitely runs I, good I in am RGB. going to, for sure. That's all I got. Well, it's, it's Thanks, John. Boat. How much RAM? Uh, just the standard 128K. Ah, I need the upgrade. Still, I know. He hasn't oh. quite. You'll need Become the 512 to play master. Pack Dude. Oh, I'll have to do it through the mister. Actually, do you have 512? Because I saw you were running G Shell on it, and that requires 512. Oh, really? Well, maybe I do. Maybe I do. Next, next time oh. you boot up Nitrous 9, just type M free on one of the text windows and just see mm -hmm. what it tells you. Or okay. just try to load up Pack Dude, and if it runs, you've got 512. There yep. you go. There you too. go. <laughs>
It's like the Sailor look. Man 64K check. You could just look in the vents and see what's in there. That too. Mm. <laughs> uh, Bookie, extra stuff. If you haven't got the RAM, you're not a Jedi yet. No, you can't. <laughs> I got your Jedi, Nick. Oh, good God, David. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> okay. okay. Hey, pack new loads. So I must Marie, have 512. You 512 then. Yeah. Ah, good. You are a Jedi. <laughs> oh, wait. No, that, that's the original pack, dude. That's pack dude 3D <laughs> Monster Mage. You got to do. Oh, yeah, no. Pack, oh, no. Pack that that one that only takes 128. Have you got my game? Yeah, if you uh, have, I don't which know if it's one? on the SDC or not. <laughs> oh. He's still a Padawan. Yeah. Yeah. The don't, oh, don't call the trans codes will all be 512k too if you want to try a trans code like Joust or yeah. Pac-Man or Donkey Kong. Those are all 512 too. Back in the day we used to say uh, try Sailor Man and see if you have 64. Yeah. Yeah. Or WrestleManiac. I think that'd be 64. So Pack 2 Dude or Pack Dude 2 is the one I need to run, right? Yes. Correct. Okay. There it is. See if that works. It's on the loading screen and it says requires 512K and a joystick. And yes, just a moment, please. I've gotten this far. Will it go? Will it? Oh, yeah. I, I got to the title screen. Yeah. If you can start the game yeah, up, you got yeah. 512. Yeah. There we go. Mystery Look at you with half a mega ram. Yeah. Your journey to the dark side is complete. <laughs> <laughs> Might want to wipe, Nick. <laughs> Way to class it up, Dave. Look at how much more software you can play now. Yep. That opens uh, up pretty well everything Bart, at that point. Or just steal a line from Shrek. I'm a real boy now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here we go. This concludes another episode of Cobra Talk, the world's leading live talk show featuring the Tandy Color Computer, MC10, and Dragon Systems. For all things Cocoa Talk, visit us on the web at cocotalk.live. We'd love to hear from you. Send feedback, suggestions, even segments via email to cocotalk at cocotalk.live. Consider supporting the show with a purchase of merchandise from our retro swag shop at 8bit256.com. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, click on the Patreon link on our website, cocotalk.live. Coco Talk would not exist without the community, its cast, crew, and contributors. Thanks go to Alan Murphy, Amigos Retro Gaming, Bill Noble, Brian Joyce, Brian Weasler, Curtis Boyle, D. Bruce Moore, Danny O'Connor, David Ladd, Eric Canales, George Jansen, Grant Leedy, James Diffenbapper, Jason Reichert, Jim Brain, Ken Reichert, Ken Waters, Mark Bosley, Mark Overholzer, Mikey Furman, Mr. Dave6309, Nick Morentes, Nick Morota, Nick Morota, Nick Morota, Paul Fiscarelli, Richard Lorbieski, Rick Adams, Rick Ulin, Rob Inman, Ron Delvo, Samuel Gimes, Sloopy Malibu, Steve Bjork, Terry Steggy, Tom C., and many, many more. Please help support the Coco community. A list of various contributors and resources are available at imacoconut.com. That's I M A C O C O N U T.com. The original Coco Talk theme song is copyright 2008 by D. Bruce Moore and Greg Sheeler. The new Coco Talk theme song is copyright 2020 by D. Bruce Moore. Both are mixed, mastered, and produced by D. Bruce Moore. Coco forever! Hi, 
I'm Paul Thayer, one half of the Coco Brothers Software Company. I do that with my uh, my brother Tim as a hobby. I'm Doug Laney, and my brother and I had Nimbus Software years ago, a long time ago, back when computers were uh, hand cranked. Uh, and we're going to do uh, an interview at one o'clock Eastern on January fifteenth on Coco Talk. Well, my slacker brother, Tim, will be joining me that day to talk about some of the things that we've done and ask Doug and his brother, Kevin, some other questions about what they did in the past. It's my brother's at home right now, probably uh, on his cane, you know, sitting in his uh, recliner and, uh, you know, just trying to take it easy, work up enough strength to be here for next week. Yep. We'll see you all there live on Coco Talk. It'll be exciting, we promise. <laughs> and one more thing that I forgot to mention. None of this sleepy Nitrous 9 stuff going on with this group. Tim and I will be announcing a new game for the Color Computer 3. 128K runs in basic. See you then. Hi, this is Randy Kindig of the Poppy Days Podcast, the Antique Podcast, and other podcasts. I'll be live on Coco Talk on January 22nd, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you'd like to hear my interview and ask me some questions, be sure to tune in live. Pull out of any computer and compute as if it were yesterday. Okay, now we're, we're back in the caboose. Yep. So everybody come up for the next uh, couple of weeks for the interviews. Those are going to be fun ones. The brothers... Um, we haven't talked to, well, we've talked to Tim a little bit before. Uh, Kevin, we haven't actually talked to um, in, in person before. I've talked to him via email, but uh, the, the brothers have definitely rapport between the two brothers themselves and then the two pairs of brothers. I mean, Paul and Doug have actually met each other a couple times on Zoom test calls and stuff now over the last couple months, and they get along really well, too. So this is going to be a fun interview. It's just going to be a lot of a lot of banter and a lot of you know digging fun at each other and that kind of stuff. It's going to be a blast. And of course, Randy Kennedy is, is you know famous for the Floppy Days podcast, uh, which is one of, one of the premier interview podcasts I think out of the entire record group scene. So really looking forward to that as well. So definitely join us for the next two. Get your questions ready over the next couple of weeks here. Next week for the brothers, and, and the week after that for Randy uh, to come on and ask some questions. Here. I I, I kind of hogged the interview today. I don't want to have to do that on the next two. I definitely want you guys to come up with some questions and stuff too. Both on the Man, panel and I'll work. What's that? Homework? Yep, you bet. <laughs> okay. Uh, if that's Push it, the let's button, just, Frank. Yeah, let's the say, book. say goodbye, everybody. Goodbye, goodbye everybody. everybody. Sweet, join us for the interviews. Goodbye, everyone. S sorry, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs>